Audiobook Title Alpha Strike Arc 03-00-23 by Osamaru. This work belongs to Osamaru, Source Scribble Hub and Royal Road.com. Book 1, Arc 3 Prologue. Unnatural Selection. Oligan returned to the group just as Kalak was finished treating the last of them. He looked down at the young herbalist girl lying down in front of Kalak and frowned. Other than Zalzea and Ganbader, the other four survivors, you two included, were all still unconscious. Oligan frowned and asked the grass reader, How are they? Kalak shook her head. Not great, but they'll live. Whatever you two, or maybe the elemental, did, it took the brunt of the Lord Protector's attack. The backlash of it, at least. We need to get them to the village as soon as possible. You two, in particular, needs better treatment than we can provide here. How? How did it look? Outside, I mean. Oligan turned to look at the Lord Protector, whose body was slowly returning to its former shape. It should be safe. I doubt anything in the surrounding area survived. Even if they did, only a fool wouldn't turn and run after seeing something like that. Kalik nodded, though Ganbader spoke next, having wandered over after noticing Uligan's return. And Kuzanagi? The group hadn't seen the Beast Lord, but they'd heard it when he finally showed himself after Yutu's surprise attack. Uligan paused before answering. Dead, there's no way he survived that kind of blow. As one, the group let out a sigh of relief. They shared a moment of silence in remembrance of those they'd lost before Kalik spoke. Even so, we need to report this as soon as possible. The wandering cities, and the Aklut, need to know what has happened here today. Gana tilted his head and asked, But why? The Beast Lord is dead. This is the end, isn't it? Why the rush? Zalzea was the one to answer, though she never turned to face them. Because the Beast Lord wasn't working alone, was he? Uligan and Gana turned to Zalzea, their eyes wide. Gana stuttered as he spoke. But, that, that doesn't make, it makes perfect sense, Zalzea cut him off with her voice raised. She turned to face him and continued, think about it, how did Kuzanagi gather so many grass breakers with no one noticing? How did he take down an entire Akla party? Why did he even know where they would be? With a softer voice, she turned and looked at the still form of you two. Where did he get the poison? Gana tried to respond, but no answers came to his mind. After a moment of silence, Oligan spoke. Gather what supplies can be salvaged. I'll speak to the Lord Protector. Hopefully, with his help, we'll make it to the Earth Shrine before whatever allies the Beast Lord have learned of his fate. The group nodded, but before they could move, a loud ruckus began. Fearing another attack, the group moved closer and turned. Instead of a new enemy, they found the Lord Protector, who had returned to his original form, frantically unturning and digging through the rubble. Gana frowned as he asked, What is he? Zalze cut him off, though her voice low. Guys, the other three turned to face her, noticing she'd gone white as snow. In almost a whisper, she continued, When was the last time any of you saw the Aklet pup? All three humans' eyes went wide. Ganna and Uligan rushed to the Lord Protector's side and started clearing what rubble they could reach, while Kalik sighed, rubbing her temple. Zalzea watched the two men and the large spirit beast clearing the debris at a rapid pace, but something in her gut told her they wouldn't find anything. Well, sure. The glare from her mentor snapped her mouth shut before she could finish the thought. Equals 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 equals. Archimedes popped from the group, coughing up a pool of blood. His entire body convulsed, and he felt like he was on fire, despite the cold sweat pouring off him. What the hell was that? What the hell had that been? There had been nothing about that. That thing mentioned in the report. He'd been told it was a simple job. Slip in while no one was looking, nab the child, and make a break for it. No one had told him something like that would be there. Were the people who hired him psychotic? How in the nine hells did they expect this to end well for them? More importantly, would he be dragged into this mess? His eyes drifted to the still struggling bundle of cloth beside him. For what felt like the hundredth time that hour, he contemplated dumping the cursed child in a ditch somewhere and making a break for it. The mission be damned. But he knew he couldn't do it. The camp was not forgiving of deserters more so when their clients had such backing. If he abandoned the job, his name would be next on the list. Yet, some part of him questioned if it was worth it all. Why so much trouble for a single pup? He threw several medical pills into his mouth and bit down, washing them down with a swig from his canteen. He shivered as the powerful medicine took effect. Most adventurers might have considered the camp a dark guild, but they took care of their people at least. He could never afford such pills on his own. Then again, it wasn't really the campaign for them, anyway. They always passed on the cost of supplies for a mission to the customer. 
Hey, that's the price you paid when you needed something more. Dirty done. Archimedes rolled his shoulders and picked up the wiggling bundle. Whether you need a mercenary team that wouldn't ask questions or a group of bandits to target a rival's caravan, the camp would have what you need. Kidnappings happened to be Archimedes' specialty. There was just something so satisfying about snatching some poor unsuspecting sob right out from under someone's nose. It was like a puzzle, figuring out when and where to strike and, more importantly, how to get away unnoticed. He'd even had specially designed, sealing cloth, made, it would not only seal a target's spirit energy but block out any external tracking attempts. It didn't matter what the enemy used, sound, scent, spirit, or soul markers, the cloth would block them all. While it wasn't his only tool, it had been a major factor in his success as one of the best kidnappers on the Skybreaker continent. It was also why his latest client had approached him for this job, though he had to admit, this was the first time he'd ever been asked to retrieve a kidnapping victim. That had been an interesting twist, though Archimedes had been disappointed by his peers. He'd been impressed when they told him someone had actually kidnapped an Akla pup. That wasn't a simple job in the slightest, but the reality of the situation had been stranger than he expected. They didn't even have the pup tied up. It was just running around without a care in the world. Hell, he wasn't fully convinced the stupid thing hadn't just been tricked into following them with some meat or something. The sudden attack by the army of grassbreakers had been a lucky break, even if the timing was suspicious. But Archimedes thought little of it, and bided his time. Then the world went to the Nine Hells. Archimedes didn't know what that attack the strange metal spirit beast had used was. But it had shaken him to his core and nearly killed him outright. He'd even wasted a defensive tool. He'd sure as hell have the client replace that too. Thankfully though, that tool gave him the chance he needed. While the others were reeling from the backlash of the attack, Archimedes pounced, snatching up the pup and making his escape. That had been several hours now, and with no sign of pursuit, it looked like he was in the home stretch. Now, he had to return to the meeting location with the pup and collect his payment. Then it was off to Halarosa for a well-deserved vacation. Archimedes checked his, positioning Jade, and then turned in the direction he needed to go but froze. Only a dozen meters away, a large grassbreaker penguin stared up at him, still half buried in the ground. Archimedes narrowed his eyes and tilted his head. It was a big one, too, likely a flock leader. Was it a penguin that had escaped the blast? He figured it didn't really matter. A grassbreaker core would fetch a pittance, even a flock leader's, but it would be some pocket change to play around with later. The man slid his bundle to the ground and slowly approached the penguin, limping slightly, his blade hidden behind his back. Flock leaders were smarter than most, but they were still dumb birds. If he approached too aggressively it would flee, but if he pretended to be hurt, it would take the chance for an easy meal, giving him the opening he needed to kill it in a single swipe. However, when Archimedes drew within a few meters, something flashed across his vision. He froze, a sudden pinching in his chest making him fro his brow. His vision wavered slightly as he looked down to find a wrist-thick barbed tentacle sticking out of his chest. The tentacle twitched and retracted, back into the open mouth of the grassbreaker. Archimedes stared at the gaping hole where his heart should be, then collapsed to his knees before toppling to his side. As the darknesses crept over his vision, Archimedes saw grassbreaker strolling past him toward the wiggling bundle behind him. As it did, its form twisted and shifted from a large flock leader to an elegantly dressed older human man. The penguin turned man, dressed in a fine suit, stared down at the small bundle and stroked his thick, black and white peppered beard. His eyes narrowed, and he pulled out a small black amulet from his coat pocket. He let the amulet hang loose in the air, then channeled some spirit energy through it. It swung wildly for a moment before snapping into place, pointing directly at the cloth-wrapped bundle. The old man sighed and returned the amulet to his pocket before mumbling to himself. So, it seems the young master was correct. Who would have thought even you could be so cruel, Matisse? No matter. With that, he picked the bundle up and walked away. As he did so, Archimedes reached out with a blood-stained hand and grabbed the man's ankle. The old man looked down at the dying kidnapper and sked, kicking himself free from the man's weak grip before walking a few more meters and sinking into the ground. Once the man was gone, Archimedes coughed a bloody laugh and pulled out a small ring. With the last of his strength, he smeared his blood on the ring's surface and crushed his positioning jade. Archimedes gave a blood-smeared smile and mumbled. Bloody fool. Then the light fled his eyes. Equals 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 equals. An hour later, a masked figure materialized from the wind beside Archimedes' stiff body. 
Silently, the figure pushed the stiff body over and examined the wound before doing the same to the rest of the field. Finding nothing more, they pulled out a large string of bright red beads and performed several hand seals, channeling spirit energy through them. The air wavered, and a thick mist formed in the area. Inside the mist, figures moved. Though no details or sound could be seen, they perfectly mimicked the events of an hour past. The masked figure watched with interest, making notes as needed. A short while later, the mist dissipated, and the masked figure returned to Archimedes' body, stripping it of several items and collecting the bloody ring. The figure channeled more spirit energy into the ring and smiled under their mask at the results. Archimedes had never been the most talented, or even smartest of them. But one thing could be said for sure, he had definitely been the pettiest. A gust of wind blew through the clearing, and like a drawing in the dust, the masked figure vanished. 29. Book 1. Lesson 31. Chose your path wisely. Alpha had to confess. He may have panicked a little. Sure, for a child, Snowball had shown herself to be highly competent and able to care for herself. But she was still a child. Besides, with her ever-growing self-awareness and the general respect the humans showed for the small whale puppy, Alpha was fairly certain her species was sapient at this point. A few Federation species didn't become fully sapient until later in life as well, so that wasn't much of a surprise. No, the biggest issue was that Alpha could be fined. As a sapient child, technically under his care, Alpha was legally obligated as a soldier under Federation law to ensure their safety until they could be passed on to proper caregivers. Failure to do so came with stiff penalties and heavy fines. General Halder was particularly strict about this rule. Willful neglect could see a soldier cleaning carrier ships by hand, and some of those were legally classified as small planetoids. Neglect, such as firing a Class 5 kinetic warhead within 200 meters of said child. Okay, maybe Alpha was a little worried about the bloodthirsty goofball too. She reminded him of him. The anomaly with the railjack had only scrambled his sensors for a short while. But as anyone with a child could tell you, that's all it takes for them to get into some new trouble. Even the tracking beacon he tagged her with wasn't sending a signal, which was strange. It should have been working fine, even if she was buried under a mile of rubble. So then, what was blocking it? It took two hours to clear all the rubble in the main building with the help of Oligan and Ganbader, but even they couldn't find hide nor hair of her. What they had found was a torn, bloody cloak none of them recognized. Kalik had examined the cloak, plucked at several burnout symbols woven into the fabric, then used a word Alpha didn't have a record of yet. A quick analysis of the blood showed it was human, though not belonging to any of the humans present. It didn't take a genius to connect the dots and soon the group was discussing their next course of action. Thankfully, Alpha's lexicon was at a point he could understand most of it. One of the humans Alpha didn't have a name for yet, had been running Alpha through what he assumed was grammar for children during the hours before the attack, presumably, at the request of Kalik. Much of it was still educated guesswork, but it was enough to at least communicate. Kalik, Gambader, Uligan, and Zalzea, the only humans able to move, gathered in a small circle near Alpha to speak. Ganbader was the first to ask. So, what do we do now? Kalik sighed and shook her head. The only thing we can do, what we originally planned dash. We head to the Earth Shrine and report to the dollar asterisk dollar at hashtag percent dot. Uligan frowned and asked. Is that wise? Should we not look for the child? The dollar asterisk dollar at hashtag percent are not known for their forgiveness dash. If they learn we abandoned one of their children to an unknown fate, the consequences could be extreme. Alpha filed the new word, Aklat, away. He was unsure if that was the name of Snowball's species, tribe, or family, but any information could be important later. It also confirmed, or at least suggested, that Snowball's people had some measure of influence among the humans of this area. Otherwise, why would they be so fearful of retaliation? All the more reason to continue the search. The ore he'd taken from the crates would go a long way toward his recovery, but he only had time to refine a small amount before the penguins showed up. So an, in, with an established power would make Alpha's job far easier both in the short and long term. Alpha said as much too. I agree. It was only two simple words, but most of the group jumped, turning to look at Alpha with wide eyes. Only Kalik showed no reaction other than a slight smile. She turned to Alpha and bowed, placing her fist in a cupped hand as she spoke. Lord Protector, Alpha still got a kick out of their title for him. He'd decided not to correct them just yet. I understand you're worried for the child, but I must beg for your understanding. We have people that need immediate treatment and have no way of telling who has taken the child or where. 
She then raised the bloody cloak and continued. The Aklat Dash, the child's family, may have percent dollar hashtag at percent, or asterisk dollar hashtag at percent, that could help to track her, or her kidnapper Dash. If we searched for her ourselves, we could waste valuable time. Our best option to ensure the child returns home is to inform their family of what has happened. Hmm. Alpha considered the older woman's words. She wasn't wrong. With this tracker being blocked by something, they didn't really have a way of finding where the child had been taken. He could do a fanning search with wasps, but without knowing which direction they had gone, that would be a time-consuming process. Besides, whoever it was had somehow slipped past his wasps once. Who was to say they couldn't do so again? Conversely, Calix seemed confident that the child's family could find her through some means, likely some more magical bullcrap. The top's optical sensor plate twirled as he spoke, making the group twitch. Understood. Few being the mysterious man a few words was exhausting. Calic let out a breath she didn't know she was holding before giving the AI a nervous smile and responding. Thank you for understanding. Salzea was the next to speak. Do we even know where we are? I've never heard of an abandoned temple like this. The only earth temple I was even aware of was in the heart. Oh. Alpha knew that one. His optical sensors flashed, and a holographic map of the surrounding area and their previous route appeared in the middle of the group. Once more, the group jumped, and if anyone asked if Alpha was doing it on purpose at this point, he would adamantly agree. Kalik's eyes flickered to Alpha before turning to the 3D light map. She circled it, examining it from every direction as if looking for something. After a moment, she stopped and spoke. There, I recognize this stretch. She jerked back as her finger brushed a map section, leaving a small red dot. She stared at her finger for a moment before continuing. This is part of a disputed foraging site between the asterisk percent asterisk at hashtag percent asterisk village and our own. If this map is accurate, we should only be roughly 70 at hashtag dollar away from the Slate Walker Trail if we head in this direction. From the red dot, Kalik drew a line heading northeast. Based on the Lord Protector's previous speed, we should be able to reach the village by nightfall. Once there, we can drop off the wounded and make our way to the Earth Shrine to give our report. It took only a few more moments to complete the plan, and the group broke off to do their part, of which Alpha's involved standing around doing nothing. Instead, he wandered off to do something he'd wanted to for a while now, but never had the time. Equals 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 equals. Finding a chunk of the strange, growing copper still intact enough for Alpha's purposes took almost an hour. Despite an entire forest of the stuff having grown from seemingly nothing, the railjack had turned most of it into useless slag. Theoretically, he could have refined most of it, but he had little use for so much copper, and the time it would take made it unfeasible, as they would leave the area soon. What little wasn't slag had been contaminated by penguin, bits. Alpha made a note to ask Kalik about the strange entity that had used the young man, U2 Dash, to perform such an act. If he could learn the principle behind it, and apply it to other materials, it could solve his resource problems. Nothing good ever came easy, however, and the small amount of untainted, viable copper sample he'd been able to collect proved to be disappointing. Basic scans showed that the substance wasn't really copper. Instead, it was some kind of biometallic compound. Its properties were remarkably similar though, sharing the same conductivity, malleability, ductility, and even density as mundane copper. Unfortunately, heat tests showed it wouldn't melt in the same way. Instead, it seemed to burn up and crumble under extreme heat, though it took significantly higher temperatures to do that than it would to melt mundane copper. Alpha even found a few pieces would start to regrow back into their original shape when damaged in such a way. What were they even feeding on? If he just left this here and came back in six months, would he find a mountain of tumorous copper? Or was there a natural limit in scope or time? Part of him imagined raining down copper bullets on an advancing army, but quickly dismissed the idea. The copper had taken quite a while to spread through you two in that fashion. The wound would probably kill an enemy long before the copper itself did. True, the entity had created the copper forest in a flash but something told Alpha was more of the entity's doing rather than some intrinsic nature of the biocopper. Hmm, maybe he could turn it into an ammo printer? If he figured out exactly how it was generating mass, and he could replicate or speed up the process safely, it could replace the MCDs. Not to mention the other areas where self-repairing metals could be useful. With that in mind, Alpha collected several of the best samples that shoved them into a stasis container. As Alpha headed back to what remained of the temple building, he couldn't help but daydream about what else he might find in this strange place. 
equals 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 equals. Juan stood atop the tower cart and looked over the multicolored prairies. The structure swayed with the carts, a trait needed when building such a tall structure on a moving platform. Some guardians never got used to the motion, but Juan enjoyed it. It reminded him of his other home, far to the north, where the city boats traveled the icy seas. His new home was a different kind of sea, but it was no less beautiful to him. Juatan had traveled to this land seeking his history. It was said the clans of the Radiant Sea and his homeland shared some connection, though from a time so long ago that no living person knew what. What he had found was a people of strange ways and a place that he had no proper words for. Nonetheless, he'd fallen in love with the Radiant Sea and its strange people. One person in particular had captured his heart, though she could be abrasive, sometimes, he would freely admit. He'd come searching for answers to questions that plagued him and instead found a peace he never thought he would have or even deserved. He'd built a home and a family from the ashes of the past, and he'd never regretted a moment of it. A loud snore broke him from his contemplations, and he turned to see the young man beside him, asleep on his feet, leaning dangerously on his spear. Jordan frowned and flicked the bottom of his own spear into the young guardian's shine. The boy jumped, gripping his spear a little too tightly as he nervously looked around. Seeing nothing but the older man frowning at him, the young guardian humphed and turned away. Jordan sighed. Of course, the boy thought he could laze around with. Jordan the simple went on guard duty. But then again, that was possibly why the captain had paired the boy with him, to begin with. These wet behind theirs guardians, fresh from their graduation exam, soon learned that Jordan wasn't as lenient as the rumors made him out to be. Jordan had seen too many young guardians and villagers killed because someone decided they could nap on duty. This last batch was even worse. Half of them shouldn't have ever passed. Most of the examination groups had returned almost a week early because of the ruckus surrounding the fallen star. The examiners rightly chose to head home rather than deal with whatever trouble was stirred up by the once-in-a-decade event. The increased security concerns saw the elders handing out blanket passes just to fill in the needed numbers. Well, most of them had. Even days after the last group had returned, one group was still missing. Juaten turned his eyes back to the vast open expanse before him, desperately searching for any sign of an approaching caravan. His wife had shut herself in their cart for days, refusing to eat and barely speaking. Juaten still had hope, though, that he would see the grass part and the final group return, whole and well at any moment. Some part of him knew that was foolish, but he couldn't let that spark die, not yet. He'd volunteer for tower duty for the entire month if he had to. Movement from behind drew his attention from the horizon and Jordan turned to find his junior partner staring, wide-eyed, toward the west. Jordan turned that way and froze. Smoke rose from the grasses far into the distance. Not just any smoke, though, purple smoke mixed with red. The signal of a returning party, and a request for help. Jordan barely heard the young man's voice as he leaped the full thirty meters from the top of the top to the ground below. He hit the ground and rolled, springing into a run that threw up a cloud of dust in his wake. As he weaved between the carts, Quickly leaving the village behind, he barely noticed the three other guardians who fell into step beside him. With the kind of speed only achievable with mid-stage, silver spirit, cultivation, the small group quickly closed on the smoke signal. In his heart, Jotan prayed to the sister above that what they found wasn't too bad. 26. Book 1. Lesson 32. Take time to rest and recover. The children let loose terror-filled screeches as the beasts broke into the small clearing. This wasn't the first time it had found their hiding spot. It had already claimed many of them. Yet, it would not be sated until every tiny human fell. It locked on to the smallest and slowest of the bunch and moved. With a blur of motion, the child disappeared. Those that remained scattered into the surrounding grass, each praying they wouldn't be next. If they could just hold out a little longer, just keep away for a few more minutes. A soul-piercing screech from somewhere in the grass signaled another loss. The young boy crawled along the ground making himself as small and quiet as possible. A hard thing to do with every movement rushed the tall grass around him, but staying still wasn't an option either. They tried that already. Nevertheless, the beast had found them, somehow. They had to just keep moving. If they kept moving then, the grass to his left rustled, and the boy froze. A moment later, a young girl, only a year or two young than him, stumbled from the grass, panting, sweat dripping down her face. She stopped, frozen, staring down at him, wide-eyed then muttered. Oh no! The next instance, she was gone, disappearing into the grass as something yanked her from behind. The young boy's breaths came in ragged breaths, 
and his heart pounded like thunder in his chest as he stared at the place where the girl had vanished. He knew he should run, should try to hide, but his mind was blank. When his legs at last started listening to his head again, it was already too late. An enormous shadow slowly appeared from the tall grass, moving far quieter than something that large ever had the right to. Slowly it approached, drawing out the moment. The young boy was the last, and its victory was all but assured. When it finally loomed over the boy, it stared down at him with its three glowing red eyes and laughed. But as the beast reached out, its metallic hand and the young boy gave into his fate. A loud whistle cut through the silence, and a masculine voice called out. Time! The gargantuan metal beast collapsed to the group, deflating in defeat. With a roaring cheer, the gaggle of children on its back slid down and rushed the young boy, lifting him on their shoulders. It had taken nearly six tries, but they'd finally won. Victory! Equals 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 equals. Zalzea watched the nearly three dozen children climb over the collapsed Lord Protector like he was the world's biggest playground, and shook her head. The other adults of the village, watching the scene, smiled and laughed, likely thinking how funny it was that even a powerful spirit beast was no match for the energy of small children. Zalzea knew the truth, though. He was pouting. Sure, the Lord Protector had gone easy on the kids, but he had honestly put effort into their game. Even so, determined children's adaptability and quick wit weren't to be underestimated. It helped that the children had been playing this same game for years now. It was part of the basic training, preparing them for their eventual apprenticeships in a few short years. Typically, one of the older guardians played the role of the hunter, but one thing had led to another. The survivor's homecoming has been hectic, to put it lightly. They discussed whether to leave the Lord Protector out of sight before approaching the village to prevent misunderstandings. But after talking, they agreed it was better he be seen with them. Who knew what would happen if he were seen wandering around the outskirts of the village? Of course, that didn't stop Salzea's father from bursting from the grass, filled with a fiery rage she'd never thought him capable of. Joaden had charged, then struck out at the Lord Protector with the full force of a well-established, mid-stage, silver spirit cultivator before anyone could warn the man. It seemed Zalzea had inherited more than just her gift from her father. Of course, the guardian's attack had about as much effect on the Lord Protector as Zalzea's own attack had, even when three other guardians erupted from the grass. Their combined strength couldn't break the strange energy shield surrounding the spirit beast. Zalzea's heart sank when she heard the cracks of thunder from the Lord Protector, and she feared the worst. Yet, instead of the space of blood she expected, all four guardians doubled over, clutching their abdomens as if they'd been struck by a mighty fist. When one fell over on his side, and Zalzea saw the fist-sized dent in the man's chest plate, she realized she hadn't been too far off. Silently, she thanked the Lord Protector for his restraint. While such a blow would leave a massive bruise, she was sure one guardian even had a cracked rib. She knew its thunderous attack could do far worse. The next few moments had been part heartwarming reunion and part emergency medical treatment as the group helped the injured guardians out of their dented armor. A quick debriefing from Mulligan and an all-clear signals sent to the village saw the four guardians kowtowing before the Lord Protector. Zalzea's gift told her the creature was more amused than insulted, but she kept that to herself. Men's pride could be a fragile thing, after all. The guardians had then escorted the group back to the village, followed by the expected confusion, fear and excitement as the village rushed to meet the survivors of the last group. That excitement soon turned to mournful wailing as it became clear they were returning with not even a third of the number they'd left with. The following day had been a typical song and dance as the story circulated through the village. Everyone wanted to know what had happened, and some even tried to blame the Lord Protector, either for not saving their own family member or somehow having planned the whole thing. The elders, to appease the villagers, placed a guard on the mysterious spirit beast. A full twelve, silver spirit, guardians, led by the captain himself, the only, gold spirit, cultivator in the village. Not that any of the leadership believed they could do anything against the creature, of course, after Uligan and Calix's retelling of events. But it kept the people at ease, somewhat. The Lord Protector, for his part, had been surprisingly cooperative during the entire ordeal. Uligan and others thought the spirit beast was passive and aloof, but Zalzea knew the truth. The creature was extremely calculating, and everything it did was for a purpose. Even this air of indifference and helpful nature was all for a goal. It needed them for something, but Zalzea's gift couldn't tell her for what. So far, it had only shown interest in the blacksmithing carts. It had requested 
a staggering amount of various metals and ores stored there. The event had caused a small confrontation, with Uligan having to prevent the other guardians from stopping him and the elders having to pause their meeting with Kalik. After a brief discussion, the elders, begrudgingly, agreed to offer the medal to the Lord Protector as thanks for bringing the survivors home. The village would have to eat the cost and pay the blacksmiths back for the losses. The Slate Walkers weren't the richest village, but they specialized in traps and arrays, so their stockpile of various metals was significant. That they were headed to the Earth Shrine, where they could trade with other villages and restock on necessities, meant that the village wouldn't suffer too badly, especially with the treasure gathered by the other groups during the examination trips. So how did all that culminate in the Lord Protector playing? Hunter and Prey With a group of the village's children? It all started while the Lord Protector used the materials to heal? It looked more like the spirit beast was crafting armor to her. But she wasn't a crafter, so what did she know? Instead of eating the material like she'd expected, the various materials were mixed, refined, and transformed in ways she couldn't understand. Various broken and burned carapace pieces were removed and broken down then reformed in mere minutes. The spectacle was so mesmerizing and magical that it soon gathered a small crowd, including many of the craftsmen the Lord Protector had, requested, the materials from. Several were even sketching the scene with a fervor that burned to Zalzea's gift. In only a short two hours, the Lord Protector's outer shell had gone from broken and melted in several places to a pristine metallic sheen, where once the spirit beast appeared broken, it now radiated a regal, if dangerous, air. She could tell the repairs, wasn't perfect though. Some areas were slightly off color, while others were thicker than their undamaged. Originals. Regardless, the Lord Protector looked in far better shape than he had only a few hours prior. As the show ended, the crowd slowly dispersed. Well, most of them did. A small group of half a dozen children lingered on the edge of where the crowd had stood, held back by a pair of guardians. They stared up at the Lord Protector with wide-eyed wonder, pointing and whispering to each other. Now, if one thing can be said about Slate Walker children, it was that no others under the sun had quite the talent for getting into things and places they shouldn't be. Zalzea had fond memories of all the trouble she, you two, and Ganna had gotten into during their youth, and they had been one of the meeker groups, but Slate Walker standards. So it should have been no surprise to anyone when a tiny girl suddenly stood up on top of the Lord Protector's back, declaring herself the world's best beast tamer. What followed was a chaotic mix of laughing children being chased by guardians, parents screaming or yelling, and general confusion as guardians pulled one child off the spirit beast, only to turn around and find two more fighting to be on top. So a typical afternoon in the Slate Walker village, the mess had gone a long way toward lifting the somewhat dour mood that had blanketed the village since their group's return. It helped that the Lord Protector did not mind the children crawling over him. Things might have been different if Uligan and Ganna weren't laughing the entire time of course. With the two's assurance that the children would be fine, the other guardians let them be. More than a few people spoke out, questioning if it was wise to let the children play around an unknown, obviously powerful spirit beast in this manner, regardless of how gentle it seemed around them. Zalzea would admit she felt the same, in a way. Her gift told her that while the Lord Protector didn't mind and genuinely enjoyed the children's company, there was more to it. This, too, was just another way for it to endear itself to them manipulation on top of manipulation. But the cheery, excited play of the children soon drowned out the voice of the naysayers. Soon, the play had evolved into a game of hunter and prey, partly on Uligan's suggestion. The young guardian was quickly becoming one of the most vocal proponents of the Lord Protector in the village, alongside Ganna. She could tell they were hiding something from her, but she couldn't quite tell what, and that made her nervous. Part of her wondered if she should tell them her own secret and speak suspicions about the Lord Protector. Another calmer part of her warned it could cause more trouble. The Lord Protector was unpredictable. There was no telling how it might react if it knew she could tell there was more to him than he let on. Ultimately, she chose to watch and observe, then report her concerns to Kalik once the meetings with the elders were finished. As her mentor, she was one of the few who knew of her gift. Equals 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 equals. Alpha stood and gently pulled the pile of sleeping children off him. The AI was used to rambunctious, energetic children, but Lord above, these were something else. The plan was originally to play nice with the kids and give off a more friendly neighborhood 15 meter tall robot vibe. It had worked before, especially on worlds where people didn't really have a concept of what a war machine looked like. People let their guard down around you more when they saw you playing with children. 
Even the guards they had watching him seemed less tense as they moved the small pile of bodies and brought them to waiting parents. Alpha had to admit, he'd expected more, pushback than he'd received in this village so far. More often than not, first contact was met with fear, suspicion, and weariness. While that was still present, it was more like that of a stranger visiting town than a gargantuan metal creature of unknown origins. Even when he pushed and tested their limits by raiding their metal storage, he'd only gotten some pointed questions and was, gifted, the materials by what he assumed were village leaders. Not that he was complaining. The materials had been enough to cover much of his more pressing repair needs. He was still short on supplies, and the TWP wasn't at 100% but he no longer had to worry about pushing the frame too hard or breaking something important. It was strange, even so. Something told Alpha he was still missing context. Lucky for Alpha, he had a village to explore now. Well, less him and more his swarm of wasps. Since arriving, the wasps had spread out through the village, hiding in various places, gathering data, or scouting out points of interest. Things were going great, even if most of the information he'd gathered had been mundane village gossip. His lexicon had taken a tremendous leap over the last few hours, with thousands of new data points to pull from. He was fairly certain he could hold a lengthy conversation with a local now, but stuck to the mysterious, silent type image he'd been cultivating so far. After all, people were far more willing to speak freely around you when they thought you couldn't understand them. He'd never quite seen a town like this, though. Roaming cities weren't anything new to Alpha. A notable portion of the Federation population chose to live in giant city ships instead of on a planet. But this was the first he'd seen that was so low-tech. On each of the nearly 600 carts that made up the village, a building was built. These vary from small, single-family homes to large workshops filled with complex tools. What Alpha could only assume was the town hall was the largest, and it looked like it could easily house over 300 people at once. At over 3,000 people, by Alpha's count, the village's population was respectable for such a setup, if not enormous. They even appeared to be in the middle of expansion if the two dozen unfinished carts being pulled behind the others said anything. At the end day, though, a cart was a cart, even if the drive, suspension and axle systems were far more advanced than Alpha expected. Instead of being automated, each cart was pulled by a large, elk-like creature, a grand elk, as the villagers called them. They were gargantuan beasts easily half the size of the TWB. Not quite megafauna, but pushing the limits. They seemed powerful, too, with a team of two easily pulling a smaller building cart with little difficulty, while teams of six to ten pulled the larger carts. These grand elk even seemed to pull double duty as both herd animals and cart engines, as he'd witnessed several families milking or shearing their large companions. The creatures themselves were strangely docile, almost cow-like in their disposition, though that may have simply resulted from generations of domestication. The combination of more than a thousand large herbivores and hundreds of heavy carts resulted in a long, neatly flattened scar through the prairies trailing the village for miles. Alpha was sure that if he looked at it from the sky, he could track the village's progression up to this point going back possibly months. One particular cart had caught Alpha's attention almost immediately after spotting it with a wasp. It was a small, Inconspicuous cottage nestled in what Alpha assumed to be a residential section of the village, given how many homes were in the area. At first glance, there wasn't anything very special about it. In fact, it seemed in need of a new paint job, even if it appeared well lived in. No, what caught Alpha's attention was how it practically glowed. Not to the visible eye, but with the same strange energy waves he'd recorded during his first encounter with Yutu and Ganbader, where the young man had created a spatial distortion from out of nowhere. Intrigued, Alpha piloted the wasp and approached the building. The tiny drone landed on the roof and quietly approached the strange lines, giving off the energy signal. It was gentle, almost undetectable compared to the violent storm the spatial distortion had given off, but undeniably similar. Alpha couldn't even tell how they worked. They appeared like nothing more than lines carved into the wood grain to him. Lines so fine and simple that if you didn't know they were there, you'd be mistaken for thinking they were just random scratches. Yet somehow they, what do we have here? Suddenly the wasp was plucked from the surface by its wings. The small drone struggled, but couldn't escape the assailant's grasp. Soon Alpha was looking through the wasp's camera into the smiling face of a wrinkled, hunched over old man. The man peered at the drone with one open eye and spoke. And who might you be, my little friend? The drone went still, unsure if the senile old man talking to a bug was serious or not. Wait, weren't they on the roof? 
24, Book 1, Lesson 33. Be sure to get it in writing. Alpha, or rather the wasp, sat across the table from a wrinkly old man, a cup of tea in front of each. The old man sipped his tea inside, then yelled louder than necessary in such a small building. How much longer, woman? I'm hungry. A more feminine, if no less wizened, yelled back from around the corner, the voice not losing in volume. Oh, be quiet, you old coot. Have some patience. You're lucky we have a guest, or you'll eat at oil rods all week. The old man's eyes widened, and he sat a little straighter. Yes, dear. An old woman walked around the corner, carrying a tray full of steaming plates. She was just as hunched and wrinkled as the old man, but Alpha had seen enough old humans to know she moved with an eerie grace and strength that belied her apparent advanced age. The meal she laid out for her and her husband was simple. Some porridge, rice, steamed vegetables, and a cup of tea. Despite that, the old man dug into the meal with gusto. The old woman smiled at Alpha and placed a small sauce dish before him. Her smile was gentle and sweet, like an old grandma looking at her favorite grandchild. I'm sorry about the limited spread, dearie. I wasn't expecting company. Alpha stared down into the small sauce dish, unsure of what he saw. Instead of the porridge the couple enjoyed, a pitch black liquid filled the dish. It swirled around, seemingly of its own accord, as tiny glowing sparks of something appeared and disappeared. Alpha turned the wasp to look up at the old woman, only to see her beaming down at him. She flicked her hand and spoke. Go on, go on. Tell me what you think. It's not often I get to cook for your kind. Not anymore, at least. Alpha shrugged and moved the wasp toward the dish. He couldn't actually eat. But wasps had storage takes built into their design to deliver injections and take samples as necessary. He wasn't sure what kind of food this was, but Alpha's instincts told him it would be worth analyzing. The old woman's grin grew wider as the wasp slowly emptied the small dish. Alpha spoke through the drone, using directed sound waves generated by its wings. Thank you for the meal. Technically, that wasn't part of their design, but a certain AI nearly a century ago had developed the technique to silently pass on instructions in a sensitive environment. Alpha had liked the idea so much he'd spent a week mastering it. Only an AI could accurately replicate it, but it was useful in many ways. The old man, who had been happily munching away at his meal, spewed a mouth full of rice to the side, coughing as he pounded his chest. The old woman's brow rose, but her smile never dropped. Oh, you're welcome, dearie. You can call me Malliot, by the way, and this. She smacked the back of the old man beside her. Old fool is my husband, Maliki. Who might you be? Alpha paused before speaking. The people of the village have been referring to me as the Lord Protector. The old woman who called herself Malliot threw back her head and laughed. Now I ask for your name, little one, not what the children call you. Alpha considered for a moment. Interesting. He corrected himself. You can call me Alpha. Malliot smiled down at the wasp brightly. Very nice to meet you, young Alpha. Welcome to our humble home. She lifted the small cup beside her plate and took a drink, a motion mimicked by her still coughing husband. The two then dug back into their food. The next few moments were filled with near constant banter between the pair, and though the words might have seemed scalding on the surface, their tone told that there was no true venom behind them. Alpha took it all in calmly. At first, he wasn't sure why he played along with the old man. He could have easily broken down the wasp into its constituent nanites and recalled them, but the strange energy lines carved into the house had fascinated him. It tickled some base part of his programming he couldn't pinpoint in a way few things had. A quick survey of the village showed that most buildings had similar lines engraved on them, especially on their axle systems. Yet no building, even the important-looking ones, glowed quite as bright as this humble little shack on wheels. In fact, now that he paid attention, Alpha could detect similar lines running throughout the house. Some of them were clumped together, on or around various objects. Others ran in long, branching pathways that connected the various clumps together or twisted into patchworks that reminded Alpha of the veins in an animal, or the circuits on a board. Even if most of them looked more like artwork than anything meaningful, even the dinnerware the couple ate from glowed with faint lines, if you had the eyes to see. Curious, Alpha moved the wasp to get a better look at the small sauce dish. Unsurprisingly, he found the inside etched with a complex swirling design. Alpha stared at the design, pondering. Hmm, strange. As an AI, Alpha could observe the world far more accurately than most biologicals. His kind wasn't particularly susceptible to optical illusions, at least not the same kind. So why was it that the more he stared at the design, 
the more he felt a distinct sense of motion, for lack of a better term. It was almost as if the longer he looked, the more the design seemed to swirl. Interested are you? That dollar hashtag at dollar percent is one of my favorites. So versatile if you know how to use it correctly. Malia grinned from ear to ear as she spoke. Maliki, her husband, put down his bowl and spoke for the first time since the meal had started. Bah! It's nothing more than a parlor trick. It can't do half the things a proper. Asterisk percent hashtag dollar hashtag. Could. Meliot's eyes narrowed, and she frowned. She turned and spoke to the old man, her voice flat. You have just never appreciated the simple things. It's all flash and show for you. Maliki turned to his wife, pointing his spoon at her as he spoke. Exactly. Why put in so much work if you can't show it off? If you had your way, no one would even know you put it there in the first place. Maliot sighed, placing her face in her free hand. Her voice sounded tired when she spoke, like this wasn't the first time they'd had this discussion, and it likely wouldn't be the last. That's the point of a trap, you see now, Codger. Why do you think I had to clean up your mess during the... The next twenty minutes were filled with a lengthy argument, debate, peppered with enough unknown words that Alpha's lexicon nearly doubled in size. Great, more work. It went on for so long that Alpha seriously contemplated just taking the dish and making a break for it. After some time, the couple remembered they had a guest and turned back to Alpha. Maliot switched back to kindly old grandma mode and apologized. Sorry about that, dearie. He gets like that sometimes. TSK, you want to talk, YOWL. The pouting Maliki mumbled under his breath, only to jump at some unseen assault. Maliot never stopped smiling or staring down at Alpha as she spoke. Are you curious? We don't take students, typically. At least not without an extensive understanding of who we're dealing with. But we're always up for a trade. How about it? Alpha considered for a moment and asked. A trade? What kind of trade? The old woman leaned back in her chair, her hands folded. Gone was the kindly old grandma, and in her place was a presence Alpha knew all too well. Why, information, of course. You seem quite interested in our arrays. Again, there was that word. Alpha wasn't sure what a proper translation would be but he at least understood she meant the lines he was observing. Maliot continued, While I'm quite curious about that, she pointed to some undesirable place above the wasp. Alpha turned the drone to see what she was pointing at, but seeing nothing, he asked, And what is that you speak of? Maliki turned around, frowning, and spoke. She's talking about this, boy. The old man leaned over and plucked the air above the drone. Instantly, Alpha's connection to the wasp wobbled in a way that if he had been physically capable, Alpha might have thrown up. The moment he regained control of the drone, the wasp shot backward off the table to land on the far wall. What the hell had that just been? Back at the table, Maliot was smacking the old man with her spoon. See, I keep telling you that you can't be so rough. She then turned back to Alpha, the kindly old grandma returning. I'm sorry about that, dearie. Come, come, he won't do it again. I'm sorry. My husband has a bad habit of touching things he really shouldn't. The last was said as she turned and gave the old man beside her a hard look. Maliki only humphed and turned away. Maliot turned back around and continued. Now, as I was saying, I'm quite curious about what you're doing, young Alpha. I've never quite seen such a complex puppet be controlled without a speck of percent asterisk asterisk percent at hashtag percent hashtag. I'm not even sure I have the right word for whatever that is. Alpha's guard instantly shot up several degrees. Not only could they detect and even disrupt his connection to the drone, but they could also tell it was something being controlled rather than his actual body. That was worrying. Alpha wasn't delusional enough to think this was just some random, kindly old couple at this point. But from what Alpha had observed so far, he'd assumed the locals were more primitive. Was this just more magical bullcrap? Or was there something he wasn't seeing? Alpha wasn't sure explaining how he controlled his drone was such a good idea. This was just a basic signal, and he could always change it. But once that information was out there, who knew when it might come back to bite him in the butt? He answered with as much as well. I'm not sure that's in my best interest, Mrs. Malliot. Malliot raised her hands and shook her head. No, please, Malliot is fine, and maybe I miscommunicated. I'm not asking for your secrets or how you are doing it, only what it is. I've seen nothing like this and it had me curious. What do you say? You explain what that is, and we'll give you a short primer in arrays dash, quid pro quo dash? Everyone wins. Alpha considered the offer more. On the one hand, it was a risk. He wasn't in a position to flaunt much of what he could do openly right now. Experience told him that the longer he could play, the mysterious being, card, 
the more he could manipulate things to his advantage. His options would shrink once that mystery and intrigue began to peel away. Natives of New Worlds were, technically and legally, Federation civilians from the moment Alpha touched the surface. Whether or not they knew it yet, he couldn't go around burning down cities for their resources, without a good reason, for example. Now if the Guard, or any other military force, decided they stand against him, he could use his military rank to suppress them as rebels. But that was an entirely different matter. If some random civilian acted against him, though, there was little he could do until they physically attacked him. That's why people's skills, and you, diplomacy, was needed when dealing with civs. If that diplomacy involved the natives believing Alpha was a monstrous being of unknown power capable of destroying them, and everything they loved if they didn't do as he said, well, Alpha wasn't responsible for their own misunderstanding. So, the question would be, was the risk of explaining some minor details about his technology worth saving vast amounts of time trying to research something he might not even have? The proper context for? Maliot stared down at the wasp, her brow furrowing. The drone hadn't moved for some time as Alpha contemplated his best action. She smacked her husband and whispered, Look what you did! You broke it! The old man looked at her, a hand on his chest. I did no such thing, woman! You, fine! But under some conditions, Alpha spoke at last, causing both old humans to turn their eyes on him. Malachi narrowed his eyes and asked, What conditions? I was never here. We never spoke, and anything you learn, you figured out yourself. Both humans leaned back in their chairs and shared a long look. It was Maliet who broke the silence. That's fine, though we'll ask the same in return. You're not the only one who enjoys their privacy. Alpha nodded. Deal. The next two hours were a back and forth discussion about the nature of light and how different wavelengths and frequencies have unique properties. When the talk was over, Malachi looked severely disappointed while Maliot was working on filling her third small notebook. Malachi frowned and crossed his arms. You expect me to believe you're controlling a puppet like that, using nothing more than what amounts to a signal fire? Bullcrap. Malliot smacked him across the chest with a notebook. Fool, were you not paying attention at all? It's the same principle as dollar dollar at, only the dollar at, and the dollar at hashtag percent are physical, instead dollar at hashtag. Malachi threw his arms into the air. Sure. Then how do you explain the dollar asterisk hashtag at percent principle? Or how asterisk caret dollar hashtag at works? How does it even work when there's no percent asterisk asterisk dollar hashtag? This thing's signal is cutting through 20 layers of jamming arrays dash. Malliot squealed and clutched her notebook to her chest, her eyes shining. I know, right? I haven't had a puzzle like this since that time we got lost in the dollar asterisk hashtag percent at. She turned back to her notebook, writing notes with the speed and dexterity of a woman half her age. She waved the old man away, not even bothering to look up. Now shoo shoo, I've got experiments to plan. You can give the young alpha his lessons instead of me. Malachi's eyes bulged, and he yelled. Wait, why me? You know I hate teaching the brats. Do it yourself. But Maliot only gave the old man a flat look before returning to her work. Malachi grumbled, frowning. His frown suddenly turned into a grin, though, as he looked at Alpha and shrugged. Sorry, kid. I've got things that need doing. I mean, it's not like we got the agreement in writing. Better luck next time. Take this as a learning experience. That will be my real lesson to you. Aren't I the kindest? The old man looked down at Alpha with a grin, smiling smugly. Alpha only stared back in silence. A flash of light appeared from the drone, and a miniature copy of the old man sat at the miniature table, parroting back word for word the terms of their agreement. Malachi stared down at the tiny copy of himself, his eyes wide and mouth agape, while Maliot pointed and laughed at him until she turned blue from breathlessness. Malachi's smile turned rigged, and a vein pulsed on the side of his head. He looked down at Alpha and spoke. Fine, fine, I'll do it. Both of you are bastards, by the way. The smile spread from ear to ear. Though instead of being friendly, Alpha was sure it could have scared away a rabid dog. When the man spoke, his voice was eerily cheery. You don't seem the type to enjoy a classroom lecture though. So let's do this a little, different. Before even Alpha's enhanced reflexes could react, the man reached across the table and plucked his connection to the drone again. Instead of simply wobbling, however, this time, the connection snapped, and the drone's connection broke entirely. 26. Book 1. Lesson 34. Be careful who you mess with. John was a simple man with a simple job. Run through the village, deliver the mail, and collect his pay. Well, simple, was a bit deceptive when your town covered nearly 300 square kilometers and constantly rearranged itself. 
Still, it was honest work and, more importantly, to John, safe, not like those trappers and gatherers who regularly ventured out into the wilds of the prairies. Or even worse, his psychotic seniors, the town runners, who delivered their packages between the various cities and villages that made up the wandering cities. Really, he never understood what kind of person thought it was a good idea to wander through the radiant sea without a grass reader. Who knew what kind of strange beasts or cultivators you might run into out there? No, John was perfectly happy delivering mail within the confines of the Slate Walker village. It's not like much of anything ever happened here. Today had been a good day. He only had a few more parcels to deliver today, too. He even heard there would be a feast later, though he hadn't gotten the details of why. No matter. His second to last parcel was a letter to the captain of the guardians directly from the elders, a last minute addition to his route. It always made John feel important when he got to deliver such vital mail, even if the captain was an intimidating man. He hummed to himself as he rounded the corner, following the tracking jade the capitan carried on his person, only almost be run over by a huge black blur that rushed past. John froze mid-step, his heart racing, his head turned on rusty hinges to stare at the retreating figure. A giant black spirit beast, the likes of which he'd never seen, races around the open field at blistering speeds, a dozen children screaming wildly on its back. Four guardians in full armor chased after it, their silver auras blazing. What was happening? Were they under attack? Were the children being kidnapped? What should he do? Did he need to find someone? Did he need to run? Help. Help. John turned back the way he came his eyes rolling and heart pounding in his chest when a large hand fell on his shoulder. John turned to see the captain staring down at him. The older man smiled and spoke in his deep, booming voice. Ah, John, it's good to see you. I assume that means the elders have sent updated instructions. Good to know. John turned, his arms flailing as he tried to speak. Captain? The thing, Capitan. Big. Children. Black. That way. What the wolf? The captain of the guardians stared down at the runner with a frown, his head tilted. He then turned in the direction John was pointing, his eyes widening. The capitan turned with a smile and patted the much smaller man's shoulder with a laugh. Ah, I see. It must have been a busy day if you have not heard about our new guest. Don't worry. We have everything under control. As if in response to his words, a loud explosion sounded in the distance, accompanied by a small dust cloud and light tremor. John could only stare in silence. When he turned back around, the captain was smiling down at him, his hand outstretched. John numbly reached into his near-empty satchel and retrieved the letter before passing it over and saluting. The captain nodded and turned away, dismissing the quiet runner. Without another word, John turned and ran in the opposite direction, desperate to put as much distance as possible between himself and the capitan's giant. Guest, when he at last stopped, John leaned against his knee sucking in lunges full of air. Well, that was enough excitement for the month. He did not know what was happening back there, and he did not want to find out. All he wanted to do was finish his last delivery for the day, then go home. He needed a nap. Thankfully, his last stop was one he always enjoyed. All he had to do was deliver the package to the nice elderly couple who lived near the edge of town. It was close by to what luck. This was his favorite stop, if he was honest. Old Malachi could be grumpy sometimes. But his wife, Maliot, was a sweet old broad who always offered him a cup of some of the best tea he'd ever had. Every time he drank it, he felt revitalized and energized, like he hadn't just spent ten hours running all over town. Grinning ear to ear, he turned the corner, and froze. John stared wide-eyed, mouth a -getty. What should have been a small, homely cottage was now covered in what appeared to be hundreds of fingers-sized, wasps. They surrounded the building, some flying around in circles others clinging to every surface. Many continually bounced off the windows and other openings, producing small flashes of light as they collided with some kind of barrier. John took a step back, unsure of what he should do. There was no way he was approaching the house like that. Yet, simultaneously, it wasn't like he could abandon the nice old couple to, to whatever this was. Should he turn around and inform the captain? But then what if he encountered his, guest, again? What should he do? However, his choice was soon taken from him as the door to the cottage flew open, and an old woman appeared. However, she didn't look like the kindly old grandma John was used to. No, this Malliot was disheveled, with messy hair and bloodshot eyes, her face and hands stained almost black with various ink stains. So unlike the neat and tidy woman he expected, the instant the door opened, a large group of the wasps broke away and charged the open door, 
only to be repelled by the same strange barrier. Her eyes scanned the surroundings before locking onto him. An icy chill ran down his spine, and the ear-to-ear -ear smile she gave him looked like it belonged more to a tiger than an old woman. She called out to him, waving him forward. Ah, John, about time. I trust you brought what I ordered. Come, come, hurry now. John's eyes scanned the buzzing swarm. Grandma Malliot laughed and called out. Don't worry, boy, they won't hurt you. It's just two children having a bit of a spat, that's all. John shook his head and took a step back. He did not know what that meant, but there was no way he was getting any closer. Malliot sighed and flicked her finger toward him. Instantly, something latched onto the front of his uniform and forcibly dragged him closer. Before he could react, John was standing before Malliot in the middle of a buzzing swarm. The old woman crossed her arms and stared at him, her foot tapping and a brow raised. Visibly shaking, John reached into his satchel and pulled out the package, a head-sized jar of ink and a dozen new booklets. Melliot snatched them from his grasp faster than he could see and held them to her chest with the fervor of a starving man grabbing a loaf of bread. Yes, thank you, John. Who knows what I'd have done if you hadn't shown up? Her words were simple, but the way she had spoken them, his shivering redoubled. The old woman smiled up at the young man with something more akin to what he was used to, then tossed him a coin. A tip for your trouble. Have a good day, John. With those words, she slammed the door in his face. John looked down at the coin in his hand to find an entire crystal chip, more than he'd made in a month if he was lucky. Still shivering, John looked up to find much of the wasp swarm sitting near the doorway, just staring at him. His shaking knuckles going white around the small coin in his hand, John could feel tears welling up in his eyes. He just wanted this day to be over already. Alpha watched as the apparent mailman rushed back to the cover of the nearby house carts. The small wasp, clinging to the back of the man's collar, switched out for a fresh one, with the young man none the wiser. Alpha had been tracking the mailman all day, and it had done wonders for putting names to places and people, as well as being a gold mine of other information. As they, Alpha, said, if you want to really know someone, go through their mail. Of course, most of it had been rather useless to him. Much of it he couldn't even read. The written portion of his lexicon was coming along far slower than the spoken portion. But he had come across some rather scandalous tidbits that he absolutely, positively would use to blackmail someone sometime down the line. Hey, if you didn't want to be blackmailed, don't use public postal services. The other part of his day had been attempting glorious revenge. That old codger thought he could trick Alpha. He was the one who was supposed to be screwing with people. Who did this bastard think he was? For a moment, he'd contemplated showing up in person, then blowing a hole through their front door. A calmer part of him decided that would be a poor choice. He was sure his escorts wouldn't appreciate him shooting up the nice old couple down the lane's house. That would erase all the goodwill he'd built so far. Instead, he'd sent a few more wasps to the house, only to be blocked by an energy barrier that definitely wasn't there before when he tried to sneak back in. The old man, seeming to sense Alpha's attempt, peered out at the drones, grinned from ear to ear, and waved at him. Alpha had tried to will the drone through the glass, to no avail. Malachi actually stuck his tongue out at Alpha before returning to whatever it was he was doing to the deactivated wasp on the table. His back turned so Alpha couldn't get a good look. Oh? He wanted war then? Alpha would show him war. He was built for it. Literally. It wasn't even about the wasp. He could make thousands of them. No, this was personal now. Soon, the house was surrounded by hundreds of tiny drones equipped with various tools and equipment, each trying to break through the barrier differently, but to no luck. It had been nearly eight hours now, and nothing he tried worked. Not even the plasma wielder rated to repair fighter class armor put more than a few scorch marks on the old, glowing wood. Alpha doubted he would see any progress unless he could figure out how these barriers worked, just as he contemplated if he really needed to show up in the TWB. The barrier surrounding the house fizzled like static and popped. The connection to the wayward drone was re-established, and Alpha took control immediately. The drone's camera came online, and the first image Alpha saw at the grinning face of the old man. So he did the only reasonable thing at the moment. He charged Malachi, Stinger first. The old man leaned out of the way, easily dodging the telegraph strike, and the next one from his blind spot too, and the next, and so on. The dance continued for several moments before an empty inkwell swapped the wasp from the sky, rebounding to strike the old codger between the eyes. While Alpha stabilized the drone and Malachi nursed his new welt, Malliot yelled from across the room. Will you two cut that out? You're distracting me. Alpha landed on the nearby table, and Malachi sat down, 
rubbing his head. Alpha was the first to speak. Cough up, old man. We had an agreement. Don't think I'm afraid to play that recording around town. You think you're shameless? I've been doing this since your great-grandfather was in diapers. The old man folded his heart and leaned back, laughing. I'm sure that's incorrect, regardless of how old you think you are. Nonetheless, young man, I don't know what you're talking about. I've already upheld my end of the bargain. Alpha pointed to Malachi with a drone leg. Bull crap! All you've. The old man pulled a small mirror from nowhere and placed it in front of Alpha. The AI paused mid-sentence and turned the drone around to get a better look from various angles. Where once it was just a plain drone, the wasp was now covered in intricate, crossing lines from leg to wingtip. Some were thick and glowed with a strange light, while others were so thin they might have been microscopic to the human eye. Yet, every single one was made with a level of mind-boggling detail. To the point Alpha wondered if the man didn't somehow have a secret workshop filled with advanced machinery somewhere in the house. That might have sounded ridiculous, given the technological level he'd observed so far and the size of the house in general. But it was no less ridiculous than thinking the geriatric man had made the lines by hand. All the lines eventually converged to a single spot, a tiny, glowing gem in the center of the wasp's head. The old man in question looked down at Alpha and raised an eyebrow. Well? Alpha was silent for a moment before responding. Well, what? I asked for lessons, old man, not for you to bling my drone. The old man grinned, then flicked something towards the drone. It flew toward the drone with astounding speed, but rebounded off a small energy shield before it struck. An energy shield the drone hadn't been equipped with only a few hours earlier. Alpha looked up to see what appeared to be a chopstick embedded several inches in the ceiling, still quivering from the force of the impact. Malachi grinned from ear to ear and laughed. Everything you need to know about arrays is stuffed into that. That is, if you have the eyes to see it. Ha ha ha. And if you don't? The old man shrugged and leaned back in his chair. Well then, you were never worth teaching. That's not my problem. Malachi folded his hands and smiled like he told the best joke in the world. Do be careful not to go showing that off though. Some more, unsavory types would chase you to the ends of the world for what's there. Alpha silently observed the various lines on the drone with interest. There definitely was some pattern there, some kind of rule to how they moved and flowed. There was also a defined progression, where the lines became progressively more complex. The question was, was it enough? After a long moment, Alpha finally responded. Fine, I'll take it. The old man leaned forward, all smiles. Good, now get. I've already wasted enough time on this. Maybe if you bring me something actually interesting, there will be more to say. Alpha flew up and hovered in the air. That's fair. Then I'll be on my way. Though, before I do, one last gift. The old man crossed his arms and raised his brow with an arrogant smirk. Oh, at that moment, the cloaking hiding the wasp on the man's shoulder dropped. Malachi's eyes went wild, and he moved to grab it, but it was too late. The drone's stinger pierced the side of the man's neck and injected its payload a split second before it was crushed. The man wiped the drone remains from his shoulder and narrowed his eyes at Alpha. And what did you expect that to do, little boy? I'll have you know I'm immune to more poisons than you know exist. Alpha laughed. Who said it was a poison? The old man raised an eyebrow, then suddenly clutched his lower abdomen. The man's eyes bulged as his guts started making loud rumbling noises. He turned to his wife, sweating. Malliot! Malliot! Help! The old woman didn't even look up from her notebooks as she responded. If you clog the piping, I'm not fixing it. And remember to refill the water tank. The old man's face dropped, and he rushed from the room, deeper into the house. The house was soon filled with the sound of Alpha's laughter and more, unpleasant noises. 24. Book 1. Lesson 35. Remember to read the instruction manual. Alpha poked the drone with a manipulator probe as it rested in the top's maintenance bay. Bays like this were intended to service larger, more expensive drones, but he didn't have many other options. The wasps were cheap and disposable, after all. The drone twitched, and a small light pulse flowed down the lines carved directly into its chassis. That itself was an anomaly. Wasp drones were made nearly entirely of nanites, barring a light metallic skeleton. Any damage to the drone could be repaired near instantly. The drone would break down into its composite nanites only after the internal framework was destroyed beyond repair. So how had the old codger done it? Regardless of how often he ran extensive diagnostic reports, they all came back as Nothing wrong. It was as if Nanites couldn't recognize the changes to the drone, as if the lines had always been a part of it. The Nanites couldn't tell the difference even when the drone was compared to standard wasps. How? Why? 
the entire thing was grinding on his sanity, at least from a programming standpoint. The software was giving him all kinds of issues, but the hardware was coming along far better. He'd yet to identify the energy stored in the strange gem embedded in the drone's head, but how the energy circulated was easy enough to observe. In fact, the unknown energy was observable in several spectrums, and even seemed to change depending on where it was being directed. It flowed through the grooves as easily as water through pipes or electricity through circuits. Alpha suspected that was exactly what they were, but more testing would have to be done. The Third Federation's own hardware and software had long evolved past simple yes-slash-no binary code, but would any of that transfer over? The secret would likely lie in the unknown energy source, which only brought him back to the question of what exactly was it. More importantly, was he willing to risk experimenting with an entirely new, potentially dangerous energy source without the slightest idea what he was doing? Of course he was. The first thing he tried to do was to isolate the energy from the system. This proved more difficult than Alpha had originally suspected. While in the gem, the energy was totally non-reactive. Even the soft glow the gem gave off was nothing more than common light to Alpha's equipment. The gem seemed designed to be replaceable and could easily be removed and reattached to the drone with some small manipulation of its component nanites. It was even carved with a little spiraling groove that slotted seamlessly into the design. But once it was removed, all energy flows stopped completely, and Alpha was left with what appeared to be just a pretty rock. Observing the energy as it exited the stone was pointless, as any break in the connecting seal would render the entire thing inert. Trying to siphon off the energy as it flowed through the grooves was just as frustrating. Carving any new grooves into the system caused that section of grooves to shut down. The energy would just stop flowing through that area, bypassing it entirely through several node points. Alpha made some headway thanks to that, however. By selectively cutting off different sections, he could map several key sections of the groove network. The various sections' purpose was anyone's guess, but it was progress. Studying the gem itself yielded some interesting results as well. Close examination and some micro-samples revealed the gem to be, in reality, some form of organic crystal. One of his sub is dinged an entry in his logs, and Alpha pulled up the record. The crystal was a nearly identical match in structure and composition to the strange crystals he had pulled out of a few penguins' hearts. Interesting. Alpha pulled one of the sample crystals he'd collected from the top storage and compared the two. Other than the drone's gem being meticulously cut and polished, the two gems were identical in size, roughly half the drone's head, and similar in color, though far richer and deeper. Though from what little Alpha knew of lapidary, the stone that the cut gem came from had likely been several times larger. The theory was further supported by a large number of cracks and inclusions in the raw crystal. But the real question was, did it contain the same type of energy itself? Or was it merely a container? It was hard to tell, as the raw crystal was as inert as the cut stone when disconnected from the groove network. With that in mind, there was a simple way of testing it. And it just so happened to be a specialty of Alpha's, copying other people's work and pretending like it was his own. Huzzah! It works! Maliot raised her ink-stained hands into the air and cheered. Malachi lowered the book he'd been reading and peered over its edge toward his wife. Back in the land of the living, I see. Good. What's for din? The small red welt on his forehead doubled in size as the sound of another empty inkwell contacting his skull cut off his words. Malachi rubbed his head and glared at the ink-stained woman on the other side of the room. Grumbling, he asked. Fine. Fine. What did you do? Maliot grinned from ear to ear and raised a single finger. A small light bloomed at its tip. Malachi waved his hand unimpressed. Nothing special. Any young man with a bit of talent could do that. Maliot's grin widened even further. The light on top of her finger blinked out. No, that wasn't quite right. Maliki narrowed his eyes and focused on the point above her finger. He could see the air, waver slightly. The old man switched to spirit sight, but he couldn't quite make out what he was seeing even then. It looked like she was just channeling spirit energy into nothing? No, not nothing. Again, her spirit energy flexed, and now the nothing became a different nothing? That didn't make any sense. The old man stood, walked over, and waved his hand over his wife's finger. It was hot? An invisible flame? No, there was no fire affinity at all. It simply was heat. He'd heard of a heatless flame before, but flameless heat. How? Oh sure, the uneducated might say that sunlight was a kind of flameless heat. But those in the know understood that even the heat of the sister above and the faraway sun were just different aspects and manifestations of 
Fire. That was why any aspiring solar mage or cultivator had to start with learning the basics of fire before moving on to controlling the more complicated solar affinity. Even the boiling lakes far to the icy north could be attributed to the burning magma found deep below. So how was she producing heat without the smallest amount of fire aligned spirit energy? He asked her as much, too. How are you doing that? Maliot only smirked. You weren't paying the slightest bit of attention, were you? Maliki only grumped and turned away, muttering something under his breath about rude juniors and nerdy old women, then yelped as a small scorch mark appeared on the back of his head. Maliki smacked the spot then whirled around to face the old crone. Malia didn't even bother pretending she wasn't responsible. Malachi's face flushed red, and he opened his mouth to yell. But another scorch mark appeared right over the still swollen lump on his head. Malia broke into laughter as he rubbed the now lightly singed lump. She flexed her spirit energy a third time, but Malachi was ready for it this time. He threw up a small spirit barrier in front of the invisible attack, only for a third scorch mark to appear on his chest. The old man went pale as Maliot's grin turned predatory. Of course, a barrier meant to block a spirit attack hadn't worked. There was never any spirit energy, to begin with. The patrolling guardian, who would later respond to claims of someone skinning a cat, would later refuse to give a full report on the grounds of concerns for his safety and well-being. Huzzah! It works! Alpha raised his arms in victory. He'd destroyed two dozen of the heart crystals trying to mimic the cut of the drone's gem with little success. The raw crystals were surprisingly difficult to damage, but once he had, it had the nasty habit of crumbling to dust. It took a few tries before a careful examination of the cut stone showed it had never been truly cut at all. Instead, it appeared to have been fractured along some naturally occurring lines. Closer observation of the raw crystals revealed similar lines running throughout the crystal structure. Fracturing along these lines not only kept the crystal intact but somehow deepened the crystal's color. The pieces broken off, meanwhile, were pale and colorless, as if all the color had been drained from them. How that worked? Alpha didn't have the faintest clue. The next part had been the hardest, actually extracting the energy. Trying to carve the same spiral pattern into the gem no longer resulted in the crystal simply crumbling to dust. No, now the results were far more explosive. That such a small crystal, only a few millimeters wide after fracturing, could explode with such force was impressive. Thankfully, the TWP was equipped with more than one bay. It took Alpha a few hours to come up with a solution. At first, he thought the spiral was there to transfer power. But why make it a spiral? Why cause so much damage to an already unstable crystal when other methods might work better? But what if the spiral was just there to increase the surface area in contact with the grooves instead? It wasn't there to draw out power but collect as much of the energy already leaking as possible. With that theory in mind, Alpha tried something different. Instead of cutting into the gem, Alpha carved the groove to fit the gem perfectly on a microscopic level. The form-fitted gem was connected to an exact replica of a section of the line network Alpha's experiments suggested acted as a reservoir for the energy before it was sent to other areas. Of course, scaled down to fit the much smaller gem. This section seemed to be responsible for actually pulling the energy out of the gem, though how it did so would have to be studied further. And it worked, kind of. The energy in the gem reacted as expected, flowing through the gem and into the reservoir. However, it did so chaotically, leaping from the grooves at random intervals and sputtering at times. Still, it was progress. Or it was until the entire array network started to warp and twist. Oh no, that can't be good. Using the drone launch platform in the bay, Alpha ejected the small piece of carved metal and embedded gem, no bigger than a few centimeters, into the air, several dozen meters. The near-meter-wide fireball that lit up the night sky sent several nearby people running and set the guards on edge. It seemed Alpha still had some kinks to work out. 25. Book 1. Lesson 36. Multitasking can be fun too. Boom. 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 Three of the fleeing targets erupted into large fireballs, spraying their remains over grassy prairies. The fourth and final target was a different beast altogether, however. It had dodged every attack thrown at it for the past ten minutes but each new attack was closer than the last. Still, it bobbed and weaved through the air to buy more time. So much was riding on this. If only it could hold out but a little longer. Boom! It dodged another blast by a hair, only for the shockwave to send it spinning. Boom! It recovered just in time to dodge a second attack shortly after. The enemy was becoming quicker, if it didn't. Boom! 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 
several consecutive blasts blocked its escape path and forced it to change directions. It only took a split second to realize it had been tricked. But even that wasn't enough time to save it. Equals 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 equals. A fourth blast hit the final stone target dead on, shattering it into a rain of shards and dust. The captain fell to his knees, tears in his eyes. His vacation funds. The surrounding crowd, on the other hand, cheered as various pets passed hands. The captain turned and glared at one group in particular. A large metal beast waved its arms in victory as a group of young children danced around him. Several proudly wearing the patrol helmets stayed. One. Off of his guardians. Damn these slate walker kids. They only got worse and worse with every generation. He sure as hell hadn't been this bad. Okay. So he had accidentally burned down a third of the village when he mistook an emberdrake whelp for ash salamander. But that had been an accident. This was calculated maliciousness. The captain had only stepped away after receiving his new orders from the village council, mostly to finish the paperwork that would be needed later. A few hours later, he had gotten reports of explosions on the village parameter. He'd rushed to the scene, only to see the spirit beast, along with his ever-growing gang of children, had challenged his guards to a game of skeet. Guards who should have been watching there. Guest, no one knew the origin of. Skeet. But it had become a popular training exercise for guardians throughout the Radiant Sea. One or more soldiers would control a group of stone discs, while another group would attempt to shoot them out of the air with various spirit techniques. It was a great exercise for polishing control and accuracy, as well as encouraging teamwork and quick thinking. Many would even place bets on the outcome of matches, even if it was technically against regulation. The captain himself was an expert. Evader and he was proud to say he never once lost a match since entering the Golden Spirit step, even against his more powerful and well-trained seniors among the Jade Walkers. So when he'd seen the defeated looks on his men's faces, the captain couldn't let that stand, of course. Almost thirty minutes later, however, the results spoke for themselves. Even some of his own men had bet against him. The traitors. As the captain knelt in the grass, a figure approached. The captain looked up to see a young girl smiling gently down at him. She wasn't quite old enough to have started her own apprenticeship yet, but she was still one of the three oldest of the group, making her one of their leaders by default. The young girl's smile widened as he met her eyes, and she held out a hand to him. The clouds of the captain's defeat seemed to part as his heart warmed at the girl's gesture. He smiled back at her and stretched his hand out to meet hers. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe there really was some hope for this generation of children, after all. As he did, the girl's hand passed by his and latched onto his helmet. Then, with one swift motion, she yanked it from his head. The captain could only stare, frozen, hand outstretched, as the girl ran away, raising her, prize high about her head to the cheers of all the children. The captain's face sank, and he ground his teeth in frustration. Seeming to feel his stare, the captain's daughter turned around and stuck her tongue out at him before turning back to her friends. That was it. No way was she getting dessert after dinner tonight. Equals equals equals. Alpha watched the children march in formation, each wearing a metal helmet several sizes too large for them. At the front, an older girl led them along, a slightly more ornate helm bobbing on her shoulders. When the children proposed their game, Alpha wasn't sure what to expect. Of course, the guards never asked who they would compete against, so they had no one to blame but themselves. He had to admit that the slime munchkins had pulled the rug out from under the guards. It was amusing to watch. Alpha was often accused of corrupting the children and being a bad influence or teaching bad habits. But for once, he could honestly say no one here needed much corrupting at all. It helped the game was the perfect opportunity to both test his newest toy and observe more of the strange abilities the people of this world seemed to have. He still wasn't fully convinced this wasn't some kind of shared Esper ability. But humans weren't a species with such a thing and that wouldn't explain the various animals he'd observed doing similar things. More data was necessary to fully understand it. As for his new toy, he wasn't sure if it could be called useful, or just that, nothing more than a novelty. His experiments with the heart crystals had hit a dead end, and he couldn't figure out why. He'd tried several combinations of lines and connection methods, but none had proven very stable, or even usable so far. Instead, he turned his attention to the more stable but drained shard formed by the fracturing process. What little testing he could do with the limited equipment had shown they were just some kind of organic quartz, as he suspected. Mostly, rather than just silicon dioxide arranged in a crystalline pattern, 
The crystals appeared to use the quartz crystal to provide structure to several unknown inclusions he couldn't identify. Alpha theorized that it was these inclusions that actually stored the energy inside the crystal, with the quartz acting as a kind of insulation. But he had no proper way of testing this yet. What he had discovered, though, was that these crystal shards could be recharged, in a manner of speaking. By linking the shards to his test array, he'd siphoned off the energy into the shards, temporarily recharging them. This had the added benefit of keeping the test array stable for longer. His arrays likely exploded because of the constant flow of energy being pumped into them with nowhere to go, like a balloon filling with far more water than it could hold. Charging the shards drained some of the energy, releasing some of the pressure. They'd still fail, eventually, but Alpha could study the energy flow for far longer now. However, these recharged shards were far more explosive than even the cut gems and would quickly destabilize. Instead of letting the shards self-destruct and waste their energy, Alpha decided to do something more, fun with them. Some quick simulations later and Alpha's prototype, Crystal Rail, system was finished. The idea was simple. Attach a small piece of shaped crystal shard to a modified rail round and then use one of the test arrays to recharge the crystal. That had been the trickiest part, but after some tweaking, he'd settled on a design that would slot the cut gem into the array on demand, then decouple it before the system could overload. The result was interesting, if nothing less. He could extract dozens of raindrop-sized crystal shards from a single heart crystal, and once charged, each would explode into a small fireball a few inches across. That was almost as effective as some of the Federation's low-grade explosives. Alpha was excited about the concept. If he could refine it further, it might be a respectable alternative to the more resource-expensive rail rounds and free up that material for other projects. The prototype system had some major downsides, however. Less metal meant less mass. This translated into far lower kinetic power and velocity. That meant the crystal rounds would have a harder time piercing hard armor, making them rely more on their explosive damage than sheer impact or penetration. If he was just going up against biologicals, especially things like the penguins, that might not matter much. But even some tougher mundane megafauna could shrug off lower caliber rail rounds. Now give those creatures magic powers on top of that? The crystal rail would likely not have much effect at all, at least in its present state. There was also his current limited supply of actual heart crystals. Sure, he had a few hundred at this point, but it wasn't like he could turn all of them into ammunition. He still needed a lot of them to experiment and study. It's possible the entire system was a complete waste of resources as well, and he just didn't know it yet. Nonetheless, it was a good start. Equals equals equals. Three days. Kallik had been stuck in various meetings and talks for three entire days. One could argue that for a cultivator of her level, that wasn't too long. After all, some cultivators could spend weeks or even months in meditation and seclusion. But those times were filled with peaceful meditation and reflection, not constant bickering and political maneuvering by this elder or that. There was a reason she'd chosen to take a more hands-on approach with the young apprentices when she rose to elder herself. She'd rather deal with that insanity than be stuck in a room with these geezers daily. But sometimes you had to do what you had to do. That was simply the way of things. Not that this particular discussion should have taken more than a few hours. But someone always had more to say. The hottest topic of debate was, of course, the Lord Protector. Even with all of their eyewitness accounts, no one could decide if he was truly a progenitor or not. Some elders flat out denied it, thinking such a thing was preposterous that the creature was a danger and should be killed or chased away. Others assumed the spirit beast was simply an extraordinarily powerful being, and even if it wasn't a progenitor, it could still be swayed to their side as an ally. After all, many larger villages had powerful, guardian beasts, of their own. Why shouldn't the slate walkers? More still were fully invested in Kallik's progenitor theory, but even then, there was division. Few could agree whether they should report events in their entirety to the Jade Walkers or hide the maybe progenitor for themselves. Both sides had their fair points. If they reported everything to the Jade Walkers, the status of the Slate Walker village would instantly skyrocket, regardless of the truth. That meant more support, more supplies, and better access to services they couldn't provide themselves. But that also risked the Lord Protector being stolen by the much more powerful and wealthy Jade Walkers. While the Slate Walkers were technically subordinate to the city itself, none in the village had a particular fondness for the overly pompous High Clan, especially after some of the trouble they had been causing the past few years. Not reporting everything would let them keep their secrets, 
and possibly by them time to both win over the Lord Protector's favor and gather the strength to push back against anyone who might try to poke their nose in further. But it would also leave some glaring holes in their story, holes that might attract the wrong kind of attention. And so the arguments went back and forth, over and over and over. It took three days for them to finally come to a decision, and frankly, Calic wasn't too excited about it. But then, what could she do? 22. Book 1. Lesson 37. Plans should be flexible. The small gathering comprised most of the people Alpha would have expected. Uligan, Calic, the captain, whom he'd yet to hear anyone actually refer to by name, the senior guard Jotun, and two older gentlemen who only introduced themselves as Elder Ganzerig and Elder Batu. Then, of course, Alpha himself. The two he hadn't expected to see were Ganbader and Zalzea. It was Alpha's understanding that the two were just stepping into adulthood by the village's standards, so it struck the AI as odd that they would be invited to such an important meeting, a sentiment that was echoed by Elder Ganzerig. Kalik, why are the children here? Kalik turned to answer, but Zalzea beat her to it. The young woman cupped her hands and bowed at the hip as she spoke. With all due respect, Elder Ganzerig, we have passed our apprenticeships. We are no longer children. We are also some of the few with first-hand accounts of the events we will discuss. Thus, I believe it's imperative we understand our next steps from here. Elder Ganzerig furrowed his brow and raised a hand, but his words were stopped by a gentle hand on his shoulder. The owner of the hand in question, Elder Batu, was the one to speak instead. The young woman is not wrong, my friend. If things are to go as planned, keeping them in the loop will only help. The other elder frowned but said nothing more. Alpha didn't miss the smile on the face of the guard named Jotun, even hidden by the man's scruffy beard. Alpha chuckled to himself. He liked the young woman, even if she didn't seem too fond of him. She reminded him of a young woman named Madeline back in the Federation, a native to one of his more recent conquests. She was young, even by Federation standards, but she was also stubborn, resourceful, and far more intelligent than those around her gave her credit for. In only a few short years, the young woman had risen from an orphan street rat to Alpha's chief mechanic and overseer of most of his production labs. Not that you'd know Alpha was in charge if you ever heard Madeline speak to him. The young woman was rougher than some grizzled soldiers three times her age and was one of the few people able to keep some of Alpha's more eccentric ideas in check. As Alpha reminisced, Zalzea turned to him and narrowed her eyes, as if sensing his amusement. Alpha stared back, the black face of his primary optical sensor plate spinning. She broke eye contact only as the rest of the group continued. The captain was first to speak. There's been a slight change of plans. New information has come to light, and we need to up the schedule. Gambader raised his hand and asked. In what way? We weren't informed of the original plan. The captain nodded. The village elders had chosen to send your group, you, Zalzea, Oligan, and Kalik, along with a guardian escort, ahead to the Earth Shrine. Officially, you'll be there to get you to emergency care. The others are recovering well, but the young man needs better care than we can give. The group's eyes fell at the mention of the young man. Alpha had been monitoring his condition through the nanites still in his system, and it wasn't good. They'd kept him stable so far, in no small part thanks to the medical nanites, but he still needed extensive surgery. If Alpha had a base set up, he could have thrown you two into a recovery pod for a few days, and he'd be fine. But the village was missing several key components that the AI needed to print such a complicated device. That was even before considering the overall expense, and nanites and resources, to set it up. Not that he'd be the one paying for it, of course, but the fact remained it wasn't feasible at the moment. Elder Ganzerig was the next to speak. While there, Uligan and Kalik will attempt to contact the Aklut representative stationed at the shrine. If Uligan's theory is correct, and the Beast Lord had allies within the wandering cities, we believe it's safer to contact the Aklut directly rather than tip off any who might be listening. The captain nodded then turned to look at the Alpha and continued. At first, we planned to ask the Lord Protector to transport the group most of the way before returning. The elders have decided it is in everyone's best interests that the Jade Walkers aren't made aware of his presence just yet, at least not until the child is found. Elder Batter turned and bowed to Alpha as he elaborated. We mean no insult, Lord Protector. We don't believe you would needlessly cause trouble. Ha 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 ha. Alpha mentally broke out into laughter, earning another glare from Zalzea. The elder continued unaware. But the Jade Walkers, as a whole, have a reputation for being reactive. We feel it would simplify things if they're unaware of your involvement. Such a thing could give any traitorous elements in the city the opening they need to slip away, or worse, bend events in their favor. Alpha mentally frowned but agreed. 
He could just waltz into town and stir up the place. But a hostile takeover at this point in time would be counterproductive. The captain again took over. As I mentioned, however, new information means we must change our plans. Lord Protector, if you would. The TWP bobbed in acknowledgement and switched on his holographic projection. The two elders jumped. Alpha never tired of that. But the others had already seen this ability and only stared. Alpha's map of the region had grown substantially since the ruins. Not only had the village itself been making steady progress along their route, but Alpha had sent out swarms of wasp drones to scout the areas they passed through. It was still only a sliver of the size of entire prairies, estimated by high-altitude scanning, but it was impressive. The group took a moment to marvel at the sight, but it was, surprisingly, Gambader who noticed what they were supposed to see. The young man narrowed his eyes and pointed to an image on the map. A cartoonish-looking face of a black and white creature, its tongue happily hanging from its mouth. Is that what I think it is? The image was far to the north, so far away, in fact, that no wasp had even come close to reaching it yet. Though the map was updated in real time as several drones made a beeline toward the location. Alpha spoke only a single word, still maintaining the mysterious and dignified persona he was cultivating. To the side, Zalzea put her face in her hand and sighed. Yes. Ganvader's face lit up as he spoke excitedly. Then what are we waiting for? We know where she is now. Let's go rescue her. The small Oklet pup had saved his life several times now, in fact, so he would jump on any chance to repay even a small part of that debt. It helped that he genuinely enjoyed the child's company. Many other Oklet were said to be more aloft and cold, preferring the company of the strong and fierce. The child was far more friendly and excitable, reminding him of his younger sister when she was that age. Jordan held out a hand, his words smothering the young man's excitement. It's not that simple, Ganna. You two still needs treatment, and the Oklet still need to be warned about the Beast Lord's plots. Ganbader furrowed his brow and clenched his fists. So we're just going to leave her? We don't know what these people's intentions are. By the time we tell her family, it might already be too late. Juatan nodded. You're right. We don't know who these people are or what they want with the child. But that's all the more reason we can't go rushing off. What if it's a powerful clan, or some high-level cultivator none of us have a chance against? Remember, these people stole the child away from under the nose of the Lord Protector, distracted as he was or not. Can you say that even if you rushed to them immediately, you could do anything meaningful to help her? Ganbader frowned and tried to respond, but found no words. After a moment, he looked at the ground. The captain picked up after Jotun. We're not abandoning her, young man, don't fear. We just have to play the part we can and leave the rest to those with the power necessary to do more. Ganbader nodded but said nothing more. Instead, it was Zalzea who spoke. Then how has the plan changed? The captain nodded to the young woman. Mostly the same. The Lord Protector will still transport the group most of the way to the Earth Shrine, but instead of returning, he has agreed to track the signal further and either gather information or attempt to rescue. Meanwhile, you four will approach the Shrine with the information we have. With any luck, the Akhlet representative will respond swiftly. That is what they are supposedly there for, after all. There's only one slight hiccup we're unsure what to make of. Oligan spoke up for the first time, also unaware of the changes until now. What's the problem? Kalak answered him. The location the child has appeared. We've compared the Lord Protector's map to our own and are reasonably sure we know where the child has been taken. The Temple of the Prima. The group, even the elders, fell into silence, looks of confusion passing over them in a wave. Apparently, this was recent news to most of them. Elder Ganzerig was the first to recover. That is most peculiar. Why would they bring the child there? After all, the temple is the seat of power for the Akhlet. Could they have already recovered her? Kalik shook her head. It's possible, but I highly doubt it. Something is wrong. What do you mean? Gambader asked. Zalzea was the one to respond. Because it's Abditus Apex. Kalik nodded and continued. Correct. The darkest night is only a few days away. The Radiant Heart, where the Temple of the Prima is located, will be at its most chaotic and dangerous at that time. Even the Akla would have migrated to their Earth Shrines weeks ago. A year on Relictus was broken down into four seasons, each, in turn, broken into a month of Genesis, Apex, and Requiem, for a total of twelve months. Abditus, the season of darkness, was when the sun was almost completely hidden behind the celestial sister, the larger planet that Relictus orbited. Even what little daylight the planet got was brief, with only the warmth radiating from the sister keeping the planet from freezing. The month of Apex was the harshest, as the planet entered the larger planet's shadow. 
The radiancies got little snow. In fact, Gambader could count the number of times he'd seen snow on both hands, but that didn't stop the harsh winds and biting cold from infecting the prairies. The darkest night was by far the most dangerous time of the month. On this day, in the middle of Apex, in the middle of Abditus, Relictus would be fully enveloped by the sisters' shadow, completely cutting off the light and warmth of the sun to their planet. This was a difficult time in most places, as the Een, Shadow, and Isoline spirit energy skyrocketed, causing all sorts of trouble. In the Radiant Seas, where the spirit energy was already chaotic, this event was cataclysmic. Only the earth shrines and temples were safe, as they absorbed this insane influx of energy from the area. The only other time that could be compared was the brightest day, during Lux Apex, when the planet baked under the combined heat of the local star and the celestial sister. The alternating seasons in between, Restitua and Acasis, respectively, were used to gather supplies and prepare. It wasn't a stretch to say that most people's lives on Relictus revolved around preparing for these two yearly events. Either cultivators and mages working to gather the rare and powerful natural treasures that appeared during the events, or the common man, simply trying to survive them. Gambader tilted his head, still confused. But I don't understand. Aren't the earth temples even safer than the earth shrines? Why would it be dangerous? Zalzea answered him with a sigh. This is why you should pay attention during lessons, Gana. What is the purpose of the earth shrines? Ganbader turned to her and frowned. To provide shelter during Apex? Zalzea shook her head. Wrong. That's just a welcomed side effect. The shrines and temples were built long before the wandering cities ever settled the prairies, remember? Who would they protect? Ganbader's frown deepened. But the barriers, Zalzea cut him off, are later additions by the Akhlet to extend their effects. Ganbader threw his hands into the air. Fine. Then you tell me, big brain, what are they used for? Zalzea grinned ear to ear. To gather energy, Ganbader sighed as Zalzea continued. Or, to be more exact, to absorb the chaotic energy of the prairies and channel it. Ganbader's eyes went wide as it clicked. To the heart, Kalik nodded and took over. Correct. All the energy gathered by the various earth shrines and temples throughout the Radiant Sea is directed and concentrated in the Radiant Heart at the center of the Temple of the Prima. This also means that during Lux and Abditus Apex, when those energies are at their strongest and most volatile, the heart becomes one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Even the Akhlat, with their natural resistances, are forced to abandon the area. Uligan frowned and asked, Then, why would whoever took the child bring them to such a dangerous place? And now, of all times, Kalik turned and mirrored the man's frown. Yes, that's the question, isn't it? 20. Book 1. Lesson 38. Parting is such sweet sorrow. The village was a buzz of activity as preparations for the group's departure were underway. Only the higher-ups in the village understood the real reason, with most of the village being told they were sending out an advanced group to get you to the help he needed. Not inaccurate, but not the full truth, either. The captain stood guard over the group of various villagers and families, stoically watching. Jotun, his right hand, had volunteered to lead the trip to the Earth Shrine. The captain suspected mostly to keep an eye on his daughter. The quiet man had been a wreck while the village waited to learn the fate of the last apprentice group, and he'd yet to leave his daughter's side for more than a short while since. Jotun's chosen second had been a surprise though. Monk was a shy woman, almost to the point of timidness. Coupled with her dainty size and disdain for combat, she was the exact opposite of what most would call a guardian. That didn't stop her from being the foremost defensive expert in the village, or even the Jade Walker City. Despite being an entire greater step and several lesser, stronger than her, the captain doubted even he could break through her defenses quickly. It wasn't a stretch to say she had been considered the most talented young guardian of her generation overall, even if she was slightly slower on the cultivation side of things. Had been, that was. That title had been snatched up by the third and final member of the group's escort, and the village's newest senior guardian, Uligan. From upper, brown spirit, to mid-dash, silver spirit, the captain couldn't help but shake his head at that kind of insane growth. What had the young man seen to suddenly shoot up the ranks so much? Something in his gut told him he didn't want to know. They needed to be quick, with the darkest night less than a week away. Thankfully, they could pack light for this trip, as the Lord Protector would bring the group within a few hours' walk from the Earth Shrine, close enough that they shouldn't encounter any serious issues, but far enough away that they shouldn't be detected either. The village itself would still take a few more days to arrive. But if everything went according to plan, things should be wrapped up by then. As for the Lord Protector himself, the captain sighed and turned to the largest gathering present, one composed entirely of children, 
all surrounding a large metal spirit beast. The gang had grown to over a hundred now, and the captain doubted there was a child under thirteen, too young to start their apprenticeships yet, in the village missing. They had been oddly quiet for some time now, and for slate walker children, quiet was often very suspicious. The captain could even see several on the fringes whispering to each other, staring at something. He narrowed his eyes and approached, hiding his presence, saying goodbye to the Lord Protector, are you? As one, the group jumped and turned, staring up at him with wide eyes. The group was silent momentarily before a younger boy in the crowd stuttered out. Why, yes, sir. Just, just saying gee goodbye. Nothing else. Nope. Not at OWW. What was that for? The group went silent once more. The captain frowned and raised a brow, folding his arms. An older girl near the back, wearing a familiar ornate helmet, pointed at him and yelled, He's on to us! Scatter! Like a colony of fleeing insects, the children broke in all directions, screaming the entire time. Once the area was cleared, the captain turned to Lord Protector and stared. The Lord Protector stared back in silence before raising his arms in the air and speaking. I know nothing. The captain could only turn around and sigh, shaking his head. But why do you have to be the ones to go? We just got our daughter back, and now you want to drag her off into more danger? There are others who can do it instead, please, just stay home. Salzea stared at the sobbing woman clinging to her father, warring emotions tumbling through her head. Her mother's words were about what she expected, if she was honest. She wouldn't call the woman simple-minded, but she had never hidden her desires or pretended to be anything more than what she was. That could be good, and bad. Yet, instead of the hard-faced matriarch who ruled her home with an iron grip she'd grown up with, the woman in front of her seemed like a stranger. In the short time she'd been gone, Zalzea's mother had gone from slightly pudgy, full of vigor and fire, to a thinning, hollow-faced woman with deep shadows on her face. She might have only been a simple weaver, but her own natural talent and help from her father had seen the woman well into mid-dash, bronze spirit. To be in this kind of state after only a few weeks, had she even eaten once since Zalzea had left? The sight, coupled with what her gift was telling her, made Zalzea question if she ever really understood why her mother was the way she was. When she'd first come home, she'd expected the same anger, frustration, and that infuriating, righteous self-certainty that she was right, that had triggered their fight before the apprentice's test had started. Instead, her mother had wrapped her in a hug and sobbed, nearly overwhelming Zalzea with an odd mixture of deep sorrow and euphoric joy. What anger that was present wasn't directed at her daughter, but at herself. The whole encounter had been strange. When was the last time she'd seen her mother openly weep? It had to have been years ago, when her father was almost killed because Zalzea refused to play along with that pompous young master who thought he could have anything he wanted with the snap of his fingers. Even her, her mother's smile had died that day replaced with a near-constant seething anger lurking just under the surface. Her grip over Zalzea's life had tightened, and the young woman always suspected her mother blamed her for her father's injury, at least in part. But now, now Zalzea didn't know what to think if she was honest. Was learning there was more to your parents just a part of growing up? Or was she seeing more than she had before? She didn't know and didn't really have the time to think about it. Her mother turned to her and hugged her, the slightly shorter woman burying her face in Zalzea's chest as she sobbed. Please, don't go. I don't want to lose you again. Zalzea hesitated for a moment, but slowly returned the hug, fighting back her own tears. I have to, mother. I can't leave you two together alone. Her mother flinched in her arms at the mention of you two. She'd been opposed to the two taking the oath at first. She'd have likely outright rejected the idea entirely if you two's mother wasn't her own oath sister. But he'd grown on her over the years and Zalzea had gotten more than one scolding for. Getting the poor boy into trouble, her mother's hug grew tighter, and Zalzea gently pushed her away. She looked into the older woman's eyes, mimicking her mother's tone when she wanted Zalzea to pay close attention. Mother, I must. I'm not a child anymore, and there are things I have to do, things only I can do. Her mother stared back, wide-eyed, before falling silent and lowering her eyes. As she spoke, her voice was softer than Zalzea could ever remember it being. I. I just want you to be safe, Zaya. You, Zalzea cut her off, speaking softly. I know, mother. They were silent for a moment longer before her mother turned to her father. She stared at the ground for a moment before looking up at him, a small fire in her eyes, appearing a little more like the woman she was before. She poked her husband in the chest and spoke. You bring our girl back, you hear me? I don't want any excuses. You, she choked, 
almost breaking into a sob again. When she recovered, her words were softer. You. Protect her, all right? Juadan stared down at his wife, a soft smile spreading on his face. He reached out and wrapped both women in a deep hug, gently whispering, With my life. Gambader stood a few feet from the makeshift travel bed on which his friend lay. He'd already said goodbye to his family and even had to pull his little sister out of her hiding spot on the Lord Protector. He was sure the powerful spirit beast was just kidding when it pretended not to notice the young girl crawl into the carrier box. But this wasn't the time to put up with her antics. Besides, his mother would kill him if she actually snuck along with them. After saying his goodbyes, he'd gone to check on you two to find the young man's mother kneeling beside his still form, openly weeping. That had been uncomfortable. Ganbader didn't remember ever seeing you two's mother crying before. In fact, she was by far one of the most cheery and happy people he'd ever met in stark contrast to Zaya's own rigid and often heavy-handed mother. As an herbalist, Ganbader's mother socialized with a different group than those two, so they weren't too close. But when they did interact, often after one of their three children's hijinks went awry, she liked to joke how the two seemed to be two sides of the same coin. Ganbader had to agree with his mother's assessment. Yutu's father, the man who taught Ganbader much of what he knew, stood behind her in full guardian attire. The man stood stoic, but Gambader could still see the tear streaks on his face through the opening on his helm. The man had volunteered for the escort team, as had Gambader's own father, but both had been turned down by the elders. Other than needing to travel light, too large of a group would draw unwanted attention before they could speak to the shrine. Gambader's father wasn't weak by any means, but you two and Zelzea's fathers were both vice captains. It was already suspicious enough that Jotun was leading the group, two vice captains and three elites stepping away from the village all for the sake of one boy, would raise questions they weren't ready to answer. Likely sensing his approach, Yutu's father turned around and met Gambader's eyes. The older man placed a hand on his wife's shoulder, then turned and walked towards the younger man. Gambader's back straightened, and he saluted the vice-captain, who returned the gesture. The two stood in awkward silence for a moment before Gambader tried to speak. Sir, I, I'm sorry I should ha. Yutu's father raised a hand and cut him off. Should have are for politicians and philosophers, young man. You may not be a guardian in name, but you've always had one's heart. Don't taint that with beating yourself up over what you should have done. Instead, strive to do better next time. Gambader paused. He wanted to look away, but met the older man's eyes and clenched his fists as he responded. Yes, sir. The vice captain smiled and nodded, then clasped the young man on his shoulder. Your father's been bragging about you, you know won't shut up about how his boy stared down the beast lord and stood strong against an entire army. Gambader blushed and turned away at that, scratching his head. He stuttered slightly at the praise. I didn't. I mean, it's not as I impressive as it seems. They were just grass breakers after all. Besides, his gaze fell to his leg, the makeshift prosthetic replaced with a finely crafted wooden leg just below his knee. He was still getting used to it, but it was a work of art courtesy of his uncle one of the better carpenters in the village. The carving was so detailed that he doubted anyone could tell it was a prosthetic if he wore shoes and long pants. It was even carved from a block of cloud ash, making it exceptionally light. The rare wood would have cost more than a fresh trapper like himself could have afforded in years. But the elders had taken the cost on the village as a reward for his actions. His teacher's eyes also fell on the leg, and he frowned, his grip on the young man's shoulder tightening slightly. He turned hard eyes to the young man and spoke solemnly. Never be ashamed of what you gave up to save another. Even if you make mistakes, use them as tools to learn and grow, not bury yourself under their weight. Then, just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone, replaced with a bright smile. The man patted his shoulder and laughed. Besides, you'll get used to it in time. You might not be the most talented in this generation of monsters, but you'll make up for it in heart. I'm sure of that. Ganbader furrowed his brow, skeptical that he would ever get used to it, or even be allowed to go out on another gathering trip with such a crippling injury. However, before he could speak, Yutu's father leaned in. The man looked around as if checking to ensure no one was looking their way. He then pulled off the thick metal gauntlet from his hand to relieve a silky-looking black glove. Ganbader tilted his head in confusion, but his eyes suddenly widened as the older man removed the glove. Instead of seeing healthy flesh, Ganbader caught the gleam of blue metal. Almost 3 slash 5 THS of the man's left hand was simply missing, with only the pointer and thumb remaining flesh. His other three digits, and a sizable portion of his palm, had been replaced with a dull blue metal gambator couldn't identify. 
The metal appeared fused to what remained of the man's hand, but instead of being lifeless and rigid, the metal flexed and bent like it had always been there. The man even twisted and turned the metal hand in various directions as if showing off, grinning the entire time. Gambader frowned then asked, What happened to never being ashamed? The man laughed, and with a flex of spirit energy, the metal became spiked and jagged in some spots while others slithered around like metal tentacles. One finger even morphed into a vicious-looking dagger. With a chuckle, he spoke. Don't be ashamed, but don't share information that might come in handy later. Yutu's father laughed at possibly the worst pun the young man had ever heard him say. Yet Gambader could only stare, mouth open and eyes wide. The man replaced his glove and gauntlet, then patted the younger man's shoulder again. His grin never dropped as he spoke. Like I said, you'll adapt. You're smarter than you give yourself credit for, Gana. Never give up, and keep walking your path. I have full confidence you'll proudly stand side by side with you two and Zaya one day. The man then stood straight and saluted before turning and walking back to his wife and son. Gambader returned the salute, his back a little straighter and the embers in his heart a little brighter. Unnoticed by either, the grass at Gambader's feet stood a little straighter and grew a little taller than those around them. Soon Zalzea approached the group, her parents following behind. As her parents broke off to greet Yutu's parents, her mother wrapping her weeping oath sister in a deep hug, Zalzea walked toward Gambader. Neither spoke, but both could see the resolution burning in the other's eyes. They nodded, and as one, they turned and walked toward the group gathering around the Lord Protector. It was time to get going. From a distance, Elder Batu watched the departing pair with interest, stroking his long beard. Unnoticed by others, his eyes flashed with mysterious energy, and he stared at the spot where Ganbader had stood only a moment earlier. A small smile crept on his face, and he muttered to himself, Interesting, very interesting indeed. 18. Book 1, Lesson 39 Dealing with children takes a special touch. Alpha chuckled to himself as he watched the hundred or so tracking dots scatter around the village. A few of them were already gathering to discuss how best to use the presents he'd given them. It wasn't anything complicated or even malicious. But to the children who never known more than simple village life, it must have seemed like magic. Even if it was just a civilian standard Nainite HUD injection. Most Federation children got their first HUD within their first three years of sapience. And it would follow along with them throughout the rest of their life. Regularly updating and evolving to better suit their users' needs. Thankfully, the HUD seeds were pretty cheap to build. Most of the actual components would be built inside the body itself to better let the HUDs interface with each person's unique biology. Thus the cost, even for over a hundred of them, hadn't been too bad. The HUDs would let the children communicate better, track each other, and even send video and audio files. They could even be customized in certain ways that the children would discover as they grew older and their HUDs matured. And what use would a HUD be if they didn't have something to play with? The stripped-down, wasp, drone accompanying each child had most of its functionality removed. He didn't need the ethics board breathing down his circuits because he handed military-grade hardware to underage children, again. That being said, it could still do a lot, like recording and cloaking. He'd even left the injection function in a few of the older ones who'd shown interest in becoming a healer, though that would only unlock later when the onboard AI deemed it necessary. Stripping out many of the toys came with some added benefits, however. Without the need for a supporting skeleton, the modified wasps were cheaper to make and became nearly indestructible, as a drone, if struck, could simply break down into a nanite cloud and reform elsewhere. If the nanites were destroyed, the child's HUD could reconstruct the drone based on the stored blueprints, though it would take time to avoid harming the child. Like the HUD themselves, the children could even customize the drones to a minor extent as they grew more skilled. Of course, Alpha's gift wasn't just a kind gesture on his part. Each HUD contained a small backdoor he could use to monitor the children's activity. He'd see what they saw, and the onboard AIs would alert Alpha if they gathered any information that could be useful. Alpha had found that such outsourcing had been very effective in the past, so the question of its expense wasn't much of an issue, even if it might take a while for it to pay dividends. Then again, with how much trouble this particular group of accomplices seemed able to get into, maybe shorter than he suspected. Alpha was so proud of them. Time passed, as it was wont to do, and soon the humans were ready to leave. The turnout for the group's departure was greater than Alpha would have expected. Whether that was because the village was rather tight-knit, or some suspected there was more going on than the leadership, led on was hard to tell. Regardless, Alpha was eager to get moving. The TWP still wasn't in full working order, 
but the last few days of repairs had been enough to bring several important systems back online. The most critical being the top's internal Nanite factory. It was far from being as effective as a dedicated nest, but he no longer had to worry about burning through his supply so quickly. He'd contemplated hiding a proper nest in the village, but decided against it. His nest seeds were extremely limited, and he had to be selective about where he placed them. The mobile nature of the village meant even if they stumbled on a resource cache he could use, he wouldn't be able to make full use of it. As for surveillance and info gathering, the children would suffice for now. Thus, with much fanfare, Alpha departed the Slate Walker village, passengers in tow. The young pup struggled against the binding cloth for what had felt like hours, even long after she felt her shiny friend and tiny humans vanish into the distance. She never spotted the thing that took her. One moment she was keeping the tasty birds from getting at the tiny humans, and the next, she'd been trapped by something she didn't have a name for. She tried to call for help, but her shiny friend was busy, and the humans couldn't understand her. Well, not that her shiny friend could either. He never responded to her spirit words, after all. The young pup suspected he was a bit stupid if she was honest, but he was good at fighting, so she forgave him. Besides, she was his smart older sister. It was okay to be a little stupid. She could do the thinking for them both, though she worried a bit about her shiny friend. What would he do without her? The humans were smart, but they were weak, even if mother always said they were stronger than the others gave them credit for. Thinking about her mother made the young pup's heart hurt. Soon, the jostling stopped, and the pup was thrown to the floor with an oof. The strange bindings keeping her restrained unwounded themselves, and she burst free, her teeth barred and fur bristling. She snapped at a nearby figure, lunging at their squishy hand, only to find the hand hard as a rock. She yelped and leaped back, still on guard, as a familiar voice spoke flatly. I'm glad to see the young missus as energetic as always. The pup tilted her head and really looked at the figure. Hey, she knew him. That was Grumpy Mustache. He always got mad at her when she chewed on the pretty wall things. Why did he make them out of tasty stuff if they weren't supposed to be chewed on? But what was he doing here? Grumpy Mustache lived in the big temple. In fact, where was she at all? The pup turned around and took in her location. It was a giant, somewhat familiar room filled with shiny, colored furniture. She wasn't home. The pup knew that much. Mother never liked the colorful and bright fabrics, calling them gaudy, whatever that meant. It didn't smell right either. Instead of the familiar, comforting smell of her mother and gentle incense, this place almost overwhelmed her with a thick, flowery smell. It was sweet and spicy at the same time and made her a little sleepy if she stopped thinking for too long. She turned around in circles, taking it all in before the sight of a figure caught her eyes. There, lounging on a soft-looking cushion, was a woman. Mother? No, not mother. She looked like her mother, but she didn't smell like her mother or even feel like her. This woman also wore a robe of that same bright gaudy color. A cloudy memory surfaced from when the pup was young and less her of another woman standing beside her mother. The gaudy woman smiled gently at the pup and spoke, her voice calm and soothing, making the pup feel like she jumped into a warm bath. Oh, do you remember your Aunt Hera, little Athena? Why, the last time I saw you, you were this small. Come, come, let me get a better look at you. You must have had a terrible time. Come, rest, and tell me all about it. You're home now, you're safe. Athena yawned, the thick scent coating the room and Aunt Hera's soft voice making her feel safe and sleepy. She teetered over to the large woman and only realized how large she was when she picked the pup up and set her in the crook of her arm. Not large like the friendly sister that used to let Athena sleep on her soft belly, but big. Like someone had taken one of the tiny humans, and stretched them out in all directions. Even Athena's head was smaller than Aunt Hera's hand as they gently soothingly stroked her fur. She'd found that many adults liked to take human form, though Athena couldn't understand why. Humans were squishy, and they didn't have any claws or teeth. Sure, it made talking easier, but she still thought it was stupid. She'd never seen other adults take such an enormous form, though, and she didn't know why. Even Grumpy Mustache looked as small as she did when compared to other adults' beast forms. Those thoughts quickly left the pup's mind as Aunt Hera's soothing voice pushed out all the other worries. Oh, you poor child. The things you must have suffered. Why do you tell Auntie all about it? Tell me if there's anything I can do to help my cute little niece. Athena yawned once more and nodded. Yeah, that's right. The humans and her shiny friend had been worried about things. Maybe Aunt Hera could help them? So she told Aunt Hera her story. Athena had been excited when her mother told her she would spend the darkest night with Auntie Snake Lady. Andy was funny, 
and the pup had never been outside the grass before. Besides, the place they normally spent it was always so boring. Everyone was tense and worried, and no one ever wanted to play. She bet she could get Auntie Snake Lady to play. Then the big bird attacked. This wasn't her first trip or the first time the tasty birds thought they would be tasty instead. She always thought it was unfair that she didn't get to help, though. Athena could fight too, yet mother always said to leave the fighting to the adults, so the pup had stayed back like she'd been taught. But there had been so many this time, so many. When the nice guard uncle who'd always sneak her treats was buried under the tasty birds, the pup was worried, but not too much. The guard uncle was strong. He wouldn't be beaten that easily, right? Right. But he'd never come back up like she thought he would. When the guard uncle fell, her mother had told Sister Big Nose to take Athena and run. Sister Big Nose never liked it when she called her that. But it was. It was enormous. And shiny. She would always yell at the pup and tell her to call it a horn. But Athena thought big horns sounded stupid. Sister Big Nose grabbed up the pup and ran from the group, using her big nose to batter her way through the surrounding tasty birds. The last sight she had of her mother was the woman in her beast form and the last guard, fighting the big bird, surrounded by smaller tasty birds. Athena didn't know how long Sister Big Nose ran for. Her mother had tried to teach her tell time, but it never made much sense. She could no longer see her mother or even sense her. Eventually, Sister Big Nose had collapsed, lots of strange, shiny thorns poking out of her skin. The pup had tried to help, but the sister had yelled at her and told her to keep running. Of course, Athena wasn't having any of that. She'd stayed until the tasty birds caught up with them. There weren't as many as before, but more than enough to scare the pup. Sister Big Nose had tried to get her to flee, but Athena was no coward, even if she was scared. She'd pulled tasty bird after tasty bird off of the sister, but for everyone she did, two more arrived. What's worse, they started trying to bite at her too. How rude! The sister lost patience with her and erected a stone wall between them, stopping the pup from helping, no matter how much she yelled at the sister. Eventually, the tasty birds started popping up on the other side of the wall too, and she had no other choice but to run. After that, she'd collapsed, met her strong, shiny friend, and even rescued some humans from the bad tasty birds. And Hera nodded along with her story smiling the whole time, gently stroking her fur. Why do you tell me more about this shiny friend of yours? He sounds strong. Aunt Hera's melodic voice soothed the young pup further, and she nodded, eyes drooping ever so slightly. He was. He was the strongest. Even if he was a bit stupid. As Aunt Hera gently stoked her fur, Athena continued her story, telling her about her adventures with her shiny friend. She barely noticed when Grumpy Mustache left the room, closing the doors behind him. The last thing Athena saw before she gave into the soothing allure of sleep was her aunt staring down at her, a wide grin splitting her face from ear to ear, filled with pointy teeth. 18. Book 1, Lesson 40. Please clean up your mess. Careful. I said careful. Try not to jostle him too much. Zalzea stood in front of Alpha as Ganbader, the guard Jotun, who Alpha learned was the young woman's father, lowered the injured Yutu to the ground. They'd arrived at their waypoint after a few hours of travel with nothing of note happening in between. Well, not anything that hindered them, at least. The only thing Alpha found interesting was the change to the prairies themselves. He noted that as the days in the village passed, daylight hours had quickly shrunk. When he landed on the planet only a few weeks ago, a day had been roughly 12 hours, with 18 hours of night. How that math worked, given the apparent size of the planet and the required rotational speed for something like that, he didn't know. When they'd arrived at the village, days had shrunk into nearly eight hours, and by the time they left only a few days later, daylight only touched the prairies for a measly four hours a day. What this darkest night was, Alpha had yet to fully understand. He could surmise it was a recurring weather phenomenon of some kind, and it was related to the shrinking daylight, but not much more than that. For as much as people talked about it, they said very little in ways of detail most likely because it was such a well-known event that any native should already be highly familiar with it. All he knew was that it was extremely dangerous, and they had only a few days before it started, meaning time was short. The interesting part was how the surrounding grass changed. The vibrant mix of rainbow colors took a sudden shift, almost overnight, as larger patches shifted between dark purples, pale whites, and ethereal blues. When the group finally stopped, nearly 60% of the surrounding grass had taken on one of these hues. From what Alpha had gathered, that number would only grow as the darkest night drew closer. 
Alpha theorizes it must have been an adaptation by the grass to deal with whatever was coming, further supporting the possibility that this was a recurring event. As for why they had stopped, off in the distance, a towering obelisk stretched into the sky, several times larger than the one at the ruined temple. That such a tall structure couldn't be seen from further away had been strange to Alpha. As Kallik put it, the Earth's shrines were naturally obfuscated by the asterisk i dollar asterisk dollar at hashtag percent that they collected. This obfuscation only grew stronger during the darkest night, and only a grass reader like her could find them. That was one reason her profession was so highly respected in these prairies. It would still be a few hours walk for the humans from here, made slightly longer by their cargo. Said cargo was finally lowered to the group as the group loaded the young man into the simple gurney carried by Kalik and the armored young woman who'd introduced herself as Monk. The two men jumped down and turned to Alpha, bowing. Joatan was the one to speak. We thank the Lord Protector for his help in getting us this far. If we had attempted the journey ourselves, we might not have made it in time to be of any help ourselves. You remember the plan for here, correct? Alpha nodded. Of course he did. Hurrah for quantum state memory storage. Not that it was a complicated plan. The humans would make their way to the obelisk and contact the pup's family, or at least attempt to. While they did that, Alpha would head toward the signal, a roughly two-day trip. Once in position, he'd bunker down in a small outpost used by natives to contact the Akhlut and try to gather as much information as he could. It would have been slightly faster, but the group urged him to pace himself, both to buy time and because the prairies would become far more unstable in the coming days. Sure, Alpha could have charged in, guns blazing, but without knowing what the kidnappers had planned or even who they were, they would take a more, subtle approach. The hope was that whoever the pup's family sent could either help clarify the situation or snatch the child to safety while Alpha, dealt with the kidnappers. Juatan nodded. Good. With any luck, someone will meet you at the designated location shortly after you arrive. We wouldn't assume to tell you what to do, but if at all possible, please wait until they arrive both for our and the child's sake. Again, Alpha nodded in confirmation. Even he could understand this was a delicate problem. Hostage situations always were. That said, if he deemed it necessary, Alpha wouldn't hesitate to do what he needed, regardless of the political ramifications. After all, as the newest Federation civilians, whether they knew it or not, their old laws had no power over him. At least that was the excuse he would give Cydia when she yelled at him for it. As the group gathered, they turned to Alpha and... As one bowed, no other words were spoken between the two groups, and each turned their separate ways and departed. Only time would tell if this gamble of theirs would work, or if it would only result in more tragedy. Zalzea watched the Lord Protector with mixed feelings as he disappeared into the distance. Her gift told her that his worry for the child was genuine, but she also knew he was still using them. How and why, she didn't know, but she knew the mysterious spirit beast wasn't the benevolent, progenitor the others saw him as. She'd only been able to voice her concerns to her father, possibly the only one who could feel what she did, even if his gift was far weaker than hers. Yet he had told her not to think too deeply on the matter, that sometimes you had to take the bad with the good and that people, spirit beast or human, would never be as one-sided as good or evil. Even those who worked against you might do so for noble ends, and things were never as simple as they appeared on the surface. Zalzea wouldn't go so far as to disagree, but her own experiences had taught her that sometimes people were just that simple. She'd found most people wore their thoughts, or at least their emotions, on their sleeves, even if they were skilled enough to physically not show it. Few were skilled enough to not let their emotions leak to the surface entirely, her father being one of the few she'd ever met besides the captain and the nice old couple who used to teach you to. The Lord Protector, though, was different, even compared to them. Not that his emotions were hidden. He was surprisingly emotional for a spirit beast, who were typically more beastly. No, the Lord Protector's emotions felt distant, for lack of a better term, separate, as if his emotions emanated from his soul itself, and not his body. The only other time she'd felt anything similar had been from the elementals that guarded the earth's shrines. They were lesser elementals, true, meaning they weren't truly alive, in the same way as other life forms, but she couldn't help but make the comparison. What was the Lord Protector, really? And more importantly, what did he want? Seven hours later, the group made it through the Earth's Shrine checkpoint with little issue, in large thanks to the documentation provided by the elders of the Slate Walker village. It wasn't uncommon for villages to send envoys ahead to prepare things for the approaching village, 
though most of that would be handled by Jotun. The Earth Shrine wasn't too different from any of the others, or so Zalzea had been told. Few in the wandering cities made a habit of visiting other Earth Shrines if they had to. The actual shrine was simple, comprising little more than a few squat buildings and the gargantuan 400-meter stone obelisk. The cart buildings of Jade Walker City, two million strong, circled the obelisk with an empty ring of roughly 100 meters separating them. A 100-meter ring patrolled by hundreds of lesser earth elementals and several dozen intermediate earth elementals. Each of the lessers was the equivalent to a gold spirit, ranked cultivator, while the intermediates were rumored to be as strong as an early, shackle-breaking cultivator. If they ever chose to do anything more than continue their eternal patrol, not even the full force of the Jade Walker clan could do a single thing to stop such creatures. Thankfully, unless attacked, they never left this small strip of land or even paid much attention to anything beyond it. Only the priests of the Prima Temple were allowed to approach the shrine proper, not that there was much of a reason to do so outside of ceremony. Most of the priests instead lived on the large temple cart that was technically part of Jade Walker City, but officially answered only to the Akhlat, the same temple cart that happened to be their destination. At two million carts and three times that in human bodies, not to mention various domesticated spirit beasts. It sufficed to say that Jade Walker City was nothing like the much smaller village she called home. The Grand Elk that pulled the various carts were especially intimidating if one didn't know the creatures were gentle and timid by nature. Unlike the young spirit beasts that pulled the carts of villages and towns, these, City Elk, were ancient, some older than the city itself. It was a tradition for existing cities to donate an elder elk to a new city as a sign of union. The oldest and largest, which towered over the surrounding buildings, were said to be in the low, golden spirit, step and could tow entire districts themselves. That was hundreds of buildings, some of them just as large as they were. When it came to sheer physical strength, very few creatures could match an elder grand elk in its realm. Unfortunately, that strength came at the cost of very poor spirit control. Elder elk rarely broke past, brown spirit, in the wild, as even lower level predators could kill them easily if they took advantage of the elk's poor ranged ability and slower speed. Not that it was easy or safe, but only here, under the care of the wandering cities, would you ever see the creature grow to such sizes. The sights and sounds of the big city were often things people could never forget, especially people like her who hailed from smaller places like her. They were places to aspire to, ones filled with excitement and awe. For others, for Zalzea, things were different. So many people and spirit beasts, packed so closely together, each with their emotions and desires, just added another layer of noise on top of the already chaotic and loud city. It could be overwhelming for her, sometimes even painful. Zalzea grimaced and rubbed her temple as they moved through the streets, which were little more than the meticulously planned gaps between various carts. This was a major reason she never enjoyed visiting Jade Walker City, even if most of the young adults her age took every chance they could. She much preferred the peace of her own village. A large hand on her shoulder caused the young woman to turn and look into her father's face. The man frowned and furrowed his brow as he stared at his daughter. Despite that, the waves of love and concern washing off him went a long way in pushing out the painful ambient emotions. She smiled and was going to thank him, but she froze instead. Salzea narrowed her eyes and snapped around, scanning the crowd. She'd felt something. Something familiar. Something she'd hoped never to feel ever again. In the direction the feeling was coming from, she could see a quiet commotion rippling through the crowd and watched it slowly part making room for the approaching party. All other things faded away from Zalzea's perception until all that was left was the quickly approaching emotional signal and her own rage. A raw, boiling, seething, primal rage. Yu Xiorong knelt down and plucked the strange shard from the stone. The razor-sharp shard had embedded itself deep into the hardened rock, but Yu Xiorong's expert control prevented it from shattering like the others. They were fragile things, and without the small coating of concept holding them together, they would quickly break apart and dissolve into pure air. When she and her group of disciples arrived at the abandoned temple, the destruction and ruin reminded her of the battlefield, because that's exactly what it had been. They tracked the signal from the star thief to this location only a few hours earlier, expecting to find more of the same. Maybe a campsite with more clues about who or what they were tracking. Instead, they'd walked onto the remains of a battlefield. Not just any battlefield, either. She couldn't identify the concepts used but the aura of the massive groove radiating out from the central compound terrified her. 
Fang Ping had gone to examine the massive crater even further away while the rest of them searched what remained of the central compound. That had turned out to be, not very much. The entire structure had been demolished, with little remaining in evidence. What was there told a story, however. Many grassbreaker remains, in various states of pulping, had been found scattered around. The most intact bodies were found inside the compound itself, while the largest concentration of remains, they couldn't rightly be called bodies anymore, was found on the same side of the compound as the groove. The pattern of the debris suggested that whatever had destroyed the compound originated from the inside, likely the same thing that had caused the groove. Strangely enough, however, they saw no signs of an explosion or elemental force. Lin Weiyuan theorized it may have been a purely physical shockwave that had caused the damage, but how it had formed left them stumped. The compound itself showed signs of excavation as if whoever had remained had tried to clear the rubble. It was unknown if they'd found what they sought, but it was an interesting theory. What had caught Yu Xiorong's attention the most, though, had been these tiny, shards, they'd found scattered around the compound. She had no clue what to make of them. All of her physical senses told her she was holding a thin sliver of ice. Yet, it was hot to the touch. Not just hot but burning, even to her scale-covered hand. Stranger still, when she observed the shard with her, spirit sense, she didn't find an ounce of fire energy in it at all. Instead, she felt an intense amount of air energy crammed into it, along with a concept she could only describe as an immense weight, as if its singular reason for existing was to press down on the world. This concept tightly bound air energy into the shard, reducing what should have been a free-spirited, shackleless energy to a small, rigid form. What was it they were really dealing with here? 22. Patreon QA. 1. Dragon 98765 on Patreon asked. Question will we see more anatity in the future? I think Alpha would also like to know that. A. Alpha is quite the quack. Who knows what kind of horrors will waddle its way into our hearts and brains. 2. Thomas Day on Patreon asked. Question will Alpha ever start personally cultivating or will it be more like his crystal rails where he just takes advantage of the environment to keep pace? A. When your instruction guide is faulty, always have a plan B. 3. Mr. Acerols on Patreon asked. Question whatever happened to the lunar gods trying to break into Alpha's safe? A. They're still trying. We'll take peeks back there every so often, but it's not a major plot point again until after Alpha gets back off world. 4. Signal on Patreon asked. Question will you have a chapter dedicated to explaining some of the extraterrestrial energies and physics? A yup, though I'm trying to stay away from major info dumps like that last novel. Tomorrow's chapter, for you free readers, this is referring to chapter 46, which is mostly a discussion between characters about a small part of the cultivation system, is more how I want to do things this time, i.e. more natural discussions or discoveries over longer periods of time where the readers are pieces things together along with the characters. The description translate at the start of the novel is about as infodumpy as it'll get, and honestly, I might even change that up for the published version. Maybe turn it into a bonus chapter introduction video snippet. 5. Snack on Patreon asked, Question that's been burning in me since the start of their misadventures. But I can't help but ask, even if I might not get an answer slash can't be answered. Our friendly neighborhood cargo drone is on the wayward path towards becoming a sapient AI aren't they? I can only imagine alpha reaction should that be the case, doubly so if they aren't cooperative and instead side with the locals somehow, some way. Besides that cheers on the novel so far. Been enjoying the read and ride, can't wait to see where things go, and the face of space chicken should alpha and them ever cross paths again. A. Grim is an odd case that doesn't quite fit into the standard model. She's definitely not not sapient, but she's not quite there yet either, as of the last Grim adventures. As for how and why, I'll leave that to your speculations for now XD. 17. Book 1. Grim Adventures 3. Jack! To your left, Jill screamed, even as she blocked the razor-sharp liquid cloth, with an armored forearm. The blood-red liquid blade bounced off her gauntlets, and gave her just the opening she needed. Jill took a step and swung her free fist up and into the wolf-like creature's lower jaw. A sharp ice spike formed on her gauntlet, and plunged deep into the beast's skull like a knife through butter. The wolf-life creature gave a startled yelp and fell to the ground, unmoving. Jill jumped back several feet, her armored fists raised, unwilling to let her guard down. They'd already fallen for this trap once. She'd not fall for it a second time. As soon as she was clear, the ground underneath the beast collapsed into a sinkhole. The creature yelped again, still very much alive, and tried to escape. But before it could even stand, the ground slammed shut around it with surprising force. 
Slowly, dark red blood seeped to the surface through the loose soil. A small rude gopher popped its head out of the soil nearby and shook itself clean. Jill lowered her fist and sighed before turning to observe the rest of the battlefield. Not that there was much left to see. The wolves that had targeted her during the ambush were long since dead, with only her brother struggling against the life-draining creatures. Even then, two had been impaled on wooden spears, then trapped in living wood when said spears sprouted and engulfed them. A third still struggled against the thorny, blood-drinking vines that pinned it to the ground. However, its life-draining power couldn't keep up with the carefully cultivated spirit plant, and it was slowly weakening. The one she had just killed had tried to ambush him after it found it couldn't do anything to their flying metal friend. That strange creature had simply picked them up one by one and dropped them from a staggering height. Jill walked toward her brother, who was panting on the ground. She stood over him, peering down with a frown. Jack looked up at her and smiled, holding out a hand. Jill reached down and smacked him in the head with a gauntlet hand. When I tell you don't approach the mysterious hooded figure surrounded by bodies and bones, you need to listen to me, Jill scolded her older brother. The man in question rolled on the ground a few times, clutching his head. Jack looked up at his younger twin sister and frowned, rubbing his head as he spoke. Hey, it's not my fault. What the hell were those things anyway? Jill rubbed the bridge of her nose before answering. Blood-cloaked Lycos. You should know this, Jack. Jack's eyes went wide, and he jumped to his feet. Wait, really? We're rich. With this man, the bounty has to be huge. Jill sighed and shook her head. No, stupid. The Ashdales only pay for Lycos found inside their territory. Wolves don't tolerate other packs on their land. Jack's face fell in response. Oh, well, that sucks. At least we should get a decent price for their material. I've never seen a creature with such a strong life affinity yet appear so vicious. The young man poked at the body of the nearby creature. The spirit beast had succumbed to the thorny vine's grasp. Its job done, the vine retreated underground, then slithered up Jack's leg, rustling the man's robes. When it settled, Jack petted his forearm like he stroked a cat before kicking the body over. Jill stared down and frowned. Even drained and shriveled as it was, the odd body plan on the creature was strange to look at, almost unsettling. At a glance, one could tell it was a creature that preferred to move and run on all fours. Yet the prehensile digits of its front, hands, and the longer, more powerful back leg made it known the creature could just as easily walk bipedally and grab at its prey. However, the odd cloak, each war when alive was what truly set them apart. From a distance, it appeared to be nothing more than a thick, blood-red hooded cloak made of some fine thread. But once prey approached, its true nature was relieved to be a grisly organ formed from blood vessels extending from the nape of their necks, dripping with fresh blood. The creatures had perfect control over this organ, and could use it as a weapon or armor as they pleased. Once they died, these cloaks collapsed into a tangled mess of blood and gore. Jack furrowed his brow and asked his sister, Are you sure these things aren't, you know, people? It was one thing to harvest materials and core from non-sapient spirit beasts but most civilized places abhorred or outright banned the sale of sapient body parts. Not that it didn't happen, of course, especially to those awakened beasts with more bestial forms. Even humans and other humanoid species couldn't escape this. High-level cultivator bones had many applications, while their blood could be used in pill refining, and their skin could be used for various scrolls and arrays. Jack stared at the body, unsure. I don't want to be stuck explaining myself to the guards why we're bringing in contraband. Halarosa might not be as strict or heavy-handed as the United Awakened clans regarding sapient materials, but the fines would undo everything we've collected so far, or worse, chased out. I don't want to be labeled an outcast. Jill shook her head and began skinning the body. No worries there. Bloodcloaked Lycos are highly intelligent, but they're not sapient. Otherwise, the Ashdales would have tried to extend diplomatic solutions to their constant intrusion into the Halarosa Valley, not set bounties for them. Jack narrowed his eyes, not fully convinced. But what about the crying? The trap? Hell, that one was wearing armor and a weapon. Jack pointed to the splattered remains of the largest Lycos. It had been the first of their metal friend's experiments in terminal velocity. Said friend now lay on the ground, endlessly chatting about something in that strange language as a plump root gopher patted her. Head, Jill didn't bother to look up from her work as she answered. Stolen from past victims, no doubt. I did say they're highly intelligent. Think of them to the Ashdale and other awakened Lycus, what goblins are to the orcs. Smart, resourceful, and adaptable, but not truly aware in the same way we are. 
If the Ashdale mythos is correct, then the Bloodcloaks are spirit beasts who were once on the verge of true sapience but lost that race to the Ashdale's progenitor. The creatures they regressed to have had their potential totally cut off. Jack shook his head and shrugged, moving to begin work on one of the other Bloodcloaks. As he worked, he asked his sister, How do you know so much about them anyway? Bloodcloak Lycos rarely come near Halarosa anymore, and the bounty is so high when they do, they're wiped out almost instantly. Jill paused, but soon returned to work before speaking. The bounty is exactly why. If we could have collected even just a few heads during an incursion then, then maybe they could have paid off that bastard Coldfinger, and none of this would have been a problem. Of course, he'd have never allowed that. While Coldfinger was retired, as an adventurer himself, he still sponsored several powerful teams. They were often among the first on the scene at the very hint of a bounty, both to reap the rewards and prevent any competitors from doing so themselves. Rye up! Jill stared down at the small hole in the hide she'd inadvertently caused. Jack looked over at his sister but said nothing. They still had a lot of work to do. It only took a few hours to dismantle all the bodies. Bloodcloaked Lycos might have been higher rank spirit beasts but they hadn't much value overall. Mostly the blood there. Cloak. And the hides, all of which contained powerful life affinity. They'd discussed collecting some of the meat to stock their supplies, but decided against it. There was something off-putting about eating something so close to sapience. Besides, their people were primarily vegetarians, even if Joel enjoyed a good roast when she had the chance. Once they were finished, the gathered materials were stored in their metal friend's shell. Jill was still somewhat skeptical of the new companions who joined them on their trip, but the metal one at least seemed oddly attached to Jack. While it was obviously sapient, Jill had never seen an awakened quite like it before, nor did she recognize the language it spoke, where it had come from, or why it seemed insistence on following them, she didn't know. Yet, it had quickly shown its worth. Jack and Jill's own special storage items were small and already filled to the brim with the necessary supplies for a long journey. They expected to spend months, maybe years, in these mountains, searching for clues to the pure water spring. So the seemingly endless space within the creature's shell had allowed them to collect material and treasures they would have either had to pass on otherwise or sacrifice supplies. 4. Even when the creature inevitably demanded its own cut, the haul from this trip alone would pit a massive dent into the siblings' debts, regardless of whether or not they actually found the spring. As for their other companion, Jill still wasn't sure what to make of that one either. All of her scenes and knowledge told her it should be just a typical root gopher, but reality had a funny habit of proving her wrong. The first obvious difference was the creature's intelligence. Root gophers were nothing more than big gophers. They were not stupid animals but still very much animals at heart. This creature almost acted sapient at times and had proven to be devious, cunning, and deceptively powerful. During the fight with the bloodcloak Lycos, she thought the creature had escaped underground to hide but she'd been wrong. Instead, it harassed the wolf creatures by digging small pits and holes to trip the creatures off and throw off their rhythm and coordination. More than once, Alikos had tried to attack her from a blind spot, only to suddenly find the ground under its feet collapsing, causing it to trip. The root gopher's final move against the Lycos that had jumped Jack had been a display of earth manipulation far exceeding anything of its species should have been capable of. Of course, she had her theories as well the most likely being the scene playing out in front of her. As she watched, the root gopher stuffed the rest of the Lycos materials into the metal creature's shell like a squirrel hoarding nuts. When that was done, it reached in and pulled out a large orange root that glowed with spirit energy in her sight. She'd recognized the root as when the gopher had dug up a few days ago. As if sensing her stare, the gopher turned and looked at her. It then bit into the root, never breaking eye contact, as if daring her to stop it. Jill sighed and shook her head. Whatever the truth, be it some kind of unusual partnership, symbiosis, or something deeper, she had no way of knowing. Once everyone was finished, the group gathered back together and turned down the mountain path. They still had a lot of ground to cover before night fell. Yet, as they did, an elderly, feminine voice called out to them, echoing off the rocky walls. Ho! Travelers! Are you doing well? Jill tensed, unsure of what or who had spoken. Jack did as well his robes billowing as something writhed underneath. The sound of something clicking on stone slowly approached, then from around a bend in the path appeared an old woman? An old human woman, her face wrinkled and suntanned, walked down the path toward them. Her slight frame was hunched over, bent by the weight of the herb-filled wicker basket on her back, her gait supported only by the gnarled staff she carried. Click, click, 
Click. Almost hypnotically, the staff tapped against the stone path as she approached, and before Jill could process what was happening, the old woman stood before them, smiling up at her with a crooked grin. Her voice was wizened and dry, but soft and comforting when she spoke, reminding Jill of her grandmother. That was quite impressive, dearie. I have to thank you for dealing with those mutts. They've been such trouble lately. Why, I've barely gotten any visitors because of them. If I was 100 years younger, I'd have taken care of them myself. But, the old woman paused and gestured to herself with her free hand before continuing. Such is the way of the world, I suppose. Jill stared down at the old woman, her brow slightly furrowed. I, you're welcome, I guess. The young woman tilted her head. The old woman, on the other hand, simply chuckled, her laugh sounding like both the cackling of a crow and the chime of a bell at the same time. Yes, yes. Don't mind me, young lady. Just an old woman reminiscing about a time long past. Now come, come. My home is just down this path. You lot have done me a great service. At least let me treat you to tea. Let it never be said I let any good deed go unpunished. Ha ha ha. Again, the old woman cackled, turned, and began walking the way she'd come. Jill turned to look at Jack, but the young man simply smiled and followed the old woman. Jill sighed, followed shortly after. They weren't ones to turn down a free meal. As the two walked after their new host, Mr. Gopher and Grimm stared. They turned and shared a long look before Mr. Gopher shrugged and dipped into the ground. Grimm turned around and quickly flew to catch up with the group. 15. Book 1. Lesson 41. Make plans for the future. Oh? What's this I see? When my people told me a group of slate walkers had arrived, I'll admit, I wasn't expecting so many familiar faces. Just the sound of the voice emanating from the crowd nearly drove Salzea into a bloodlust-fueled rampage. When the crowd finally parted, revealing the arrogant sneer of East Sion Monkhan, only the tight grip of her father's hand on her shoulder prevented her from pouncing on the sod. Through gritted teeth and a smile that would have made children cry, Salzea was the first to speak. Monkhan, I'm surprised you had the gall. I warned you if you ever showed yourself to me again I'd. One of the young man's cronies a flat-faced man who Zalzea had never bothered learning the name of, cut her off. That's con to you, you ungrateful bumpkin, you should. Though he was, in turn, cut off by Monkhan's raised hand. The sneer dropped from his face, and he frowned over his nose at her as he spoke. Now, no need for that. We can't expect a half-breed like her to show any respect. The man turned and looked at her father, the sneer returning. I see your father survived his punishment. A shame. Then again, what else can you say about a, Barbarian if not that they're resistant. Salzea pointed, her eyes bloodshot, but Jotun's voice cut off whatever she was about to say. Alive and well, young master. While it might be nice to catch up, I'm afraid we have business at the temple. So if you'll excuse us, we'll be on our way. Monkhan grinned, leaning over slightly to peer behind the group where you two was being carried. Oh? What's this now? Zaya, my dear, did your mouth almost kill someone again? You really should work on that. It's becoming a bad habit at this point. I've heard of a venomous tongue, but this is getting too literal. Zalzea lunged, her hands clawing for the man's eyes, even as he stepped back in surprise. She only took a single step before Jodan's firm hand rooted her into place. A pompous young woman standing beside the scion laughed, her face hidden behind a fan. Dear, you were right. She does look just like a wildcat. I know you like them, feisty, but I'm surprised. The comment garnered a laugh from the man's gathered posse. Jotun frowned, the threat in his next words clear as day. I'm afraid that's confidential. We'll be on our way now. Monkhan frowned and raised his hand again. Several large armed men walked out from the crowd who'd gathered to watch the scene. Instantly, the air changed, and most of the civilians scattered as the young scion spoke. Now don't be like that. I'm sure whatever it is can wait a while. It's been so long since we've had a chance to chat. The Slate Walker group tensed the guardians moving to surround the others, their hands on their weapons. The standstill lasted for a silent moment before a voice spoke up. Who would have thought the East Scion was such a rascal? I'm sure the West Scion will love to hear you're playing so rough on her territory. Her father and I go way back, you know. Kalik stepped from the group, arms folded, her new prosthetics on full display. At the sight of the grass reader garb she wore, many of the remaining crowd bowed in respect. Monkhan only frowned and furrowed his brow. His face flashed between pale and red before finally settling into his default sneer. You think I'm afraid of that pathetic woman who dares call herself a scion, let alone some crippled grass reader from a backwater village? This is my city, and I'll not be made AF. Kalik's presence descended on the crowd like a heavy tide. 
The average civilian of Jay Walker City was at a higher level than a backwater, village like Slate Walker, but even then, most never made it to Iron Body. Even the Scion's entourage, most of whom were in the early to mid Bronze Spirit step, could feel the suppression from the peak, Silver Spirit. At almost the same time, the Seven Radiance Spirit grass in their immediate surroundings shifted from various shades of purple and white to a near solid crimson red. One of the men surrounding them took one look at the grass and turned bolting into the crowd. Another dropped his weapon and raised his hands into the air. The man in question turned and spoke to Monkhan in a rough voice, fitting his thuggish appearance. Yes, screw that. I'm sorry, my lord, but you paid for an E-rank assignment. No one said anything about Bloody Grass Calic. We were supposed to rough up some yokels, not fight a C-ranker. Several other men exchanged looks, with a few dropping their weapons or backing into the crowd. Monkhan's face flushed red, and he pointed at the man and yelled. I don't care who she is, you'll do as you're told, you blubbering adv, O-U-C-H, what the hell was that? The scion slapped his hip just as what could have been a large wasp flew away. He stared at the escaping insect and screamed, his eyes going bloodshot as a vein throbbed in his head. He turned and yelled, fine, you're all cowards, I'll do it myself. Monkhen drew the small club at his side and stepped forward, sending out his own, silver spirit, presence to meet Calix. However, before he had taken more than a few steps, Monkhan stopped. The man's face twisted in confusion before twisting into something far more urgent. Monkhan fell to his knees, clutching his stomach. His friends rushed to his side, but even over the man's moaning, Zalzea could hear the gurgling and more unpleasant sounds coming from him. The young woman who'd laughed at her was one of the first next to him. She patted and rubbed his lower back while crying out, My lord! My lord! What is the matter? What happened? Do I need? She paused, both her patting and her words. Her eyes went wide, and her already pale face went white as snow. Slowly, she raised her shaking, pristine hand, only to find it covered in something, foul. The following scream was loud enough to physically hurt, and Zalzea was certain she'd seen a nearby window crack. That's when the smell hit her. Zalzea scrunched her face and pinched her nose, taking a step back. A move mirrored by many of those watching. The area soon erupted into chaos as several guardians rushed into the gathering, either warned something was happening or drawn by the commotion. The Slade Walkers took that moment to make their escape, slipping into the crowd and continuing on to the temple. As they did so, Zalzea didn't miss the sight of a large wasp crawling its way back into the folds of Yuta's carrier. She narrowed her eyes out of sight but didn't know whether she should frown or smirk. Alpha laughed to himself as he slid across the prairies. That had been much easier than the old man. That said, he might have overtweaked it a bit, with just that one data point to go on. It wasn't like they'd find anything that would get the humans in trouble. After all, there wasn't anything to find. The solution pompous rich boy had been 99.99999% saline. How did Alpha know he was a rich boy? He could smell that type from miles away. Now literally, as for the remaining 0.00001%, all it took was a single nanite latched onto the vagus nerve to ruin someone's day. It was a technique practiced throughout the Federation, both as an annoying prank and a way to control inmates in prison camps. After all, the same nanite used to cause, accidents could just as easily be used to cause intense pain or stop a heart, or equivalent organ. Yeah, Alpha was super glad he didn't have to deal with any of that biological nonsense. It sounded gross. Civilian implants and monitoring devices prevented these more sinister uses, but those protections were disabled for prisoners. Inmates tended to be far more cooperative when they weren't sure which infraction would cause them to void in their pants for the guards' amusement, or bring them to their knees, in agony. Some complained about the ethicality of the practice, but the results couldn't be argued with. His fun for the day over, Alpha returned the wasp to passive observations and turned his attention back to the road, or lack thereof. Not that there was much of anything, honestly. Just a bunch of grass, and grass, a really big rock over there, and more grass. This was always Alpha's least favorite part of any mission. The traveling. At the very least, it gave him time to think, something he got little time to do recently. That said a lot, considering he could process things far quicker than most biologicals. The bloody whales didn't count. He was pretty sure what they did was biotech, anyway. But that was beside the point. Reflection time. Ever since landing on this strange planet, Alpha felt like he'd just been dragged along through one event after another. What happened to this being his story? It was becoming frustrating. All this sneaking and playing along wasn't Alpha's modus operandi. 
he much more preferred when he got to blow stuff up. But Alpha knew that sometimes, a more delicate touch was needed. Sure, he could have charged into the cart city and told them he was in charge, and they'd be doing things his way. But what would that get him? Just a bunch of dead bodies and a seething resentment from the civilian population. A population who would go on to, and had before, make his job far harder than it should be. There was a reason he primarily targeted military and strategic locations, while damaging civilian infrastructure was highly discouraged. Not like he had a miles-long dreadnought sitting in orbit, ready to crush any resistance that popped its head up. On that same subject, he'd be foolish to forget the events before even landing on the planet. Despite everything he'd seen since landing, this world couldn't be as primitive as it seemed at first glance. Someone on the planet, at least, could break through the icy layer surrounding them and establish space-faring operations. That chicken alone had almost been too much for him, even if his equipment and resources had been extremely limited. That meant if he stirred up too much trouble, Alpha could find himself in a fight he wasn't ready for yet. Oh, there'd definitely be trouble, but Alpha just had to make sure the powers that be just saw it as. Same as usual, instead of something to pay attention to. For a time, Alpha had considered if this force had originated from one of the other planets, maybe even the larger one in the night sky. It was possible, it admitted, but even in such a case, simply having a base on the smaller moon meant that this force had some kind of vested interest in this. No, better to lie low for now until he'd established himself. Once he'd got a proper base going and maybe researched the weird magic bullcrap that was going on here, he'd be in a better position to reevaluate going full murderobo. That started with building a rapport with the locals and building some kind of cover. Saving the child would go a long way toward that goal, especially if the child's family had as much pull in this place as the humans had made it out to sound. Grinning to himself, Alpha continued on his way, drawing up all sorts of plans for the future. Good thing he had plenty of time to do so. 20. Book 1. Lesson 42. Learn the players. Lemme, lemme tell you something. The captain? The captain sh the worst of the hiccup lot. John, run this here. John, I've got another pack. Oof, package for ya. Where? Other shirt of the hiccup town. John, take my fifty, fifty, fifty stone sword to the blacksmith, would ya? I'm a runner, dang it. Not a hiccup. Recruit you can make do your hiccup errands. Then there sh that old man. Don't get me, blue ye, started on. Yu Shirong held out a hand, stepped back from the foul liquid, and pinched her nose. She didn't know if the smell was the cheap booze the man was drinking like water or the man himself, and she didn't want to know. Once she was far enough away, she spoke. I thank you for the warnings, good sir, but I shall go now. The man took another swig, swaying on his feet and waving. Good hiccup luck, pretty lady, with whatever it was you were hiccup doing again. Yu Shiorong turned an eye twitching and walked away. As she did, the strange drunkard called after her. And remember, be wary of the wasps. They're watching. Always watching. Yu Xiorong sighed and shook her head, and walked on. The group had tracked the star thief from the abandoned ruins across the prairies and eventually stumbled across a small scar, the term used by the Radiant Sea natives for the paths left in the wake of their roaming cities. Scars would gradually heal over a few weeks, so travelers often used them to locate nearby settlements. Judging by the age and size of this scar, the Yu Xiorong and the disciples estimated its origin to be no larger than a medium-sized village and only a few days away at that. The worrying part had been discovering the star thief's signature turning in the same direction. The group had rushed after, praying they made it in time or at least found a few survivors. Instead of the scene of death and devastation they'd expected, however, the group had found a quiet village making their way toward the nearby earth shrine. It was well into the village's rest cycle when they arrived, with only the local guardians and a few civilians wandering between carts. In any other circumstance, the proper procedure would have been simply to walk into town, announce their presence and purpose, then ask questions of anyone willing. Given the strangeness of the situation, Yu Xiorong chose to take a more subtle approach. They still knew too little about the Star Thief or their motivations. If the Star Thief was hiding out in the village, showing their hand too soon might have dire consequences, especially for the peaceful villagers. The group then split up, with orders to examine and explore the village as stealthily as possible. A simple task, given that even the strongest guardian in the village, a mid-step, gold spirit, was still far below the disciples' peak step, shackle-breaking. That had been a few hours ago, and Yu Xiorong found herself, frustrated. What little the public seemed to know, 
or at least were openly speaking of, seemed to be mixed and twisted by rumors and gossip to where little of it made sense. Hopefully, the others would have more pieces of the puzzle. Soon, the four gathered back together near the edge of the village to share what they'd learned. Qi Mingxi, Fan Peng, Lin Weiyuan, and Yu Xiorong stepped from the shadows of the village, one by one, silent and unseen, their very presence hidden under several layers. Yu Xiorong was the first to speak. Report. What have you found? The young Qi Mingxi's voice was soft as a shadow as she answered. The details are sparse, but there seems to have been some kind of accident recently. No one has openly spoken of it, but more than a few homes are observing morning rites. Strangely, the actual atmosphere is mixed. Some are openly criticizing the leading council of elders, while others appear to see the incident as more of a force of nature than anything preventable. Yu Xiorong raised a brow. And no sign as to what happened? Qi Mingxi shook her head. No. None would openly speak of it, and any who tried were silenced before they could get more than a few words out. I observed many hand signs and other superstitious behavior often attributed to warding off bad luck, so I suspect that may have played a part in it. Fan Ping nodded and folded her arms, being the next to speak. That would explain some things on my end. I hit up the local tavern. Yu Xiorong narrowed her eyes at the younger woman, who raised her hands in defense. Cloaked, of course. I came across a group of younger adults. They didn't look much younger than us, so I assumed they were the newest apprentices to pass their tests. There wasn't the festive air you'd have expected of a group like that, though. They were drinking and passing stories between each other, mostly about this person or that, none of whom appeared to be present. It reminded me of the old folks who'd gather and talk about their war days, but that seemed odd. My knowledge isn't great, but I was under the impression the wandering city's apprentice tests were more of a formality than anything dangerous. Lin Weiyuan nodded as well and picked up from there. They are. The Radiant Prairies aren't the only place to have such apprentice tests, but because of the unusual ecosystem and higher level of danger present in this place, apprentices only graduate at a much older age and are far more skilled than in other parts of the world. Not only that, but the proctors for such tests often double as guards and safety nets. Ironically, this means that the rate of death, or even injuries during such tests, is far lower than in comparable groups. Yu Xiorong frowned. You think something happened to the apprentices? Yu Xiorong's mind flashed to the destroyed villages. If a group of fresh apprentices had been caught in something of that level. Lin Weiyuan shook his head as he answered. Some? Not all of them, obviously. But given what we've gathered, it's likely. Yu Xiorong raised a brow and asked, her fists clenching. Do you think our star thief had anything to do with it? Lin Weiyuan opened his mouth to respond, but paused, tilting his head. I'm unsure. I encountered a group of children who were discussing a lord protector of some sort. They mentioned little, but I snagged this from one of their clubhouses, he said. Clubhouse. But the small shack built into the back of one store had been surprisingly well guarded. Not only did the children rig the area with various traps and some simple arrays, but the children had even worked out guard rotations and regular inspections. Nothing he couldn't slip by, but even the inside had been neatly organized, with dozens of charts and graphs detailing various plans. Everything from simply pranks to more ominous things. He didn't know what Project Swarm was intended to be, but some of the summary details made him question if this really was a clubhouse or the hidden base of an underground criminal organization. He'd even questioned if he should blow his cover and report what he'd seen to the village. But while there, he'd witnessed the guardian sneak in through a hidden latch and make a record in an obviously well-worn notebook. It seemed the adults in the village were well aware of the children's hobbies already. No need to poke his nose in their business then. Lin Weiyuan reached into his sleeve and pulled out a sheet of paper. On it was a copy of a drawing he'd seen plastered on the clubhouse wall. A drawing of a large, four-legged beetle-like creature. Yu Xiorong stared at the drawing, frowning as she spoke. Strange, I'm not familiar with this creature. Are any of you? She passed the drawing around, though each shook their head. Turning back to Lin Weiyuan, Yu Xiorong asked, Any idea what this might be? Could it be some form of guardian beast? I've heard of some towns in the wandering cities making such contracts, but I was under the impression those were much larger than this village. After all, proper care of a guardian beast worth anything was a major investment. Lin Weiyuan shrugged and responded. Possible, but given the size of the village and what we've learned so far, I think there's another possibility. Fang Peng raised her brow, finishing the thought. You think it could have been the Star Thief's beast companion? Are we even certain there is one? Lin Weiyuan nodded. All the evidence points to such. 
It would also fit the narrative we've gathered here well. Chi Ming Shi frowned as she asked. But why would the Star Thief's beast companion be welcomed in the village? Or be labeled as Lord Protector? More importantly, where is the Star Thief themselves? I've heard no mention of someone like that at all. Lin Wei Yuan shrugged again. I don't know. It's just a theory based on what we know so far. Maybe they got separated by whatever happened in the ruins. Or maybe the Star Thief became injured to where they couldn't openly show themselves and had to use their companion as a cover. We still know Tuli. An old, gravelly voice cut off the young man mid-sentence. So you want to know about that bastard, do you? I think I could help you out there. The group jumped at the sound of the voice and turned their guard instantly up. On the covered porch of a nearby homely-looking shack sat an old man, slightly balding and face full of wrinkles. He sat in front of a small chessboard, staring down in contemplation. He picked up one piece and smiled, moving it into place. Yu Xiorong stepped forward and smiled, bowing slightly as she spoke. I'm sorry if our conversation disrupted you, good sir. We're just travelers passing through your humble village on our way to the Earth Shrine and we're curious about the events we'd heard about while here. You said you might shed a bit of light on them for us? I'd hate to impose. The old man waved them off, not bothering to look up from his chessboard. A second later, he picked up another piece on the other side of the board and moved it as well, frowning before answering. It's fine, it's fine. I've been having trouble sleeping anyway. Not like a little noise will make much of a difference. Yu Xiorong bowed again and responded. Nonetheless, I appreciate your understanding. You said you knew more about this. Lord Protector? Is that true? The old man laughed, throwing his head back. Ha! Huh. Lord Protector, that's a good one. The bastard is a menace, is what he is. Waltz into town, pretending to be the hero, all the while wrapping everyone around his finger. Bah! I can see right through his type. The old man sighed and shook his head. And you should see the things he taught the kids. Shameful is what it is. Irresponsible. Yu Xiorong frowned, her eyes narrowing. I see. That does sound like a problem. Have you not told elders or authorities about your suspicions? The old man turned and pointed to her. I know, right? If you're going to corrupt the kids, at least do it in a way they don't realize. Manipulation is all about subtlety. You're supposed to plant the seeds, make them think that they're the ones having the ideas. How are the kids supposed to grow and learn if you just give them everything? Yu Xiorong nearly spat blood as the old man continued. He turned back to his game and shrugged. As for the other children, not much point. There's no way the youngins here could have done anything against something like that. Better for everyone to keep up the illusion and see them on their way. Yu Xiorong's frown deepened, but she asked anyway. That's understandable. Would you happen to know which way they went? We maybe be simple travelers, but maybe we could warn others on the way about their corrupting ways. The old man went silent for a moment, moving pieces back and forth on the board before shrugging. Sure, I could do that. The old man processed to give them strangely detailed directions to where this mysterious Lord Protector had gone. Yu Xiorong's group quickly departed from the village and followed the old man's instructions. The entire time, Yu Xiorong's mind kept wandering back to the interaction with the old man in the village. Something had been strange about it, but she couldn't quite put her finger on it. However, such thoughts were soon left behind as the group came across a fresh trail, just as the old man had said. The four shared a look with each other and nodded before continuing down the trail. The hunt was on. Whack. Oh, what was that for? Maliki rubbed the back of his head as Maliot loomed over him, frowning. A thick book clutched in her hand. Maliot rubbed the bridge of her nose with her free hand and asked. Really, dear? Was any of that truly necessary? I thought we would keep our hands out of this one. Maliki scared and looked away, still rubbing his head as he spoke. We are. They'd have caught up, eventually. Besides, it's funnier this way. Not like they're gonna hurt anyone anyway. Think of it as an older, wiser man giving a lesson to his juniors about biting off more than they can chew. Maliot raised an eyebrow and countered. And when that boy starts a war? Maliki waved her away, moving another piece on his board. Bah! He was always going to do that, anyway. War's in his blood. I can taste it. Maliot sighed and shook her head. Sometimes I don't know why I married you. Maliki turned to look up at her, grinning ear to ear. You know you love them. Maliot cut him off by leaning over and moving a single piece from the other side of the board. Checkmate. Before the old woman walked back inside, Maliki paused, narrowed his eyes, and stared at the board. The longer he looked, the more his brow furrowed. Finally, the old man stood and, with a yell, flipped the board. 18. Book 1. Lesson 43. And the pieces, crap 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 crap. Alpha dodged around the thick, black vine as it poked out from the swampy 
muddy ground, attempting to ensnare the top's leg. The vine missed but exploded the next instant, covering the leg in a thick, sticky, tar-like substance. Not again. Alpha tried to pry the sticky good off with the top's nanite skin, but it was too late. The substance bubbled, then suddenly exploded with growth. Dark green-purple vines appeared on the leg's surface, the microscopic spores hidden in the tar germinating and growing at a rate that should have been physically impossible. The vines wiggled in the air for a moment before half started creeping up his leg, and the other half plunged deep into the ground. Alpha tugged, easily breaking the new growth attempting to root him in place, and a quick burst of his RCS trusters burned away any plant life left clinging to him. The slight delay had been enough, however, as even thicker purple vines erupted from the ground and wrapped around the main body of the TWB, pulling down. Alpha struggled against the vines, but the TWP couldn't exert much force on this kind of terrain. As the top's underside contacted the ground, hundreds of thin, probing roots or vines poked out, attempting to pry themselves into every opening, but found none. Alpha was a harder nut to crack than expected though, as the ground rumbled. The surrounding swamp bulged upward to relieve that the TWP stood at the center of the sadistic child between a Venus flytrap and a gargantuan reflesia. The center, a gaping maw of wriggling barbed vines, pooled with muddy soil and putrid water. Dozens of enormous dark purple spotted petals surrounded it. Each was covered in a mix of wiggling black vines and razor-sharp teeth as they rose out of the muddy soil. These petals rose higher, stretching dozens of meters, then folded inward, attempting to surround the trapped AI. About time you showed yourself, Alpha thought to himself as the petals closed around him. Soon, no gaps were left between the petals as they overlapped to further constrict their unwilling prey in an ever-tightening cocoon. After a moment, the constriction stopped. All was silent for a brief moment until a dozen bright lasers punched through the petals, crisscrossing all along their length. The toothy reflesia screamed, causing nearby swampy puddles to explode from its force. Like tumbling blocks, pieces of the closed flower tumbled away, revealing the TWP standing at its center, its hex shield glowing bright. Several laser turrets dotted its surface, their tips glowing, small streams of steam rising. The giant reflesia's various vines weakly wiggled in the air for a moment before falling to the ground, limp. Alpha shook himself free of the loose vines and stepped away, grumbling to himself. This was the sixth time he'd fallen into the same trap in the last day, and he regretted not going around. When he'd first encountered this swampy section of the prairies, Alpha wasn't sure what to make of it. What kind of swamp moves? He was absolutely certain he plotted his course to pass by it after the scouting. Wasps, reported it, but when he'd actually arrived, it had cut him off completely. I want to file a complaint with whoever designed this crappy place. Moving swamps, sudden blizzards, even rolling clouds of darkness that turned him around for hours and made his head hurt. He didn't even have a head. Alpha saw why everyone was making such a big deal about this time of the year. In just a few days, the prairies had gone from a relatively normal place, barring the rainbow grass and man-eating penguins, to a chaotic mishmash of roaming disasters. How the hell does anything survive here? Unfortunately for Alpha, this swamp was a poor match for him. The loose, muddy soil forced him into walker mode, and even then, it was slow going. To top that off, the local wildlife was just as fond of him being there as he was. Alpha added more notes to his records. Uncategorized floral species for 43S3. Temporary designation Alpha Trap Dash. Plan A5 for locating trip vines has been unsuccessful. The plants seem to emit subsonic vocalizations for unknown purposes, disrupting attempts via radar or other similar means. Preemptive tripping of vines has shown mixed results, as the subject appears to have some weight or size limit for prey. Likely to limit energy expenditure on prey it could either not contain or would cause a net loss. Likewise, attempts to force out the organism or exterminate it outright have been mixed. The surrounding terrain and its large size make damaging the subject impractical through conventional means. As of now, the most effective method for dealing with the creature has been outright avoidance, or when that is not possible, an internal assault after it has fully emerged. Side note, investigate magic weed killer. I don't like being eaten. Alpha sighed and closed his notes. Lucky for him, he was nearing the end of this swampy area, and the swamp itself seemed to head in a different direction. It only took him an hour or more to trudge his way through. When he at last stepped back on solid ground, Alpha threw his hands into the air and did a little dance. As soon as he got a proper base up and running, Alpha was building some terrain adapters for the TWP. They were too complicated to print using the top's nanoskin, 
but most of them could be compacted for transport, allowing ease of use. He didn't use them often, but if more places on this planet were like this, he'd rather be safe than sorry. It seems they were right. I've never quite seen a creature quite like you. Tell me, Lord Protector, where is it you hail from? Alpha froze. One of his side-facing optical sensors swerved and locked onto a figure behind him. The TWP lowered and turned in that direction, facing the figure directly. Only a few meters away from where the spawn ended sat a younger human adult male on a larger boulder, neither of which had been there only a few moments prior. How the hell did people keep sneaking up on him like this? It was getting embarrassing. The young man only smiled up at Alpha, a sharp-toothed grin stretching from ear to ear. What do you mean he'll meet with you tomorrow? Do not understand this is a time-sensitive matter? A red-faced Kallik nearly screamed into the face of the frowning, stoic priest in front of her. Nearby, several other priests worked with Prepu to be brought deeper into the temple's medical wing. The rest of the Slate Walker group stood to the side, having agreed that Kallik should do most of the talking. While the Grass Readers and Prima Temple were technically two different organizations, they shared a mutually beneficial relationship. An elder grass reader like Kallik should have had a far better chance of catching the right ear. Should have. The stoic priest frowned, pushing up the spectacles he wore. Grass reader Kallik, I'm afraid it's you who doesn't understand. We're merely days away from the darkest night. There are rays to lie down, rites and ceremonies to prepare for, and events to organize. We're short-staffed as it is, and finding even a senior priest with the time to speak to you is frankly a miracle in and of itself, let alone the head priest. If any of your... Outlandish claims are worth further investigating, you'll be contacted tomorrow, no sooner. Now, if you insist on making a spectacle of yourself, I'll have to kindly ask you to leave the temple grounds until further notice, or you may find your request thrown out entirely. Zalzea didn't need her gift to read the emotions playing across her mentor's face, but the older woman said nothing as she tried to burn a hole through the priest's skull with her eyes. A long moment passed in silence before Kallik turned and pushed herself through the gathered priests making her way toward the exit. The Slate Walker group shared a look before following her. Kallik paced back and forth, biting her thumb as the others found a seat in the small inn room. Inns in the wandering cities weren't big, more catering to the small number of foreign travelers that wandered the prairies alone or in small groups. With such a dangerous time as the darkest night approaching and most prairie natives preferring their home villages, the inns were essentially empty. That worked well for them, as they could find an inn near the temple. After booking their rooms, the group gathered in Kallik's room. Ganbader was the first to speak. So what now? I know we didn't want to go through the Jade Walkers, but if the temple is going to turn us away at the door, do we have any other choice? Not like we yell our story from the middle of the street. We'd get thrown in a cell before the Akhlet rep ever heard a word of it. Juatan answered back. Not much else we can do if we don't want to wait till tomorrow. Assuming they don't just push it back again. I agree. Time is of the essence though. The sooner we can contact the Akhlet, the sooner the Lord Protector can make his move. He should be in position sometime by tomorrow if your estimates of what he can do are accurate. Kallik stopped pacing and shook her head. When she spoke, she didn't look at anyone in particular but stared out the window toward the temple. Something doesn't sit right with me about this. I know Head Priest Erden. He's a stick in the mud about the rules, but he's not someone to ignore something like this. As soon as I used my authority as an elder, he should have been notified immediately. Zalzea frowned and asked, You think we're being blocked on purpose? Kallik growled and punched the windowsill. I don't know. And that's what frustrates me. Why would we? The temple and the Akhlut are interlocked. Most of the high-ranking officials in the temple are Akhlut. At least in the Radiant Sea. Why would they be hindering their own investigation? It doesn't make any sense. The group went silent for a long moment before a quiet, almost whispered voice spoke. We, we could. I mean, we could always, maybe, sneak in. As one, the rest of the group turned and stared at the young guardian sitting on the bed. The woman, Monk, gave a soft squeak and hit behind the large metal tower shield she carried everywhere. Uligan raised an eyebrow, his eyes wide. That had to have been the most words he'd ever heard his fellow guardian speak at one time. Many newer guardians assumed the small woman was too proud or haughty to speak to them. After all, she was the kind of genius only seen once in a generation. Those who had worked with her for a few years quickly learned the truth. For all her skills and talent, the woman was almost cripplingly shy. The captain once joked that Monk had picked the tower shield as her weapon so she had something to hide behind. Still, sneak into the Jay Walker temple? That was quite daring of her. Totally not something he would have expected someone like her to suggest. 
Still, given the security and consequence of they got caught, it was a tur. That's a great idea. Kalik's words nearly caused Uligan to spit blood. He looked at the grass reader, his eyes wide as she continued with a grin splitting her face from ear to ear. If they're stopping us from seeing Erden, then we'll just go see him ourselves. Even if they catch us, that kind of thing can't just be swept under the rug. The head priest will hear of it, if not the Oclet representative. Uligan held out a hand, his voice cracking as he spoke. Hey, wait now. You can't be serious. We're talking about the temple here. We can't. Jordan stood and moved to look out the window. His eyes narrowed as he spoke. Hum. If we're going to do this, we'll need a distraction. The Jade Walker Guardians are disciplined. They'll be on the scene moments after an alarm is raised. I still have some contacts from my time in the officer's academy, but I don't know if they'll be of much use. Gambader smiled and spoke up next. I'm sure I could cause some trouble with a bit of help. A lot of the taverns will be full tonight, with people getting their fill before the darkest night. What do you say, Zaya? I'm thinking D4, P2, and maybe a little B2 to spice things up. We've not used that one in years. Monk can even take you to's role. Zalzea didn't bother to answer, only smiled with a dark grin that matched her mentors. Uligan stood, his voice raised. Now, hold up, everyone. The group paused, staring at him as he continued. Look, I know we're on a time crunch here, but you can't honestly be thinking of doing this, can you? If we screw up, it's not just our flanks that get tossed in the fire. The group only stared back. Kalik raised a brow, frowning as she crossed her arms and spoke three words. The wood welder incident. Uligan paled, his eyes turning to moons. He tried to speak but couldn't form the words before sighing and falling back into his seat. Okay, fine, fine. Where do you need me? Kalik's grin returned, and she called her hands before addressing the group. Good, now we just need to. A sudden knock at the door cut her off. She was silent for a moment before calling out. Yes? Who is it? An unfamiliar voice called from behind the door. Grass reader Kalik? I have news from the temple. Is now a good time? The Slate Walker group fell silent. Kalik turned and met Zalzea's eyes. The young woman had gone pale, her hands tightly gripping the end of her shirt. Zalzea locked eyes with her mentor and slowly, almost unnoticeably, shook her head. Kalik's eyes narrowed, and she turned to look at Jotun. The older guardian nodded and stood, slowly drawing his blade. Monk too stood, the tower shield in her hands held at the ready. Again, the man behind the door knocked, and the voice called out. Hello? Is everything all right? Kalik called back, her voice the picture of calm. Yes, just one moment please. I'll be right there. She then slowly walked toward the door. Announcement. Spoiler. Collapse. 19. Book 1. Lesson 44. The enemy of my enemy. Alpha stared at the stranger, several laser turrets locked onto his biosignature. The man definitely hadn't been there only a few moments before, nor had the large boulder he sat on. More magic bullcrap, no doubt. Alpha was getting tired of being constantly caught off guard like this. What happened to being a super advanced AI with capabilities far beyond most biological minds? Something was severely wrong with him. He knew that, yet all his diagnostics came back all clear, even after major repairs. Maybe if he had some time to sit down and do a deeper dive, he could figure out exactly what was wrong, but this place kept throwing one thing after another at him. Seeing the several still glowing turrets pointing his way, the stranger held up his hands and slid down the boulder. He was a young man, human in appearance, though his hair was divided into several black and white sections. His eyes were a golden yellow, and when he spoke, Alpha could see his mouth was filled with teeth far sharper than they should be. Hey now, no need for that friend. Or would you prefer Lord Protector? Alpha's optic plate spun, and he responded, his voice calm but clear with an unspoken warning. That depends on who's asking, and whether I like what you have to say. The stranger grinned, though he never lowered his hands or looked away from the glowing tips of the turrets. When he spoke, he did so with a soft chuckle. Me? No one important. Just a messenger. From someone who hopes we can come to an understanding. You can call me Tegusler. Not that the name would mean anything to you, I suppose. Alpha considered if he should stay in character or not. Either option had its pros or cons. A moment of silence passed before he said, Go on. The strange man's eyes went wide. Didn't expect it to be that easy. Tegusler muttered to himself, likely not thinking Alpha could hear him. His sharp-toothed grin soon replaced the look though, and the man bowed. This one thanks the Lord Protector for taking the time to hear his request. As for the details, the ones I represent and I are aware that you're new to this area. 
As such, we don't expect you to quite understand the nature of events in which you've recently found yourself. That's fair, and we can hardly hold it against one of your standings for stepping on toes that you didn't know were there. That being said, your presence has complicated things for those I represent. Plans that have been long in the making. The TWP couldn't really emote in the same way a biological could. After all, it was a machine designed for combat, not casual socialization. That said, Alpha had developed certain tics over the years that he found effective in interacting with most biologicals, be it intimidation or other responses. The TWP rose higher into the air, the back legs extending slightly so that the front optics plate stared down at the man, the glowing red lights brightening slightly as Alpha spoke. Are you telling me to stand down? The effect of the display was satisfactory as Tugusler took a hasty step back, his hands raised and the grin on his face slightly twitching as he spoke. No, no, good sir. We never think to tell you what to do, not at all. We simply ask that you let things play out as they would should you not have arrived. After all, this is not your land nor your people. You have no real stakes in all of this, correct? Of course, we're not asking this of you from the kindness of your heart. Tugusler reached out a hand and gave a flick. An ornate black box appeared from nowhere. Alpha instantly recognized several of the patterns carved into the box, though the designs were far less complex than what was found on his drone. He reached over with his free hand and opened the box. On top of a small cushion sat a gemstone several times larger than even the largest heart crystal Alpha currently possessed. Though still rough and uncut, this gem glowed with an inner light and appeared far more spherical than the rough crystal shards found in the penguins. The man let Alpha observe the gem for a moment before closing the lid and placing it on the ground, pushing it toward Alpha as he spoke. Consider it a gift of first meetings, no strings attached. This is but one of the things we can offer you as compensation for washing your hands clean of this whole mess. I assure you, whatever you hope to gain from this, my benefactor can easily match or exceed it. Alpha stared down at the box. He had to admit to himself, he was tempted. But there was still one major issue that prevented him from doing so. Alpha looked back up from the box and stared to Gussler down. His voice was flat as he spoke. And the child? The man stumbled but quickly recovered. I am not sure what you mean. The child is in safe hands. Alpha mentally frowned. Something was fishy. So he asked, that being the case, I'm sure you'd be willing to let me confirm that for myself, yes? To Gussler furrowed his brow, and his smile became a little more tense as he responded. I don't believe that would be a good idea. Sir. As I stated, the child is safe. You no longer need to concern yourself with them. Alpha didn't bother responding directly and instead recited directly from the Federation Code. Article E3 EC45 Shield. Child Guardianship and Battlefield Safety Act Federation soldiers are to ensure the safety and continued well-being of any Federation child found inside of hostile territory until such a time that said child is released into the custody of appropriate custodians as outlined by the Galactic Collective for the Protection of Children. GCPC. Any force, be they private or civilian, who attempts to interfere with said duty, is to be labeled as hostile forces and treated as such. The stranger stared wide eyes, his mouth a getty. He quickly recovered and frowned at Alpha. His overly cheerful tone dropped. Disregarding that I've never even heard of this so-called federation of yours, the child belongs to the Aklut and the Radiant Sea. By what right do you claim them? The TWP straightened as Alpha responded. As of three weeks. Four days, 16 hours, 32 minutes, and 52 seconds ago, this land and its civilian inhabitants are registered as the newest colony of the Third Galactic Federation. As such, all rights, privileges, and responsibilities of citizenship have been retroactively extended to the people. That includes protection under, and responsibility to, Federation law. The man gawked, his face turning a deeper red with each moment before he pointed at Alpha and yelled, How dare you! Do you have any idea where you stand? Not even the great pillars of the Skybreaker continent dare to lay claim to these lands, let alone some no name unknown. Tugusler's words were cut off by a lance of light. A thin beam of superheated plasma raced past his left ear at the speed of light. Tugusler froze, his entire body shaking as sweat poured down his neck. Slowly, he turned. The large boulder he'd sat on only a moment earlier was now cleaved in two, each split and glowing red as the melted rock dripped down the side. There had been no warning, no gathering of energy, not even a twitch from the strange being in front of him. Only a single, instant line of light cutting through reality. On top of Alpha's back, the Gunner finished forming. A blast from the ion cannon using his own energy core was far weaker than using a proper nitrogen crystal.
but it sufficed to put the fear of Alpha into those who didn't know better. Too many shots would wear him out, so it would never be a primary weapon, but that wasn't any of his concern anymore. Alpha was tired, tired of the games and tired of playing along. He tried to play nice. This was a new world, one he didn't know and didn't have the tools or time to study properly. This wasn't the way he did things. This wasn't how things should have been. He'd gone along with all this native drama for so long to get a lay of the land, to try and understand what and who he was dealing with. That way, when he finally made his move, he knew exactly what buttons to push, so there was as little resistance as possible. Yet every step of the way, it seemed it was his buttons that were being pushed. Maybe it was time they learned why he'd earned the title Conqueror. Alpha took a step forward, purposefully putting the entire weight of the TWB behind it causing the ground to shake as he spoke. I'm afraid you don't understand. I'm not making a claim to anything. From the moment I stepped foot on this land, this world belonged to the Federation. That is not a subjective claim. That is an immutable truth. Only two people exist in this world at this very moment. Federation citizens and rebels. Whichever you wish to throw your lot in with, I honestly don't care. Be aware this is the only warning I'll give you and your benefactor. The strange man stared, eyes wide but silent. When he spoke, his face began warping, becoming more bestial and strange, and he pointed at Alpha. I thought the cultivators were arrogant. What gives you the right to lay claim to our home? I've never even heard of you or your federation. Alpha stood the TWB to its full height and stared down at the man. His final two words were spoken with a calm absoluteness that sent a small shiver down the strange man's spine. You will. Tugusler leapt several feet back, instantly covering more than a dozen meters. When he stopped. His face went blank but for a deep frown, as if everything before had been but an act. When he spoke, his words were even and calm. I believe that's more than enough evidence for now. Not only do you refuse to give up on the child, but you even make open claims of invasion and occupation. What say you, Elder Shiro? Rather than a response of words, the ground beneath Alpha rumbled. Alpha backed up the TWB just as the ground he was standing on exploded outward. From the ground rose a gargantuan figure. It continued to rise into the air, circling around until all 35 meters of its 1.5 meter diameter body emerged. Alpha observed the new arrival to find it was some kind of giant, scaled serpent. Its head was more mammalian than a reptile, though covered in dark green-black scales. Two stubby, immature horns poked out of its skull, and a thick, jet-black mane ran down the length of its body, from the top of its head to the tip of its tail. The only limbs on the creature were two feathered wings near the middle that appeared far too small to support such a massive creature. The creature stared down at Alpha, a fire burning in its throat as it hissed at him. Then it moved. Quicker than something its size should have been able to, it fell from the sky toward Alpha, its mouth hyperextended, too massive, meter-long fangs plunging downward like unstoppable blades. But stop, they did. The top's hex shield sprang to life flashing blue as the massive serpent's jaws pushed harder into the energy barrier. The rest of its long body flailed, then wrapped around the barrier, squeezing it hard as it tried to crack through Alpha's defenses. Alpha wouldn't give it a chance. A dozen cracks of thunder echoed through the prairies, followed immediately by minor explosions, as a dozen crystal rails pushed their way out of the top snainite skin. The flying snake screamed, quickly disengaging. None of the rounds had pierced the thick, armored scales covering the creature, but several places were cracked and broken or burned black. The crystal rail still wasn't combat ready by Alpha's standards, but if the snake's initial assault was the best it could do, he doubted it could even break through his passive defenses, let alone his hex shield. This could be a good chance to collect combat data. Alpha fired a few more rail shots towards the creature, who nimbly dodged many of them, to his surprise. It seemed the overall projectile speed had taken a severe hit. Even so, each bullet traveled as fast as a standard civilian handgun. Even seeing them was an impressive feat, let alone dodging them. As he chased the snake creature with a barrage of bullets, a second figure appeared in what would have been Alpha's blind spot if not for rear-facing optical plates and active wasp drones. A young, muscular human woman flickered into being several meters above him. She carried a thick metal rod in her hands, and on the end of the rod, a heavy chain attached to a metal ball as wide as she was tall. Against every law of physics Alpha knew, the woman twisted and swung the giant flail at the AI. Again, his hex shield flashed to life, absorbing the entire blow and not moving Alpha a single inch. The young woman's eyes went wide, but it was too late. Several crystal rails swerved and fired in the blink of an eye. 
the woman was sent flying back dozens of meters as several rounds hit her center mass directly. The woman hit the ground hard, rolling for several more meters and leaving a small blood trail along her path. To Alpha's surprise, however, the woman didn't stay down. When she stopped rolling, she pulled herself up on shaking arms, coughing up a small stream of blood. A quick bioscan showed only one round had penetrated, piercing her right lung, while most of the remaining damage had been caused by the explosions. Bulletproof fabric then? But why? Strange. Fang Pun, a voice called out. Another figure, a young teen girl dressed in a black robe-like dress, flickered and appeared next to Fang Pun. This time, Alpha had caught it. It wasn't some form of teleportation, but a high-speed movement. So fast, Alpha had to toggle down his reference frames by several degrees. How a biological reached such speeds without any apparent augmentations, he didn't know, and he doubted they would answer if he asked. Instead, he targeted the pair and open fired. This time, however, a thick plan of crystal or glass materialized in the projectile's path, which exploded harmlessly against the hard substance. No, not glass, ice? Through his drones, Alpha could see the girl in black lay glowing hands on the wounded woman. A gentle light enveloped her as the older woman's grimacing face loosened. Before Alpha could examine what the younger woman was doing, dozens of needle-thin shards of ice slammed against the TWP, individually not strong enough to trigger the automatic hex shield. Where they hit, thin layers of frost spread, not really doing much else. Alpha turned his attention skyward to find a glasses-wearing young man standing on what appeared to be a panel of floating ice. His white-gray robes billowed in the wind, and his long brown hair was pulled back into a simple ponytail. Okay, this magic bullcrap is getting out of hand. Alpha thought to himself as the young sneered down at him. The young man held out a clear glass bow in front of him and drew the string. As he did, a liquid arrow condensed on the string, seemingly from thin air. The man released the string and the watery arrow flew forward at such speed that it disintegrated before making it halfway to Alpha. Instead of falling harmlessly to the ground, each of the dozens of water droplets that had formed the arrow rocketed toward him, freezing in midair to form more icy needles. Again, they pelted into the TWP with just as little effect, unable to scratch the war machine's heavy armor. Alpha could see the man visibly grinding his teeth in frustration. Alpha sent a round of fire his way, only for it to be blocked by another icy barrier. The AI sked, switching out a few crystal rails for energy turrets. This time, the thin energy beams cut through the ice walls like butter, forcing the man to dodge at the last second and abandon a third shot. A thundering, feminine voice suddenly sounded over the rumble of ray of fire. Retreat! I told you to stay behind, disciples! The entire time Alpha had been focused on the three humans who'd popped out of nowhere, the creature had been twirling and wiggling in the air, dodging most, but not all, of his shots. As it did so, each swish of its tail sent a pressurized blade of wind slamming against Alpha's hex shield. Internally, Alpha sighed. Of course, the giant flying snake could talk. He wasn't even surprised anymore. What next? Was a rock going to stand up and introduce itself? The young teen with glowing hands cried back. But Elder, we can still. The creature, whom Alpha assumed was this Elder Shorong, yelled back. Enough. I said retreat. This beast is beyond you. Flee and inform the sect. Alpha took a moment to stop firing and offer his own words. Or, you could all surrender now and save me the trouble of having to kill you. The Federation respects all forms of peaceful surrender under the galactic wartime rules and codes of conduct. Peaceful cooperation will be met with likewise. I highly. Another blade of wind dispersed harmlessly off his hex shield, the elder Shorong rudely interrupting him. Be silent, you foul beast. You dare besmirch the origin sex honor by suggesting we would surrender to a confessed invader of our allies in these prairies? Here now, criminal, you stand not against us four, but against the entire power of one of the five great pillars. She then turned to the three humans and yelled, Go now, I will meet with you soon. The humans protested, but soon nodded. One by one they vanished. Elder Shurong stared down at Alpha, flames flickering in the back of her throat as she spoke. You may think your words are immutable but the origin sect has crushed more petty tyrants like you than you have ever known to exist. Do not think you can simply walk on the innocent without repercussions, beast. The talking snake opened its mouth wide, the flickering flames shifting to jet black as they billowed toward Alpha like a dark flamethrower. Draconic spark, Alpha only shrugged as he responded. Oh well, have it your way. I warned you. In only a split second, Alpha had analyzed the strange flame's energy output and found it, wanting. 
In a moment of curiosity, Alpha loaded a nitrogen rod into the Gungner's firing chamber. He only had a few dozen nitrogen rods left, but he wanted to see just how this overgrown snake stacked up against his fiery chicken friend. The results were disappointing. A blinding lance of ionized gas and light, several times larger than the beam that had split the boulder, cut through the black flames as if they weren't even there. In less than the blink of an eye, the ion cannon's beam swung upward, carving a deep groove into the ground, then slicing the coiled, flying snake into several large pieces before continuing upward. As the beam passed, the clouds parted in its wake, revealing a thin, shallow groove in the nearly invisible barrier in the sky before it swiftly healed over. Elder Shurong's eyes grew wide, their eyes quivering before the various pieces of her body fell from the sky in a gory rain. Even if someone could dodge bullets, that didn't mean they could dodge light itself. The various bits wiggled around for a bit until finally, going still. Internally, Alpha sighed. Well, that had been a waste. Oh well, at least he'd gathered some good data. Alpha collected a few bio samples and even poked around the creature's heart but found nothing. Oh well, Alpha turned away from the body not wanting to waste more time than he already had here. Tegusler had disappeared sometime during the conflict, but Alpha didn't mind. Something told him they'd meet again, real soon. Besides, he'd been kind enough to leave the black box behind. Alpha collected the prize and checked his map to ensure he was headed in the right direction. Soon, Alpha had left the battlefield far behind him. 21. Book 1, Lesson 45. There are lessons in defeat. Several minutes after Alpha had left. Lin Weiyuan flicked back onto the battlefield several moments later, a struggling, ice-encased Fang Ping under his arm. Qi Mingxi appeared next to him only a moment later, only to scream and erupt into loud sobbing. The three of them had retreated a distance away, like Elder Xiorong had told them to. The plan was to stall the mysterious metal spirit beast long enough for them to escape, then meet up at the checkpoint. But only a short while later they witnessed that strange beam of light split the sky. The sight had sent a chill down his spine. Something like that. That shouldn't have been possible. Not here. Not in the Radiant Sea. Not even the most powerful of the Aklat could display that much of their power here. That was the point of it. What in the Nine Hells was going on? What was that thing? While Lin Weiyuan was trying to process what he'd just seen, Fang Ping attempted to go back. The young man had to restrain her. The elder had been right. This was far beyond them. He couldn't let her rush back to her death not in the state she was in. Even so, his ice manacles could barely restrain the rampaging body cultivator. After waiting a few moments with still no sign of Elder Xiorong, Lin Weiyuan and Qi Mingxi agreed to return to the battlefield. What they saw when they did so nearly broke their spirits. The body of Elder Yushiorong lay where it fell, cut into several distinct pieces. Fang Ping stopped struggling, all fight seeming to have left the young woman. She only stared unblinking, her mouth moving but producing no sound. Qi Mingxi knelt in a pile of blood, her arms wrapped around the severed head of her master, openly weeping as she cradled it. Lin Weiyuan felt numb himself, like an icy pit had opened in the center of his chest and threatened to suck all the heat from his body. For the first time since he'd become a cultivator all those years ago, his mind felt sluggish and blank. He tried to run through all the scenarios in his head, trying to figure out where it had all gone wrong. What had he missed? No matter how he tried, none of it made any sense. He only stood there, unmoving. A quiet voice broke him free of the endless loop he trapped himself in. She's alive! Lin Weiyuan shook as if shocked by a static mage and slowly looked down at Fang Ping, not quite understanding. What? Fang Ping yelled, her body flexing, opening up her wounds but shattering her icy restraints. She's alive! The young woman half ran, half crawled to where Qi Ming she knelt quickly tracing her muscular hand along the severed head's scales. Lin Weiyuan to rushed over, placing his hands on the remains. It was only then he could feel it. It was faint, weak like a flickering candle, but it was there. The gentle thump of vital and spirit energy. He turned to Fang Peng, grinning from ear to ear, the woman matching him as he shouted. She's alive! A soft whimper drew his attention, and Lin Weiyuan turned to see Qi Mingxi staring up at them both. Her eyes were bloodshot, and her face tear-stained and when she spoke, her voice was raw. What? Lin Weiyuan raised a brow, but then it suddenly dawned on him. Ah, uh, that's right. You rose through the ranks pretty fast, didn't you? You've not likely taken a lot of the informational classes yet. Lin Weiyuan turned and placed his hand on the much younger girl's head as he spoke, entering lecture mode. He'd taken those classes enough that he could probably teach them himself. 
Elder Shuram was, is, a high-tier soul fusion, cultivator halfway through the, earthly transcendent realm. What is the purpose of that realm? Chi Ming Shi frowned as she spoke. To transcend our worldly limits. It is the middle ground of ascension, where we begin shedding our mortal form and replace it with one suited for the heavens. What does that have to do with it? Everyone knew that. It was one of the most basic lessons any cultivator learned. To lie down your foundation, to transcend your limits, and finally break through the firmament above to take your place among the stars. That was the meaning of the three great realms that made up their path. But even firmament breakers could die, let alone an earthly transcendent. Lin Weiyuan nodded as he continued. Correct. And do you know what happens during the greater step before soul fusion? Chi Ming Shi opened her mouth but quickly closed it, shaking her head. Of course, she didn't know. She was only an early stage, shackle-breaking, cultivator, the last step of the mortal foundation realm. Why would she know about a step that would likely take her another century to even reach? Lin Weiyuan spoke again, informing her. The greater step before soul fusion is called core condensing, and it is one of the most important steps a cultivator will ever take. It is here that we condense our cores. Lin Weiyuan raised his hand to the sky as if making some grand proclamations. Chi Ming Shi stared blank-faced at him, but Lin Weiyuan didn't miss the slight twitch of her lip and how her eyes brightened slightly. As talented and mature as the young woman sometimes seemed, it was easy to forget that she was still young, barely an adult in most places. Lin Weiyuan smiled down at her and continued. As for what that means, it's simple. All cultivators condense their energy into a physical center in their body, be they human, awakened beast, or any other sapient species. For us humans, we form a dantian. He placed his hand over his torso, slightly above his navel. For beasts, they form beast crystals in their hearts. Dragons form dragon pearls in a similar manner. This is true for every species, even if the place and nature of this energy well changes. Once you reach core condensing, things change. Lin Weiyuan moved his hand and placed it right over the center of his torso, slightly higher up. You said it yourself? The goal of earthly transcendent is to replace our mortal body with one more compatible with the heavens, and thus spirit energy. Core condensing is where that begins. Qi Mingxi's eyes widened, and Fan Ping nodded in understanding, raising a finger and continuing where Lin Weiyuan had left off. She rarely showed so much interest in a topic, so he let her. When a cultivator enters core condensing, they begin transforming their dantian, beast crystal or whatever, into a spiritual core. Functionally, they're the same, acting as a reservoir for stored spirit energy, but with one key difference. A spiritual core has no physical form. It's a pure energy construct, and because it isn't physical, Qi Ming Shi cut her off, realization striking her. It has no limits. Fan Ping wilted her big revelation stolen from her by the child genius. Lin Weiyuan patted Fang Peng's shoulder but continued from there. Right. Because the spiritual core isn't limited by physical size, it can store unimaginable amounts of energy, far surpassing what we ever could otherwise, without it utterly destroying us in the process. It also primes the cultivator for their next step, soul fusion. It's here that the cultivator fuses their very soul to this spiritual core. This is critical before the next step, shedding flesh in which the actual process of replacing one's body begins. Care to take a guess why? Chi Ming Shi furrowed her brow, trying to think hard about what she'd learned. After a moment, she spoke her thoughts out loud. Core condensing isn't just necessary for energy storage. The foundation steps are all about growing your dantian, but a spiritual core is limitless. You can't grow something that's already boundless. Lin Weiyuan nodded as the girl continued to put her thoughts into words. But if it was just about using energy... Why not go straight to shedding flesh? If there's no qualitative change, what's the point of taking the extra step to fuse your soul with your spiritual core core? How does that prepare you to? Suddenly, the young girl's eyes shot wide open, her face snapping back and forth between Lin Weiyuan and the severed head. Lin Weiyuan nodded, smiling as he finished. Yes. The point of soul fusion is to fuse your soul to your spiritual core, thus anchoring to this core instead of your body. Chi Ming Shi rushed to her master's head and placed glowing hands on its surface. She was silent for a long moment before her face furrowed and fresh tears began pouring from her eyes. Lin Weiyuan walked over and gently wrapped the weeping girl in a hug before tapping her head. A thick layer of gentle ice slowly enveloped it, preserving the head and injecting spirit energy to nurture the wounded soul trapped inside. As a cultivator nearing the end of soul fusion, Elder Xiorong had long completed the process. 
she was just stuck gathering the energy needed to start transforming her body and step fully into shedding flesh. She could absolutely still die, especially if she ran out of spirit energy and her spiritual core collapsed. But as long as they could bring the elder back to the sect, she should make a full recovery, even if severely weakened by the event. If she'd been only a few greater steps high, she could have even totally rebuilt her body from ashes herself, given enough time and spirit energy. But being only in the middle of earthly transcendent meant she would slowly bleed off energy unless assisted, so time was crucial. Once Chi Ming Shi had calmed some, Fang Ping folded her arms and voiced the question he'd been stuck on as well. I don't understand though. Why didn't the creature destroy her spiritual core? That's standard practice for cultivators of their level, if I understood correctly. No one likes when an enemy you thought you killed pops up a few decades later, even stronger. Some kind of sick mercy? Or is it mocking us? Lin Weiyuan lifted the elder's frozen head into the air with his spirit energy and shook his head. Staring off into the distance, he asked himself the same question. I don't know. Huff huff. Juatan and Elegant stood over three bodies, panting. Monk sat cross-legged on her shield, the heavy metal object pinning a fourth man down. Ganbader stood guard over Zelzea and Kalak as they stabilized the wounded innkeeper. Ganbader hadn't brought his own spear to the room but held Jordan's sidearm, a small gladius, at the ready. Kalak's room was a wreck, looking like a storm or wild beast had passed through. The bed was utterly destroyed, having been cut into several pieces. The door had been kicked off its hinges during the opening move as two armed men rushed into the room, while the window had been shattered when two more broke through. Despite the sudden intrusion, the group had been ready, and their enemy had either been overconfident or didn't realize the sheer amount of talent gathered in the room. Either way, the fight lasted only a handful of breaths as two assailants practically threw themselves onto Jotun and Uligan's spears, while a third quickly succumbed to Kalik's poisoned arts. In contrast, the assailant's own attacks didn't even scratch the party. Even though each of the four men was low silver spirit, the small room had worked against them. Their every blow was blocked by several phantasmal shields connected to Munka's own via spirit wires. The only one injured had been the innkeeper, who'd rushed up the stairs as soon as the fighting started, only to get caught in the crossfire. Once the innkeeper was stable, Kalik approached the pinned man and knelt down to speak. I'm guessing you'll not willingly tell us who sent you, will you? No matter, I have something for that. She pulled out a small yellow pill, grinning from ear to ear. The man met her eyes, and mirrored her grin before clenching his jaw. Kalik's eyes went wide, and she snatched the man's face, prying open his mouth, but it was too late. The man's eyes rolled to the back of his head, and a thick black foam poured from his mouth. Kalik flared her spirit energy, burning away some of the poison lingering on her hand, and sked. I should have seen that one coming. She stood and shook her head, then turned to the group to speak. But before she could, the dead man's eyes turned pitch black. With a yelp, Monk leapt off the body as it was enveloped in a thick black flame. One by one, the three other bodies also burst into black flames, and in the span of a few breaths, not even ashes remained. Kalik stared at the spotless floor and cursed to herself. Wasn't expecting that though. The group shared a look and laughed, but their relief was soon cut short as the sound of heavy footsteps rushed up the instairs. A moment later, a dozen fully armed guardians stood outside the destroyed room, their spears ready. The group parted to let an older man, in slightly more ornate armor, into the room. The grizzled-looking man stopped at the broken doorway and stared into the destroyed room. One by one, his eyes coasted over each of them, pausing only on the innkeeper and Jotun, to whom he gave a raised brow. After a long moment of silence, he spoke in a commanding voice. Grass Reader Kalak and company, you are hereby placed under arrest. Surrender your weapons peacefully and present yourself for processing. The three Slate Walker Guardians shared a look and dropped their weapons, raising their hands in the air. Ganbader hesitated but a sharp look from Jordan had the young man following suit. Kalik sighed and pinched the bridge of her nose. She hadn't seen that one coming either though, in retrospect, she really should have. 17. Book 1, Lesson 46 Get your arrays in order, progress, both literally and metaphorically. Alpha had arrived at the small checkpoint building nearly 12 hours ago, and not much had happened since. The checkpoint itself was a simple thing, little more than a small courtyard surrounded by a stone wall a dozen meters tall, barely able to hide the TWP if Alpha crouched. In the courtyard's center was a watchtower, twice as high as the walls, allowing someone at the top to see for dozens of miles in all directions. The entire complex was the first permanent structure he'd seen since the ruined temple. 
A few small, humble buildings dotted the courtyard, which Alpha had assumed were offices and barracks for the station soldiers. Not that there were occupied, of course. This checkpoint, and the ones he could see several dozen miles away in either direction, were totally abandoned. The humans had said they'd likely be, as the soldiers were pulled back to more public areas during this darkest night. That said, Alpha had half accepted the black and white man to show up again or some new threat to pop its head out of the woodwork, but the last few hours have been eerily quiet. Probably had something to do with the giant, swirling vortex of darkness in the sky. Alpha turned his attention back to the strange phenomenon he'd been studying since he arrived. Like the Earth Shrine, the swirling clouds hadn't been visible until he got close enough, even with his advanced sensors. It was like something in the air was scattering everything he threw at it, almost like the icy shell surrounding the planet. Instead, he'd first witness vibrant streams of shimmering, rainbow energy coalescing in the sky, like auroras in the night sky. These streams seemed to come from all over the prairies, likely the Earth's shrines, if he understood the humans' explanations. As they drew near the center of the prairies, they combined, growing thicker and more visible until they converged into the swirling vortex. As the vortex churned, all the colors mixed into a muddy brown cloud, this too condensing into a deep, black color that reminded Alpha of rich, fertile soil for some strange reason. The soil cloud swirled inward toward an absolute center, directly above a large building in the distance that he could just barely make out. There, the swirling black cloud grew tighter, then descended like a funnel cloud being pulled to the ground. As they neared the building, however, something changed. The dark, rich color of fertile soil was quickly overtaken by a choking black cloud that swirled around it, slowly filtering in and tainting it. Not that Alpha had any idea what was happening or how the civilization he'd witnessed so far, even in the much larger Jade Walker City, would be capable of something like this. This was the type of weather and energy manipulation he would have expected from the Federation. Not a bunch of nomads still using swords and spears. It was more proof for Alpha's theory that someone off-planet had stakes here that the natives weren't aware of. He couldn't even get any wasps close to the storm or building to scout further either. The same interference that blocked his sensors jammed his connection to the drones. Even setting them to auto-scouting didn't work. The onboard AIs didn't have the intelligence or reflexes to make it very far into the danger zone. So rather than waste more drones, Alpha had taken the time to study the storm however he could and scout the area. The scouting had turned up little, just more empty outposts every few dozen miles and a couple of wandering hazards that he made a note of for later. Where he had made some breakthroughs had been his arrays. Studying the storm, even with what little he could gather from it, had been a godsend. As he suspected, the energy gathering and concentrating was nearly identical to the energy inside the heart crystals. Alpha wasn't sure which came first though. Did the creatures naturally gather and condense this energy from their environment for later use? Or was the energy released into the environment as creatures died, leaving behind their heart crystals? Either way, observing how the energy behaved in the storm led him to several discoveries. First, much like how electricity preferred straight lines, this strange energy preferred circles. To be more accurate, the more the energy circulated, the more organized and easier it moved. In its natural, free-flowing state, it was chaotic and highly volatile but it became far more stable and less prone to straying once it started circulating. That would explain several strange nodes he'd found in the drone's array. Even after identifying the functions of several parts, he'd still been unable to figure out what the point of the weird circular pools dotted along its length were. It turns out they were rest stops for the energy, where the energy could be circulated and stabilized before being moved to other areas. That would also explain why most of his prototypes kept exploding. The energy was being forced through the array without enough time to stabilize properly, causing it to stray and run wild. The second thing he discovered was that the energy flowed more like a gas than a liquid like electricity did. This meant several things. First, the energy had a tendency to collect into pockets of density. Higher density energy would displace lower density, pushing it through the array. However, if there wasn't enough force, the energy would pool into pockets, eventually crystallizing. In the small test arrays, these crystals were microscopic but were still apparently large enough to destabilize and explode, causing further chain reactions. Comparing it to the drone, Alpha realized that was another purpose of the various nodes. As they circulated and stabilized the energy, they also cleaned the array, removing crystallized buildup and turning it back into flowing energy. With everything he'd learned, it only took a few hours for Alpha to finish modeling a new design for his storage array. The design itself was simple compared to some of the more intricate, 
and flowing arrays seen on the drone, but Alpha liked the simplicity of it. More importantly, it worked. Originally, Alpha had been trying to force the raw energy from the stone into the arrays. This had caused the unorganized, chaotic energy to pool and clot faster than Councilman Harris's arteries during Taco Tuesdays. This time, Alpha took a different approach. The array was divided into three major parts, input, output, and storage. His input was still the same shaped grove he'd been using before, but now it was more apparent why the drone's input was a spiral. The energy's tendency to follow circular paths meant a spiral was perfect for drawing the energy out. This pre-stabilized energy was then directed into the second area, storage. The storage array itself had three main parts as well. The first, the prime energy circuit, was where the energy would circulate and transfer between various parts of the array. From here, it could drain into the energy storage circuits or be directed to the output channels. Once in storage, the energy storage circuits would act similarly to the nodes scattered around the drone's arrays. The energy would be collected, condensed, circulated, and mixed in five separate circuits connected by a primary circulator at the center. This prevented any buildup of crystals while keeping the energy condensed and ready for use, like an industrial mixer continuously spinning to keep a batch from coagulating. From the primary circulator, energy would leak back into the prime energy circuit, where it would either begin the process again or be directed to the output channels for use. The output had been a stroke of brilliance, if he said so himself, even if it was simple in practice. The output channels could be curved or straightened as needed using a bit of nanite skin. Since the energy almost always followed the more curved path, Alpha could keep the energy contained within the prime energy circuit by straightening the channel. Alpha could curve the output channel when a certain output needed energy, tempting the energy to siphon in. Alpha could use this method to control when and where the energy went and how much was used. This resulted in the modular storage array, which could attach to other arrays directly through the primary output connectors. The square connectors would still circulate the energy, but made the energy very agitated, wanting to escape. So when a second input from another array was connected to them, the energy gladly moved to the new array. He could even link multiple storage arrays together in this way, though he saw little use for that at the moment. Progress was progress though, he couldn't complain. Once he had a real base, he could dive into the deep end and see what this energy really was and what it could do. That was for later. Right now, he had other matters to deal with. The TWP hadn't moved for hours, ever since he'd settled into the checkpoint. To any outside observer, it might have appeared he'd simply fallen asleep, or died. But he'd been constantly monitoring the area while he worked, so his new guest hadn't slipped past his notice. Are you going to introduce yourself? Alpha spoke into the empty courtyard. For a long moment, no one answered until a lone figure walked out from behind a nearby building. They wore armor resembling the gear Alpha had seen worn by the various adventurers in Jade Walker City. Of far higher quality, however. Had Alpha not already known what array lines looked like, he would have assumed the dense scrawl on the figure's leather armor to be decorative. At the very least, Alpha could tell whoever had done the work was far more skilled than whoever had done the sparse scrawling he recorded on the other adventurer's gear. Strange enough, it still couldn't compare to the meticulous and detailed work the old man had done to his drone. It made part of the AI wonder who the petty old fart really was. The stranger's array work was particularly dense around the wrists, lower legs, and on the otherwise featureless wooden mask they wore. The mask itself was interesting, as it didn't even have eye holes. Whatever their purpose, Alpha suspected at least one function was voice modulation. When the figure spoke, their voice was grainy and rough, obviously artificial. After all, I shouldn't be surprised. Your reputation precedes you, Lord Protector. If my companion hadn't warned me about you, I'd have thought all my cloaking, Hodge at hashtag 5A, were damaged or defective. Alpha noted the first unknown word he'd heard in a while. His guest hadn't used the word for a race, but it had contained similar root syllables. Interesting. Was it a cultural thing? Or was there more to it? Filing that away for later, Alpha responded. Strange. You don't strike me as a native and everyone else around these parts has the funny habit of not staying in enough pieces to talk about me. I'll assume you're not supposed to be my contact either. My friends are currently indisposed at the moment. What was your companion's name? Maybe I can point you toward what's left. The masked figure only shrugged and strolled in his direction as it spoke. There's no need for that, Lord Protector. My companion is being returned home as we speak. As for who they are, I'm afraid I can't say much. Professional standards and all that, I'm sure you understand, but have no fear. I'm not here for revenge. Not against your esteemed self, 
at the very least. The TWP stood, and Alpha turned to face the figure, raising the war machine to its full height. That display, at least, gave the figure pause, stopping several dozen meters away. Oh? Then who are you after? The figure laughed, and answered. Let's just say the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Alpha could hear the grin in the figure's next words despite the mask. And I hope we can be very good friends, Mr. Lord Protector. Let us out. This is ridiculous. We're telling you we were attacked. Ganna rattled the bars of his cell, despite the hard glares of the guardian standing guard on the other side. They'd been locked up for hours now, with no news at all. They hadn't even been allowed to defend themselves and had been thrown into cells as soon as they'd been dragged to the jail cart. The excuse they'd been given was no one had time to deal with a drunken brawl this close to the darkest night, but Ganon knew it was El Crap. This whole situation was fishy as hell, from the priest's odd refusal to the attack from unknown men who burst into black flames. Hell, even the guardians reacting so quickly was strange. The fight had lasted only a handful of breaths. Unless a patrol had been walking by at that exact time, how would they have even arrived so fast? Ganna, stop. Sit down and rest. You'll be no help to anyone if you don't get some sleep. Zalzea will kill you if you wake her up too. Uligan placed a hand on his shoulder and pulled him away from the bars. With their guard ignoring him, Ganna turned and directed all his pent-up frustration on the other man instead. How can you be so calm, Uligan? How can any of you sleep? You can't tell me that any of this is normal. Uligan shook his head and responded, his voice soft. No. It's not normal. But there is nothing we can do about it right now. All we can do is wait, and try to contact someone who will listen. Ganna threw his hands into the air and yelled. We don. Uligan's sharp glare cut his words off. Ganna glanced at the three nearby women as they slept in a pile, and Jotun, off to the side, resting with his back to the wall. He continued more in a whisper this time. We don't have time, Uligan. The darkest day is less than two days away, and the Lord Protector should already be in place by now. If we don't hurry, we'll be too late. Uligan sighed and patted Ganna's shoulder again. Yes, I know. Even so, we... Too late for what, exactly? What is it you're really planning? The loud voice cut Uligan off and caused the sleeping slate walkers to stir. From the open door, the same priest who had turned them away at the temple walked into the room, sneering down at them through the bars. When he spoke... It was no longer with the cold detachment from the temple but with audible disdain. I knew it was smart to keep you backwater yokes from the head priest. Tell me, what are your actual goals? We detected black arts in that room you destroyed, so don't think you can fool us any longer. We will not tolerate cultists of Iris in this city. 16. We leased the Kraken, pilot chapter. Jeremiah tapped the small fishbowl sitting on his desk. The tiny red octopus inside waved back at him, blowing a few bubbles. The young man sighed and stood, placed one hand on his hip, and ran his hand over his face. What am I going to do with you? He asked, not really expecting an answer. It's not like he had asked for a new pet. But what was he going to do? It's not like he could tell the old man across the hall he didn't want a pet. That would have been rude. It was a birthday gift after all, and despite his rough exterior, Jeremiah liked the old codger. Mr. Roger was the first person in the musty rundown apartment building he'd moved into that didn't speak to him like he would mug them as soon as they turned their back. Not that Jeremiah could blame them. This part of the outskirts of Prima City wasn't the safest. Then again, despite claiming to be 80 years old, Mr. Roger was a 6 feet 5 inches, 300 pounds wall of muscle while Jeremiah barely broke 5 feet 11 inches and never weighed over 180 pounds in his entire life. Despite being slightly pudgy from life as a veterinary student, the first time Jeremiah met the intimidating black man, he was more than a little ashamed to admit he feared what would happen to him. Despite his appearances though, Mr. Roger was a jolly man who more than once had helped Jeremiah out of a tough spot in the last few months. Jeremiah did his best to return the favors however he could. Good people were hard to find in this part of town, or at least learned how to keep out of sight. The neighborhood hadn't had a residential boss in nearly five years. Not since the last one was killed by a rival during the last outskirt war. In theory, any other super could have taken over and reigned in the other criminal elements. But every time they tried, the former boss's old rival would remove them. Sometimes with bribes, sometimes with threats, and sometimes with more bloody methods when either of those worked. No one knew why the old rival did not just take up the area for themselves. Maybe it was some kind of sick game, playing with the old boss even after they'd already won. Maybe the outskirt wars took too much out of their gang, and they didn't think they could hold it, 
so instead kept anyone else from taking it until they could. Whatever the reason may have been, with no boss to keep the criminal element in check and no capes patrolling this far out, the neighborhood had gone to hell. Within half a year, most of the buildings had been abandoned, and the people gone, leaving only those too weak, too old, or too poor to move anywhere else. At least that meant he had got the apartment for cheap. It was a small blessing in the chaos that had been the last four months. Jeremiah laughed at himself. Four months? Was that all it had been since his life had gone down the drain? Why did it feel so much longer? Yet only yesterday, only four months ago, he'd been a promising young student on the fast track to graduation from one of the top veterinary schools in the country. He'd lived state-of-the-art house, literally built from the ground up by his artificer older sister. They'd been living the dream. The ideal that was promised to so many people who came to Prima City seeking refuge and wealth. Oh sure, now these days the wilds weren't that bad, at least most of the time. With supers becoming more and more common over the last few centuries, especially artificers like his sister, mankind had taken its place at the top of the food chain. Now, hubs of technology and civilization can be found across every corner of the country. But occasionally, You'd still hear stories of some small town getting wiped out when an animal triggered a little too close to their walls. Or someone who thought they could cut costs on their rift dampeners, and a rift opened up in the town square. Or a hundred other things that could go wrong in a place without enough strong supers. That's why places like Prima City, as an established hero's hall, were so popular with the common man. Even if that led to rapid overpopulation and development. It always surprised Jeremiah what some people would do to feel just a little safer. His sister, and by extension, Jeremiah, were some of the lucky ones. Artificers were always in demand. After all, they're the ones who created all the technology that allowed such a mega city like Prima City to exist in the first place. As a B-rank artificer, Sarah never had to worry about finding work, even as a freelancer. People were throwing themselves at their door to hire her for various projects. As her younger brother and only family member, Jeremiah also naturally benefited. She practically raised him after their parents' death, and he never wanted for anything for as long as he could remember. Everything was perfect. He was going to graduate at the top of his class. His sister had promised to build him a state-of-the-art clinic, and he'd pay her back for everything she'd ever done for him. His future was laid out before him like a gilded carpet, and all he had to do was strode proudly toward it. Funny how life can pull that carpet out from under you without a moment's notice. They say that when something life-changing happens, your brain imprints the details in hyperfocus. Jeremiah could say for a fact that it was a load of bullcrap. He didn't remember where he was or even what he was doing when he got the news. All he could remember was feeling numb. Like his brain had shut itself off in denial. Sarah was dead. Not just dead, but killed. As a villain. The official story was that she tried to steal something from her latest employer. When they caught her, she went berserk and used her powers to escape. In response, the Heroes Hall sent a team to subdue her. If it had ended there, things would have been fine. But according to the capes who responded, his sister had resisted arrest and severely injured one of the responding supers. Under Prima City law, that automatically labeled Sarah as a villain. The ensuing fight leveled an entire city block near the outer ring, and the capes were forced to put her down. Even now, thinking of the report made Jeremiah's blood boil. What kind of bull was that? Sarah had been one of the kindest, caring people he'd known. That wasn't just his bias talking either. His older sister regularly built higher-end tech and sold it for under cost in the poorer parts of the city, just so those people could have some comforts that those more well-off hoarded. She'd even campaigned with others to help build up the outskirts and other rougher parts of town. The thought that Sarah would not only use her power to steal but purposefully hurt others was preposterous to him. He'd sooner believe that the moon was made of cheese. Many people his sister had helped had felt the same. Thousands had marched on City Hall to demand the truth and justice for Sarah, with Jeremiah leading the helm. That's when the story started. Rumors of embezzlement. Supposed loans and debts Sarah had taken on to fund various projects. Past thefts that were somehow only now coming to light. All of it was ludicrous to those who knew his sister and flimsy from a legal standpoint. But as more and more evidence appeared, whispers began and support for his sister slowly dwindled. Until near the end, only Jeremiah remained, standing in front of the courthouse, holding his sign while the surrounding crowd jeered and laughed. Posthumous trials were rare, but thanks to the nature of Sarah's crimes, and the heavy push from the megacorp she'd stolen from, Sarah's trial had turned into a sensation plastered over every news station and even the internet. 
It only took 30 minutes for the jury to reach a unanimous verdict of guilty. Just like that, Sarah Bridge, a woman once called the Saintess of the Outskirts, was labeled a Class B villain in the same category as murderers and megalomaniac psychopaths. Under Prima City law, everything she owned, her tech, her bank account, and their home was seized by the city and used to pay reparations to the victims. Not that the people whose homes and businesses were destroyed ever saw any of that, of course. Nearly 95% of it went to pay the corporation she had been working for, as it was deemed they'd suffered the greatest lose, more bullcrap. He'd tried to fight it, tried to clear his sister's name. Anyone with eyes could see what was going on. How could anyone believe any of this? But nothing worked. He was homeless, penniless, but for what was left of the allowance in his personal account. No news station would talk to him, and all of Sarah's old contacts and friends had either cut ties completely or vanished into thin air. To make matters worse, his college had called to inform him that his leave of absence had been denied for unspecified reasons. If he didn't pay the next semester's fees, all his hard work would go down the drain. Jeremiah's hand tightened around the edge of the fishbowl, and it shook. A fire burned in his chest at the memories, and his gaze became distant and glassy. The gentle touch of a tentacle wrapping around his finger broke him from his memories. Jeremiah jerked and lifted his hand, pulling the tiny creature up with him. The baby octopus, barely the size of his thumb, stroked a shallow cut that ran the length of his palm. Only then did Jeremiah notice the slightly red tinge to the water in the fishbowl and the smear of blood along the bowl's lip. He'd gripped the edge so hard it had cut into his palm, and he hadn't even noticed. That was some strong glass. Oh crap. I'm sorry, little one. Let's replace your water and then head to bed. Jeremiah said as he lifted the bowl with his free hand. A few moments later, the water was replaced, and Jeremiah's hand was wrapped. The baby octopus sat at the bottom of its fresh bowl, happily nibbling on a small shrimp. The good thing about such a tiny creature was it ate little, and Mr. Roger assured him that once the few shrimps he'd given Jeremiah ran out, it would eat just about anything. At least he didn't have to worry about feeding it. Jeremiah took a deep breath and stared at the small creature through the glass as it enjoyed its meal. He felt a little calmer, even if the smoldering sparks in his chest still threatened to consume him if he let them. Maybe Mr. Roger was right. Maybe he needed something to take his mind off things for a while. Sure, he specialized in terrestrial animals, but how hard could it be to watch over a tiny octopus? Okay, that was probably oversimplifying things, but it would be nice to think of other things for a while. Jeremiah tapped the glass. The baby octopus stopped eating and looked up at him with intelligent eyes. Several tentacles raised and waved back before the creature returned to its meal. Jeremiah stood and smiled. Yeah, maybe that would be nice, the young man softly whispered. I guess that means you need a name, doesn't it? Mr. Rogers said you were a boy, but I didn't specialize in marine biology, so what do I know? The octopus looked up at him and tilted his head. It reminded him of a hamster he had as a child before his parents had died. That memory made Jeremiah laugh, and he asked the tiny creature. How about, Billy? The baby octopus raised all its tiny tentacles and waved them around in excitement, as if it understood. Jeremiah laughed again and patted the tank. That's that then. Good night, Billy. Sleep tight. With that, Jeremiah climbed into the tiny bed in the middle of the empty apartment and reached for the small desk lamp. The last thing he saw before the light clicked off was the enormous eyes of the newly christened Billy staring at him. Several hours later, Jeremiah sat in bed and stared at the dark ceiling. Even after four months in this place, he still had trouble sleeping. Sometimes the nightmares would wake him up in the middle of the night. Sometimes it was the sound of gunshots or fighting on the streets below. Even now, the bright yellow light from the streetlight cut through the darkness of the almost empty room like a merciless blade, intent on killing Jeremiah's sleep. The curtains were too short, torn by the previous occupant for one reason or another. Jeremiah moaned and rolled in bed, pulling the cover over his head, but to no avail. He sighed and flipped on his back before reaching over to the desk Billy's bowl sat on and opened a drawer. Jeremiah rummaged around for a moment, careful not to wake the sleeping creature, before pulling out a small object. He pulled it close and held it up in the beam of light so that it was visible. It was a small metal amulet, not much bigger than Billy, and appeared to be made of two pyramids fused bottom to bottom, twice as long as wide. It hung on a thin chain, spun silently, and glistened in the light. He stared at the amulet fondly, a soft smile on his face. It was the last thing his sister had ever given him. In 
early birthday present, she had said. Even now, he could remember the letter that came with the box. Hey, dork, happy birthday. I know it's still a few months away, but I've got a big project coming up, and you know how I can get when the itch takes over, so I thought I'd give this to you now. Before you complain, I know you don't like jewelry, but I made this specifically for you, so show some appreciation. It might not look like anything special now, but I promise, this is some of my finest work yet. I can't wait to show you everything it can do. I think I'm almost more excited than you. It's locked for now though. I don't need you going and breaking it. I'll unlock it when I return home next week, and we can review everything. Till then, keep staring at it, and wonder what mysteries and secrets it holds. Ha 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 ha. Signed, your loving provider and mistress supreme, Sarah. Jeremiah laughed to himself, and wiped away a tear. Sarah had always been a little, odd, but she'd always been there for him. What more could he have asked the family? Now this tiny, plain-looking amulet was all he had left of her. The only reason even that hadn't been taken from him was because no one knew it existed. He'd been waiting to show it off to his friends until after Sarah unlocked it. There was no telling what the thing actually did. Knowing her, it could have been anything for a microcomputer better than anything on the public market. To some kind of prank holographic display that made him look like a monkey. He didn't want to think she'd give him something like that for his birthday. But there had been the cake incident on his twelfth birthday. His friends had never let him live that one down. Better safe than sorry. But of course, Sarah had never returned. Maybe someone more callous would have considered selling it. After all, despite how plain it looked, it should have still been a piece of B-rank technology, right? It would have been worth something to someone, maybe even enough to get back on his feet. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. It was the last piece of Sarah he had, and he couldn't bear to part with it. Not yet. Not until he finished what he had to do. Silently, he slipped the chain around his neck and let the cool metal of the amulet rest against his chest. Jeremiah slowly drifted off to sleep with the sound of his beating heart in his ears, and the icy chill of the amulet against bare skin. Billy opened his eyes and stared out of his tank. His eyes focused on the nice shrimp man sleeping on his bed. Not that the tiny octopus knew what a tank or bed was. He was smart, but he was only a week old, dang it. Stop expecting so much from him. The tiny octopus stirred the water as he stretched out his mighty tentacles and slid out of the comfy cave the nice shrimp man had built him. It was still dark out, but that didn't bother Billy much. His kind could see quite well, even in the dim light. All the better to capture unwitting prey in the murky depths. Like shrimp. Shrimp was tasty. Billy shook his head and cleared his mind of food, for now. He had things he needed to do. Silently, Billy stretched his tentacles up and out of the water, then pulled himself over the bowl's edge. He plopped down over the edge and landed on the desk before pulling himself along the surface, leaving a water trail as he went. Billy had to be quick about this. He didn't like it up here in the air dash. It was much too dry for his liking. Once he reached the edge, he stretched with all his might and just barely grabbed onto the thin cloth sheet covering the thin mattress with the sucker. He then leapt the rest of the way and pulled himself onto the shrimp man's bed. Billy waved his tentacles in the air. Success. Celebration cut short. Billy climbed on top of the snoring shrimp man's chest. The tiny octopus stared down at the sleeping man with large, intelligent eyes for a long moment. Did he really want to do this? Uncle Roger had said it was his choice. No one would force him. But the tiny octopus also understood this wasn't something to take lightly. He might have only been a week old, but the memories and instincts buried deep in his genes told him that once he made this choice, there was no going back. Billy considered and thought hard. Memories flashed in his mind of the past few days. Of the shrimp man's warm smile. The gentle finger that petted his head. Of the stories the man told him while he ate. Was this really something he wanted to do now? The memories in his genes warned him how humans could be. How fickle and cruel they were sometimes. How even the kindest soul might rot and burn if given the time or reason. Did he want to take the chance? Uncle Roger said that if you want to know a person's true nature, you should look into their eyes. Their eyes would never lie. So what did the shrimp man's eyes tell him? Billy remembered the look in the shrimp man's eyes before they went to bed. How it had burned with fury and rage that scared the tiny creature. Yet he also remembered the sadness in those same eyes. A deep pain that made the little octopus's heart hurt too. Uncle Roger had given Billy to the shrimp man for a reason, right? Maybe he'd seen those eyes too and thought Billy could help. Who was Billy to argue with Uncle Roger? Billy nodded, his decision made. Suddenly the room was filled with a quiet light. Dozens of tiny blue rings covered Billy's body, 
flickering and casting shadows on the walls. The shadows and light played, dancing in a way that made it appear like the room had been cast into the ocean's depths. After a moment, the light dimmed, and the blue rings covering Billy's body softened until they were only lightly glowing. The ring wiggled around until they split, forming dozens of tiny lines that wiggled and swirled, forming various mystical patterns and shapes. Slowly, some patterns converged on one of his tentacles, and when Billy touched the shrimp man's chest then slipped off and onto the human's skin, like ink moving from page to page, the glowing patterns swirled and wiggled on the human skin before converging just over his heart. The glow lines soon formed into the image of a bright star, eight long beams of light extending from its center. It flashed once, then faded away. Billy nodded his head and turned to make the daunting trip back to his bowl when a voice cut through the darkness. Billy froze, fearing he'd been caught, but it didn't sound like the shrimp man. Forward slash forward slash energy signature detected. Beginning analysis. Forward slash forward slash. The pointy metal object sitting on the shrimp man's chest spoke in a flat, cold, feminine voice before vibrating. The invisible mark on the shrimp man's heart lit up once more, and some of the blue lines broke off and flew into the metal object. Billy waved several tentacles in a panic. Wait, it wasn't supposed to do that. However, the metal object didn't care, and it absorbed the blue lights before falling still. Billy slowly stretched out a tentacle to poke it, but before he made contact, the metal object shook, then elongated lengthwise, splitting into several spinning, floating square rings, tethered together at the middle with blue light. Billy pulled back quickly, crawling away and hiding under the thin sheet. From under the covers, Billy heard it speak. Forward slash forward slash analyzing. Electric. Atomic. Mutagenic. Psionic. Cosmic. Key. Spirit. Ding. Energy signature identified. All erroneous signatures discarded. Checking user ID. Soul marker recognized. Personal mana signature recorded. Welcome user, Jeremiah Bridge. Please submit data for your custom system experience. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash please submit details. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash please submit details. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash please submit details. Forward slash forward slash. Billy peeked out of the covers and stared at the object just floating there. Not seeing it do anything more, the tiny creature gathered its courage and slipped out of the covers. He approached slowly and stared. The floating metal energy thief just floated there, repeating the same thing over and over. Did, did it want something? Billy carefully reached out a tentacle and lightly tapped the metal object. His tentacle made contact, and the object glowed blue. Billy panicked and tried to pull away, only to find he couldn't move. His tiny heart beat fast. He could only listen as the metal object spoke again. Forward slash forward slash mana signature recognized. Please state your desire. User, Jeremiah Bridge forward slash forward slash. Who was that? Billy was Billy, you glowing meanie. Again it spoke. Forward slash forward slash please state your desire. Forward slash forward slash. Desire? Did it want to know what he wanted? Would, would it let him go if it told the thing? Billy's mind wandered to things he wanted. Images of shrimp man cleaning his tank. Of shrimp man giving him tasty shrimp. Of shrimp man playing with Billy and teaching him things. Slowly, the tiny octopus's beating heart slowed, replaced with a warm feeling that made him happy. The metal object stopped glowing, and Billy's tentacle fell away. The metal object then spoke again, forward slash forward slash brainwaves recognized, compiling data, error, gathered brain activity is incongruent with records, data corrupted, attempting connection to primary servers, warning, primary service compromised, attempting connection to secondary servers, warning, compromised, forward slash forward slash, forward slash forward slash warning, Triner service compromised, forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, quaternary servers compromised. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, canary servers. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, centenary. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, septenary. Forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash warning, forward slash forward slash. Forward slash forward slash conditions met. Emergency protocol initiated. Connecting to transdimensional backup. Connecting. Connecting. Connection successful. Beginning data debugging. Debugging complete. Beginning analysis. 
forward slash forward slash. Billy had no idea what it was saying. His head hurt just thinking about most of the words. The metal object grew quiet for a long time, long enough that Billy started making his way back to his bowl, having grown sleepy. He just reached the desk when the metal object spoke again. Forward slash forward slash analysis complete. Custom system compiling. Ding. Compiling complete. Please stand by for Mystic Menagerie. System integration. Forward slash forward slash. The metal object then spoke in a voice that sounded the same, but was far kinder and less flat than it had used so far. Hey Jerry, you might want to lie down for this part. This is going to hurt. The metal object then clicked shut, returning to its original shape, and fell back to the shrimp man's chest. Billy stared, wondering if it was finally over. The metal object wiggled for a few seconds before sprouting dozens of metal tentacles of its own. Gasp, had it been a friend all along? Nothing with that many tentacles could ever be someone bad. Billy raised his own tentacles and waved them. His new best friend waved back. Billy's naive, childlike trust was instantly shattered the next moment. However, as his metal friend's tentacles stiffened, then plunged into the nice shrimp man's chest all at once. For the first time in weeks, Jeremiah had a good dream. He couldn't remember the details in that strange, dreamlike way, but he remembered Sarah's voice. It was good to hear it again. He'd started to forget as time passed, which only worsened his wild mood swings. Hearing her voice again after so long had been like a soothing bomb to his soul, even if he knew it was just a dream. Dream Sarah turned and looked at Jeremiah. He couldn't remember what she said, but she hugged him warmly, and the young man wept. Holding him, she gently whispered something that cut through the dream fog. Hey Jerry, you might want to lie down for this part. Ah herg! Jeremiah woke from the dream, screaming and clawing at his chest. A third a third a third a third. The pain overwhelmed all of his other scenes as he felt, something, burrowing its way into his chest. He clawed at the thing but found no grip against the cold, twisting, blood-covered metal. All he could do was writhe and squirm and scream. After what could have been hours or seconds, the pain stopped suddenly. Time was hard to tell while in that fog of agony. Jeremiah collapsed in his bed, breathing hard, covered in sweat and blood. He lay there for an undeterminable amount of time, the stark contrast between mind-breaking pain and absolute stillness overloading his mind and refusing to let thoughts form. After a moment, he reached up a shaking, blood-covered hand to touch his chest and felt metal. Jeremiah's heart raced as he shot up in bed, wiping away what blood he could with the stained sheets, and stared down at his chest, gobsmacked. In the middle of his chest, right above his sternum, a small metal rhombus was embedded into his flesh. His sister's amulet. Jeremiah gently poked it a few times, his brain refusing to process what he saw. After a moment, he whispered into the darkness. What the hell, Sarah? What is this thing? What did you do to me? His thoughts were cut off the next moment by a heavy pounding on his door as a deep baritone voice yelled from the other side. Jeremiah! Jeremiah! Answer me, lad! Jeremiah scrambled to his feet, wiped as much of the blood away as he could, and rushed to the door as the voice continued. I'm coming in, boy! You better not be dead on me, Jeremiah called out before the man on the other side could break his door down. I'm coming, just, just give me a second. Jeremiah rushed back to his bed, pulled one of the cleaner sheets off, and wrapped it around himself before running back to the door and throwing it open. Mr. Rogers' giant frame filled his doorway, and if the braced shoulder said anything, he'd, in fact, been only seconds away from breaking down the cheap plywood door. The large old man paused and turned to look at Jeremiah. The dim hallway lights cast everything in shadow, and Jeremiah could barely make out the dark-skinned man's deep frown. He placed a hand as big as Jeremiah's head on the young man's shoulder and asked in a worried tone, Boy, are you alright? I heard the screaming from across the hall. What happened? Jeremiah tried to laugh it off, but his voice broke as it spoke. ITIT -it was nothing, Mr. Roger, just a bad dream, I promise. Thanks for checking up on me like that. Sorry if I woke you, Mr. Roger's frown deepened and he asked. Are you sure, lad? Those were some mighty loud wails for nothing more than some night terrors. Jeremiah nodded and answered. Yes, sir, I'm sure. Again, thanks for checking on me. Mr. Roger pulled his hand back and stood straight. The frown never left his face, but he nodded anyway as he spoke. I see. In that case, I'll leave you be then. I'm glad to see you're all right, Jeremiah. Just remember though, lad, whatever brought you here, to this point of your life, you're one of us now. People of the outskirts, we've got to look after each other, you hear? No one else will. So if you ever need anything, don't hesitate to ask. Jeremiah opened his mouth, 
but the words caught in his throat. He closed it and swallowed before looking down at the floor and nodding. Softly he whispered, I, I will. Thank you, sir. Mr. Roger grinned and turned, waving behind him. Good night, Jeremiah. Try to get some sleep. Jeremiah nodded and closed the door. The young man stood in front of his door for a long moment, then breathed. He didn't enjoy lying to Mr. Roger. The man had been nothing but kind to him since he'd arrived. But honestly, what was he going to tell him? That the last piece of rogue technology from his dead sister, who'd been condemned as a powerful villain only a few months prior, had burrowed itself into his body for some unknown reason? He could already see how that would go. The man would likely insist on taking him to the hospital to get the device examined. The hospital would inform the city, and he would either be arrested for being in possession of stolen super tech, or it would be cut out of him and taken away. Worst case scenario, maybe they'd say he'd gone crazy, like his sister, and he'd be put down and dissected. Yeah, there was no way he was telling anyone about this until he understood what the hell the amulet had done to him, or was doing. He didn't know anymore. Mr. Rogers grin slipped as he stared at Jeremiah's closed door. From down the hall, another door opened, and a middle-aged woman in a nightgown walked out, two small heads peeking out from behind the door beside her. She called out to him, her voice carrying far in the quiet hallway. So? What's the news, David? Is he dead? I told you this would be a bad idea. If someone finds out, David, Davy, Roger waved his massive hand back and forth as he answered. No, no, Martha, false alarm. The lad just had some night terrors is all. Nothing to worry about. The woman, Martha, frowned and narrowed her eyes before sighing and shrugging. She spoke in a tired voice. If you say so. Never heard nightmares that bad though. And my youngins jump at tiny bugs. If it's nothing, it's nothing dot. The youngest child behind the door pointed at Martha and spoke, offended. Hey, they were not tiny. They were, wait. Martha shooed the children in the door and closed it behind her, cutting off the child. David turned and made his way to his own apartment. As he did, he raised his hand and stared at the small splotches of fresh blood staining them. The blood sparkled blue for a brief moment, almost undetectable if one didn't know what to look for. He smiled lightly, then wiped his hands clean on his shirt and opened the door, muttering to the empty hallway. Yeah, nothing to worry about, then walked inside, shutting the door behind him. It took Jeremiah 20 minutes to clean up the mess, but it got done. No point in sleeping in blood-soaked sheets, after all. He'd spent another 10 minutes staring at himself in the grimy mirror, no matter how long he stared. However, no answers came. Eventually, he cleaned himself off, left the tiny bathroom, and returned to bed. Walking back to his bed, he noticed movement in Billy's bowl. Jeremiah turned his attention to the bowl to see the baby octopus staring back at him. Jeremiah smiled and knelt down, placing one finger on the glass as Billy placed the tentacle on the other side. Hey there, little guy, he said. Did I wake you? I'm sorry. How about we head back to bed now, huh? Jeremiah squinted his eyes at the tiny creature and frowned. Why did it look like Billy had a fuzzy outline? Was the bowl dirty? He'd just cleaned it, though. He rubbed the glass's surface, seeing if he'd missed a spot, but the outline persisted. In fact, it seemed to follow Billy as the tiny creature moved. Strange. Jeremiah rubbed his eyes, thinking maybe something was in them, and when that didn't work, he focused on the outline, trying to determine what it was he was seeing. Whoa! Jeremiah nearly fell backward as something popped into view in front of his eyes. Equals 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 Name Billy Species Polaris Kraken Newborn Age 0 years, 0 months, 1 week, 3 days. Rank, SS0 to 01. Rarity, mythical. Pedigree, 8 stars. Ecology, these mythical creatures, also called the Heralds of the Guiding Star. Polaris Krakens, are said to lead wayward ships to safety during harsh storms with no stars visible. Its glowing light, vast power, and gentle nature have made it a deity of protection and an omen of safety and good luck for sailors across millennia. But woe unto the fool who tempts these gentle giants' goodwill and kind nature, for even if the creature may forgive, the sea itself does not take kindly to the mistreatment of one of her favorite children. As the saying goes, the lost ship abandoned by its guiding star will never find shore again.
equals 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 Jeremiah could only stare in shock at the strange white screen in front of him. What the hell? 12. Book 1. Lesson 47. It's good to have friends in high places. The sneering priest shook his head and pointed toward the blank-faced Jotun as he spoke. What's with that look? I would think a guardian would have had better control over his flock. Then again I guess that was asking too much of a barbarian. Yes I remember you Jotun. Given the ruckus you caused all those years ago, how would I not? Some no-name barbarian appears from nowhere, only to weasel his way into the Guardian Academy. Even after all this time, people still talk about how you cheated to snatch your graduation position away from those more deserving. In response, Jotun stood taller and glared down at the priest through the bars. Is that what this is? Some petty noble upset he was beaten in a fair duel years ago? I'd have thought a few decades in the temple should have taught you a mode of humbleness, Priest Tarkhan. The priest's face went red and his eyes bulged but quickly returned to a calm sneer. Deny it all you wish. Your lies won't help you this time. After hearing the rumors of what you did to my cousin when you arrived yesterday, I knew I made the right choice in protecting the head priest from your poisonous tongue. Then, after all that, you have the gall to attack a temple messenger? You've dug your own grave this time, guardian, and I'll happily see you buried in it. Ganbader pushed himself up against the bars beside Jotun and yelled, What messenger? We told you we were the ones attacked. Tarkhan turned to Ganbader and sneered. Humph, so you say. Yet our real guardians found no bodies, equipment, or even traces of this black fire that you claim consumed them. On the other hand, Tarkhan turned and gestured to the nearby doorway. A young man covered in blood-stained bandages entered the room. He walked with a slight limp, slowly, each step seeming to be a struggle. Upon seeing the slade walkers in the cell, he jumped, hiding behind the priest as if afraid they could reach him from the bars. Tarkhan patted the young man on his shoulder and turned back to the slate walkers, frowning. We have eyewitnesses that will attest to seeing the Masega enter the inn, only to come running out several minutes later, covered in blood and yelling for help. Had a guardian patrol not passed by at that moment, I shuddered to think what you ruffians would have done to him. Ganbader pointed at the messenger and yelled, his face turning red. That's all crap. We've never seen this man in our lives. Tarkhan rolled his eyes and responded. Right. As if that's not something a child caught with his hand in the honeypot would say. But then I wouldn't expect critical thinking from someone associated with such company. Tarkhan turned his narrowed eyes to Jotun, frowning. The priest turned to leave but spoke over his shoulder. Now all that's left is to wait for the innkeeper to awaken and confirm the story. I was hoping to have you lot in a noose by the end of the day. But lucky for you, the healer doesn't expect the man to wake for a few days more. Until then, you can spend the darkest night in a cell. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have more important matters to attend to. As he moved to leave, another voice called out from in the cell. Priest Tarkhan, whatever grievances you might have against us, you're not a stupid man. Surely you can see that something doesn't quite add up here? Tarkhan paused and turned to see a freshly awoken Kalik walk to the bars. He narrowed his eyes and responded. Don't think your adventure mind games will work on me, grass reader. I've heard quite a bit about you and you're just as bad as the barbarian. Don't think the accords will keep you safe. I'll be speaking with the grass reader's council personally. Kalik shook her head and folded her arms. That's a mistake, priest Tarkhan, and you know it. If head priest Erdin heard how, Tarkhan took several steps forward, pointing at the grass reader as a vein pulsed on the side of his neck. Head priest Erdin won't hear of this, of any of this. He is a far busier man than most, and an unfamiliar voice called out behind the door, cutting the priest off. And why exactly wouldn't I hear about this, Priest Tarkhan? Tarkhan froze, his eyes wide. Slowly, he turned and came face to face with an older man wearing ornate robes. The head priest was the picture of a kindly old grandfather whose wrinkled face told the story of a man more accustomed to laughing than otherwise. Yet the gentle smile and squinting eyes sent Priest Tarkhan shivering. Priest Tarkhan bowed deeply and spoke in a stuttering voice. Yes, sir, why are you H here? You don't and need to concern yourself with these criminals. I can assure you, everything is well in hand. Head priest Erdin stroked his short, gray beard and stared down at the shaking priest. His smile slipped into a frown, and his eyes opened slightly, revealing concentric black and white rings. When he spoke, his voice was flat. You know I don't like being kept out of the loop, Tarkhan. Please explain to me why you thought I would ignore allegations of one of our messengers being attacked? The old man turned and smiled fatherly at the injured. Messenger. 
The young man turned away and hid behind Tarkhan. Tarkhan didn't bother to rise as he spoke. Head priest, I didn't intend to overstep my boundaries. With the darkest night approaching, I only assumed that you would be far too busy to hear out such outrageous claims from such dubious origin. Head priest Erdan nodded but asked in response. That's true. This time of the year is quite busy. This year, more so than most. However, I distinctly remember that any information regarding the missing child was to be brought to me immediately, regardless of how minor it might seem. Yes? That got Tarka's attention, and the priest stood, pointing as he cried. Sir, you can't possibly trust anything a barbarian like this has to say, let alone any of his compatriots. His kind are why we were forced to these prairies in the first place. Head priest Erdan tilted his head and raised a brow, then asked. Oh? And why would I not want to hear from the messengers sent by our own patron? Tarka stuttered, her brow furrowing as if unable to fully process the head priest's words. Head priest Erdan turned and called out behind him. These are your companions, correct, my new friend? Or has this old fool embarrassed himself? A new figure walked into the room and nodded his head, the same concentric black and white rings as the head priest staring daggers into priest Tarka. His eyes only flickered over for a moment to the people in the cell before he spoke. Yes, sir, that's them. Head priest Erdan nodded his head in understanding, while priest Tarka could only stare at the young man's eyes, his mouth opening and closing as if trying to speak, but no words would form. Ganvader was the one to break that silence as he pushed himself up against the bars, grinning ear to ear as he laughed and yelled, Why you to you? About time you woke up, you lazy bum. Several hours earlier, you two slowly woke from a dream he couldn't quite remember, of places and things he'd never seen or imagined before. They were strange dreams filled with equal parts wonder, excitement, and soul-chilling sorrow. Even now, in this liminal place between wakening and dreaming, he could feel that mind-numbing chill weight heavy on his soul. As if all sparks of warmth and joy had long faded, leaving cold, barren stone in its place. Only the tiny embers hiding under the ash kept him from totally freezing over kept him from giving in to the call of lifeless, unmoving stone. And then, it was gone. He was awake. You two shot up in bed with a yell, reaching out for something he didn't fully remember. His heart pounded painfully in his chest, and hot tears rolled down his cheek. Slowly, reality reasserted itself. You two looked around the room, unsure of where he was. The last thing he remembered was fighting the beast lord. he just activated his formation after the Akla pup and the strange spirit beast had appeared. They had the beast lord trounced, but then, he raised a shaking hand to his chest, feeling the bandages neatly wrapped there. No, no, that wasn't quite right either. There was more, he knew, but it was all hazy and distorted. He couldn't rightly distinguish between what had been real and what had been a dream. Even so, one thing stood out in his memory as clear as day. A face. The face of a woman beautiful beyond words. A face touched by the sun, but perfect as if carved from pure marble by the hands of a master artist. And those eyes, deep, piercing eyes unlike anything he'd ever seen before, more gemstone than anything, yet alien, with concentric black and white rings of equal size converging into a pupil so black he felt like they had no bottom. The sound of the door opening broke him from his daydreaming as an older woman walked in carrying a tray. Seeing you two sitting up, the woman jumped but smiled brightly as she spoke. You're awake! Good! That's good! We thought you might be out for a few days more, Sonny. Don't see many civilians come in with injuries as bad as yours. Lay back, lay back, don't want to open up your wounds now. The woman walked forward with her tray, grinning ear to ear. I'll let the doctor know you're awake, and then we can see about getting you some food. How does? You two turned to look at the woman, and she froze. She stared at the young man for a moment. Her mouth hung open, cut off midward, and her eyes widened. The tray slipped from her hands and clattered to the floor medical tools and fresh bandages skidding across the floor. The woman turned and bolted for the door, yelling at the top of her lungs. Doctor! Doctor! Head priest Erdin sat at his desk and continued to tackle the seemingly never-ending pile of paperwork stacked on one side. Long were the days when he was a simple priest, tending to the flock and doing simple chores. No, now every stroke of his pen had the potential to shake entire cities and decide the fate of countless souls. The Jade Walkers were only a middling city on the scale of the Radiant Sea and even a smaller one compared to some of the most prosperous cities on the Skybreaker continent. That didn't mean being the spiritual leader for the entire city was easy, however. That wasn't even considering the dozens of towns and villages under the Jade Walker banner, each with their own individual problems and needs. 
It didn't help that despite being recognized by the general public as a religion, the temple of the Prima operated more like a sect or clan, just one where their sect leaders happened to be the physical manifestation of natural forces. That meant all the drama, squabbling, and competition between the Prima factions that came along with it. Not that the Prima interacted with the mortal world much at all, to begin with. Only Finghua the Forge King, Lord of Embers, remained active, though only to endlessly demand tribute from his followers to work on some grand project that only the higher-ups of the temple even had an inkling about the details of. The Herald of Storms had little contact with mortals to begin with. For good reasons, too, as both his temper and his blessing could be as destructive as his namesake. While the sleeping child of the deep preferred her never-ending war under the waves rather than dealing with the politics and schemes of the surface world. As for his own hearth mother, well, it had been millennia since she'd been called that, instead of the mother of hearth and home. Now these days she was more likely to be addressed as Queen of the Underworld, or the Lady of Cold Stone. No one knew what caused such a drastic shift in their patron, what had caused all the warmth she'd once had for her people to flicker and die. If her siblings knew, none would say. Many in the temple looked to take after their patron and be shiny beacons of apathetic stoicism unwavering and undaunted by any outside force. Yet just as many sought to keep the old ways, to remember when their faction sought not to be the ever-unchanging stone but the sheltering and protecting brick, the unmovable wall that stood between an uncaring world and its people, the warm hearth that welcomed you home after a long journey. Head Priest Erdin shook his head and stared down at the paper that had sat and signed on his desk for several minutes. He'd let his mind wander again. He found it was happening more and more lately. Even as a peak, Six Circle, Mage, roughly equivalent to a Golden Spirit, Cultivator, Head Priest Erdin found himself starting to feel the tug of old age. He'd known he'd risked falling behind the curve when he took this position in the Radiant Sea almost a century ago, but how he missed the days when he could stand without clicking. Erdin put down his pen and stretched his old bones. Maybe it was time he finally thought about retiring. The senior priest had been nagging him about his successor for a while now, and he had to admit, having the time to do some proper mage work for once was appealing. He glanced over at the enormous pile of papers he could have sworn were a few sheets larger than the last time he looked inside. Then again, he still had so. The door to head priest Erdin's office slammed open, and a young priest stumbled in, gasping for breath, his otherwise neat stone gray robes ruffled and sweat stained. H head heave head priest huff Erdin. Head priest Erdin shot to his feet and moved to help the man. What? What happened, my boy? The priest held out a hand, trying to check his breath. When he did, he pointed down the hall and said in gasping breaths, The gasp media wing. A few moments of light jogging later, head priest Erdin rounded the corner to find a swarm of priests and acolytes crowding the hall, all trying to push their way in or see something inside. He spent a moment trying to politely push his way through, to no avail. The head priest frowned and stepped back before clearing his throat. Ahem. The sound washed over the crowd like a wave jostling a few and nearly toppling some of the younger acolytes. The crowd grew silent and turned, staring at the frowning head priest with wide eyes. As one, they bowed and scattered on the wind, leaving only a few ruffled-looking senior priests standing in the doorway. Head priest Erdin sighed and shook his head. As the head priest approached, the guarding priests bowed and let him through. Head priest Erdin walked through the doorway to see a different crowd this time. A small mix of doctors, nurses, and priests surrounded a young man sitting on the bed. The nurses poked and prodded the young man, taking various samples or changing his bandages, while the doctor shone a beam of light from his finger into the boy's eyes, peering at something. Hearing him approach, the doctor turned and smiled, saying, Ah, uh, Head Priest Erdin, I'm glad you could make it so quickly. I think you need to see this. Head Priest Erdin raised an eyebrow and tilted his head. See what? What was so wrong with the boy that they had to pull him away from paperwork to deal with? He didn't look like he was dying. Head priest Erdin moved closer, and the boy turned to look at him. The head priest's eyes shot open wide, and he froze. That was when two pairs of matching concentric black and white ringed eyes met each other for the first time. Looking back many years later, head priest Erdin would realize it was also that moment the rusting gears of a clock that had laid dormant for millennia began to move once more. 17. Book 1. Lesson 48. Even AIs make mistakes. Roughly the same time that the head priest was meeting with the slate walkers, Alpha blazed across the prairies heading toward the large storm off in the distance. As he plowed through the thick grass, Flight of the Valkyries, blared from several external speakers, 
breaking the otherwise eerie silence. Beside the TWP, a lone figure raced on the wind. The masked figure, who'd introduced themselves as only number seven, managed to keep up with the blistering speeding of the Tov's travel mode somehow. How they were doing it, Alpha wasn't sure. He could see that it had something to do with the arrays carved into their leg armor, given the energy they were giving off. Yet he couldn't detect any crystal, or even a siphoning spiral anywhere in the design, even after multiple scans. Could it all be internal? If so, why? Even if it was to hide vulnerable components, why have anything visible then? Given what he'd observed, he doubted Number 7's equipment was of higher quality, or more sophisticated than his own drone. So what was different? If that wasn't surprising enough, Number 7 had enough breath to speak over the loud music. Is all of that really necessary? Number 7 yelled. Alpha chuckled and cut off the music as he answered them. Yep, Number 7 sighed and asked. Why announce our presence like that? Didn't you plan to stake out the location and wait for backup? Alpha came to a skidding halt, turned to his mysterious companion, and spoke. Well, plans change. They're moving the child as we speak. I don't know what's up with that storm or why they're headed there, but it can't be anything good. Besides, they already know we're here. Why not make an entrance? Number 7 stopped next to Alpha, showing little sign they just run several dozen miles at high speeds. The featureless mask turned and stared at Alpha as they spoke in that same toneless voice. They know you're here. Charging through the front door wasn't part of the deal. I'm still skeptical you can even get a reading with all the FHA at dollar JH at in the area. Alpha shrugged, a rather awkward movement with the TWP, as he responded. Look, a deal's a deal. You help me find the child, and I'll help you find your targets. It's a win-win for everyone. How that happens doesn't matter, the result is the same. Number 7 folded their arms and countered. Maybe not to you, but I have a reputation to uphold. If my target gets spooked and makes a break for it, there's no telling how long it will take to track them down again. Alpha laughed and responded. Well, you should worry too much about that. Number 7 frowned under their mask and asked. What do you? The ground rumbled beneath them. The ground bulged upward a few dozen meters away, and several figures emerged. Three were identical. Large, hulking mounds of stone and soil, crushed together in a vaguely humanoid shape. From between the gaps in the stone, a deep swirling black fog leaked out, gently falling to the ground and dissipating. In front of the three rocky humanoids stood two human men, the first Alpha had never seen before. He was a taller, older man in a fine suit. Despite looking old enough to be the other man's grandfather, the older man stood straight with his hands clasped behind his back. He was the absolute picture of the gentlemanly butler type popular with the Federation's more well-off. Down to the disapproving glare he shot them from over his nose. The second Alpha recognized. It was the same young man who'd gifted him the large heart crystal not too long ago. His ever-present cheery smile was gone, however, replaced with a dark frown. Tugusler stepped forward and reached into his sleeve, pulling out a wasp drone, pinched between his fingers. He then addressed Alpha in a flat tone. I assume this insect is yours, Lord Protector? I'm not sure how you slipped this past my personal defenses, but some would take it as an insult that you would attempt to spy so openly. Is this how you track the child as well? The wasp sprang to life, melting and slipping out of the man's grasp before reforming and flying to Alpha. It landed on the TWP and melted into his nanite skin while Alpha responded. Trade secret, I'm afraid. Then again, everyone in this place keeps falling for the same trick, so why bother changing a good thing? Tugusler's frown deepened, and he turned his attention to number 7. The frown morphed into a sneer as he gave a chuckle. I must admit... I'm surprised to see one of the camp's hunting dogs working with someone. I was under the impression your kind preferred not to share their prey. Or did you learn not to bite off more than you can chew last time? Are you going to run away with your tail between your legs again? Alpha turned his optic sensor to stare at number 7. Had they already attempted to get close, only to fail? That would explain why they knew the area and why they were so willing to work with Alpha. Still, Alpha didn't like not having all the information. Number 7 folded their arms and responded to Tugusler with just as much venom. You and the priestess can honestly have expected the camp to ignore being stabbed in the back, yes? Not even the five great pillars are brave enough to make fools out of the camp in such a manner. What makes you think you're any different? The young man threw his head back and laughed, wiping away a tear. Looking back toward number 7, he grinned from ear to ear. Tugusler snapped, and the old butler-looking man walked forward, handing him a large, cantaloupe-sized orb. The orb appeared made of crystal or glass, but the inside swirled with dark colors. One moment it looked like it was filled with viscous oil, reflecting the dim light of the area in a rainbow sheen. 
The next, it was filled with choking black clouds that rolled and flashed like those above the distant temple. The man held out the orb before him and gazed into it longingly, his words soft. Tell me, Camp Dog, have you ever wondered what the Radiant Sea truly is? I would not expect the Lord Protector to have any guess, being new to this place. But the camp has made nearly as many attempts to gain a foothold here as the larger clans and sections. He turned to number seven and grinned before continuing. Why is the spirit energy of this place so chaotic? Why does it suppress our power so much? What is it about these lands that rebuff even the most powerful of this world from just stripping it clean of all its treasures? What aren't we being told? Thick black smoke began pouring from the orb like a waterfall. It pulled at the man's feet and started spreading all around them. There are theories, of course. Some say it's a natural formation. Some claim it's a trap laid by an ancient celestial dash. Others think it results from conflicting leylands and foolish tampering by those who didn't know better. The thick, ankle-deep fog suddenly shot backward at high speed, covering the prairies behind Tegusler for several hundred meters. What if I were to tell you all of those were right? Yet, none of them? At least not in full. What if I were to tell you that the Radiant Sea wasn't just some random formation or some natural trap for the greedy and foolish? What if I were to tell you it was a prison? A seal purposefully placed and maliciously designed. The ground once more shook, this time far more violently. Then, from the black smoke-covered prairies, figures rose from the earth. Not just a few, but thousands or even tens of thousands. They came in various shapes and forms, some more humanoid and small, while others were beast-like and as larger, or even larger, than the TWP. Some were hulking masses of crushed stone and soil like the smoky behemoths behind Tegusler while others appeared like withered, desiccated corpses made of little more than skin and bone. The most numerous were the giant penguins, making up easily 40% of the horde. Alpha stared at the sudden army, unsure of how to process the image. First space chickens, then man-eating penguins, and magic lions, now bloody zombies? Yeah, just screw every damn thing about this world. The young man threw his arms out and laughed. You asked why we thought we could get away with crossing your pathetic camp? Here is your answer, dog. Why would we fear you? Why would we fear any power in this puny world when we have the mistress at our backs? Number seven swore and drew their weapon, a thin rapier-like blade, and yelled clear panic in their voice for the first time. Blood hell, you're cultists. Do you honestly think anyone will let you get away with this? The accords, his sharp teeth bared, to Gussler snarled at number seven. The accords mean nothing in front of truth of this world. His face smoothed over, and the calm visage returned. Besides, it's already too late to stop it. Soon the seal will be broken, and the darkness sleeping under the radiant sea will be awoken. It will wash over this world like an unending tide and consume it whole. Once this world is dead and rotting in its shell, like a hatching egg, the last barrier will crumble, and our mistress will spread her blessing to the sister above, then to the worlds beyond. Number seven took a step back, shaking their head. You're insane! Tugusler laughed again and shook his own head. No. I've seen what real power looks like. Here, let me show you. Tugusler man handed the orb to the man in the suit. The butler-looking man bowed, then turned and laced his hands, holding the orb between them with his palms up. Space around the orb pulsed, and it glowed slightly. Smoke began pouring out once more, thicker than before. Instead of spreading like it had for the young man, the smoke swirled around the suited man, clinging to him. Before it fully enveloped him, Alpha could see the old man's features starting to warp and deform. The man was gone in less than a second, replaced by a vaguely human-shaped cloud of rolling black smoke. At its center, the black orb pulsed with bright black light. Tugusler again threw his arms out and stared in awe as the figure grew with each passing moment. With a laugh, he yelled out as if proclaiming to the world itself. Behold! Behold and tremble at the might of, yes yeah, screw that! Bang! A single thunderclap cut Tugusler's words off as a ten pounds iron rod traveling Mach 10 slammed into the center of the stormy giant. It impacted the glowing orb with an accuracy only an AI could achieve, as a dark barrier appeared around it. Its barrier held for the briefest moments before caving inward with the sound of broken glass. The iron rod continued unhindered and struck the orb. The orb, and several meters of smoke surrounding it, vanished in the blink of an eye. Less than a second later, the rod slammed into the building wall, far off into the distance, throwing up a cloud of dust. Like mist in the morning sun, the cloud of smoke surrounding the figure quickly evaporated revealing a grotesque, half-formed thing. What Alpha could only assume had once been the old man stood straight for a moment, staring down at the gaping hole as wide as the old man had once been tall. 
The thing turned and bowed to Alpha before collapsing into a disgusting slurry of malformed flesh and bone. Number 7 and the young man watched, dumbfounded. To Gussler, in particular, had frozen mid-laugh, his arms stretched out and his eyes wide. Slowly, he turned his head toward Alpha, only to notice a new addition to the AI's form. A large, square-shaped barrel rested on his back, still crackling with electricity as the end of the barrel warped the air from the sheer heat radiating off it. The B-55 Vijaya had been described as the Railjack's little brother, as its conception and overall design took heavy inspiration from the weapon. Originally envisioned as an orbital bombardment platform for use on cruisers, Alpha had tweaked the design for atmospheric use. Compared to weapons of mass destruction like the Railjack or Gungner, the B-55 Vijaya lost in power, range, and speed by a large margin. But that didn't mean it didn't pack a devastating punch. In fact, the rail cannon had come to be something like the top's primary heavy gun, when against larger targets the small rail turrets couldn't really deal with. In his words, it was his solution to big problems you needed solving now. But when he didn't want to deal with the cleanup or cost, a 10 pounds iron rod was cheaper than the expensive alloy needed for the rail jack to achieve its insane velocity and far cheaper than nitrogen crystals. Lucky for Alpha, he'd recently come into possession of a large metal supply. Alpha pointed the B-55 Vijaya toward the young man and spoke flatly. I said I would warn you only once, yet I feel the need to reiterate. This isn't your world anymore. It's mine. I'll admit, I don't really get what you're rambling about or who this mistress of yours is. But honestly, it doesn't matter. You speak of power? Look above you. You see those stars? All those glistening points of light in the distance? Each one represents a federation world. Each one is a world that was once just like this. Small, ignorant, thinking itself the center of some grand plan. When in reality, they're but numbers on a census. Data points to an ever-expanding network, all working toward a greater goal. That hasn't changed. Like everyone before her, your mistress will fall in line. Or she'll be removed from the equation entirely. Both Tugusler and Number 7 stared at Alpha silently as if not quite understanding what he just said. After a long moment, the young man burst into laughter. He turned to Number 7 still laughing as he spoke. Ha ha ha! And you, ha ha ha! And you call me the insane one, camp dog? No matter, ha ha ha! This fool has already sealed your fate. Number 7 stared up at Alpha for a long moment before slowly shifting their gaze to Tugusler and asking, What are you talking about, cultist? The young man grinned from ear to ear and answered, The orb that idiot just destroyed was the control mechanism for various arrays we've been installing across the prairies for the last few centuries. With nothing left to restrain them, they're likely going to go critical, with no way to stop them. Ha 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 ha. Number 7's head snapped at Tugusler as she spoke. A raise? What a raise? The man's grin grew larger, as he responded. All of them. The captain ushered the last of the villagers behind the earth shrine wall just as it came up, rising dozens of meters into the air, tall enough to protect even the tallest of the Grand Elk. They were the last village to enter the safety of the shrine and he had feared they might not make it in time at first. Not after they'd entered the final few miles of the journey, only to see the earth shrine enter lockdown, gargantuan stone walls slowly rising from the ground. Much of the village had panicked, but quick thinking on his guardian's part had seen the village in a mad dash to get behind the walls before they closed. They had to abandon some of the larger, slower buildings, but thankfully the entire population made it by his own count. As the enormous walls peaked, slamming into place and blocking out most of the remaining light. A loud wailing sound emanated from the earth shrine. It was loud enough to be heard even over the voices of millions of people and spirit beasts crammed into the safety of the walls. The obelisk at the center of the shrine flashed once, and from the tip, a shimmering barrier spread outward, encompassing the entire walls and then some. The captain narrowed his eyes and turned to the wall. What was going on? He'd only seen the earth shrine's walls raised once before, in his entire life when an abnormally large beast wave triggered by Lux Apex swept across the Radiant Sea. Typically, the barrier was more than enough to hold off anything attacking. Frowning, he bent his knees and leapt, shooting into the air several dozen meters before stepping on a protrusion and leaping again. He saw dozens of other figures doing the same all along the wall. He'd reached the top a few more leaps, then stared off into the dark prairies. Only after several of his guardians followed him up did he see it. A thick, Black mist had seeped up from the ground past the barrier, covering it like rolling waves until prairies were replaced by a black sea for as far as his eyes could see. This 
wasn't normal. What was happening? A thousand possibilities flashed through his mind. One of the younger guardians pointed off into the distance and asked, his voice cracking, What? What the hell are those? Off in the distance, where the rolling mist was thickest, thousands of figures pushed their way out of the soil. They were still too far away to make out much detail in such low light, but the captain could see various forms and body shapes moving in the dark mists. Before he could call for a scouting device, a hunched-over old man, who'd most certainly not been standing beside him only a moment ago, stepped forward. The old man scuttled forward and peered into the darkness, his eyes squinting, before he spoke in a cold, flat tone. Those, my boy, are the children of Iris. 14. Book 1, Arc 3 Epilogue, Tick Tock. Next, Vumum. A burning lance of light swept horizontally across the battlefield, cutting down hundreds of desiccated, shambling figures along its path. A few larger figures were split in two, their top half sliding off as the bottom crumpled. The intense heat and energy simply erased many of the smaller figures. Warning! Core energy at 72%. Yet even as the roaring blades of winds cut down the straggling survivors and blew away the remaining dust, more zombie-like creatures pushed themselves out of the ground. Another burning lance swept across the battlefield, incinerating more of the horde as Alpha charged forward. Warning! Core energy at 71%. Alpha TSK and turned off the warning from his sub AI for now, sweeping a third core charged, Gungner, blast through the zombie horde. Number 7 stood on top of the TWP, holding a thin, rapier-like blade. Each swing or thrust of the weapon, and every wide kick, produced massive gusts of gray, cloud-like wind. While Alpha was in charge of cutting their way through the horde toward the distant structure, Number 7 had taken to protect their rear and sides. Good thing, too, as Alpha had quickly discovered that physical bullets didn't work against this enemy. Unlike zombies in the movies, even obliterating a zombie's head wouldn't do much. They would just continue to shamble around aimlessly. To stop them, you had to either incinerate them or cut them into ribbons, in Number 7's case. The most annoying ones were the large stone creatures. Even after blasting a few of them apart, they just kept reforming. Only after Number 7 spotted and destroyed the small, smoke-spewing orbs among the debris had the two made any actual progress. Even then, after three hours and two dozen core charged Gungner blasts, they barely made it one quarter of the way to their target. The young man, who Number 7 had later identified as Tegusler, had vanished into the sea of zombies almost immediately after Alpha destroyed the large black orb. It was possible he'd been devoured by the out-of-control horde, but Alpha's gut told him otherwise. As insane as the man seemed on the surface, he had been far too calm about the situation. Alpha knew he would pop up again. When he did, there would be no more words. After all, a bullet traveled faster than sound. Suddenly, the ground beneath the TWP shook, and dozens of fissures spread from under them. The ground bulged upward a few meters, and Alpha jumped. The TWP soared into the air several dozen meters before landing on and crushing one of the large stone creatures. A new figure rose from the ground where the TWP had just been, easily four times larger than any other on the battlefield, even dwarfing Alpha. Alpha pointed at the figure and complained out loud. Oh, come on! I killed you already! The 50 meter tall stone penguin stared down at Alpha silently. Most of its upper body had been replaced with a shining, shifting metal-like substance, while the stones and boulders that made up the rest of its body were covered in dried blood and gore. It looked at Alpha with dull eyes made of the same black orbs controlling the stone creatures. They leaked streams of dark fog, almost making it appear as if the creature was weeping. But when it opened its long beak, the creature screamed unintelligently, a deep black light glowing at the back of its throat. As the creature blindly charged them, Alpha doubted little, if anything, of the former beast lord truly remained. The room the slate walkers found themselves in wasn't lavish or fancy. This was a room dedicated to business and discussion, after all, not a pompous display meant to impress and stroke the egos of some noble. Even so, it was finer and more luxurious than most in the small group had ever seen in one place. Salzea sat beside her mentor on the soft couch, gently sipping the exquisite tea they'd been provided. Juatan, Oligan, and Monk stood at the ready around the room. They were once more in full guardian attire their weapons and armor returned. Ganbader and Yutu stood in a corner, deep in hushed discussion over the details of an expertly carved wooden statue. If one didn't know the boys, you'd think they were fine art connoisseurs admiring the artist's work. Though if you moved close enough to hear their whispers, it would be clear they were more interested in the actual craftsmanship and techniques used rather than the art itself. 
Salzea smiled to herself as she watched, part of her wishing she could join them. She could still barely believe that Yutu was so lively after everything he'd gone through. The last few weeks had felt like she was a leaf in a maelstrom, as she was tossed from joy to nightmare to hope and back again, over and over. Even now, at what should have been the end of the story, when the heroes brought to light the evil mastermind schemes and their plans were foiled, it seemed life had even more twists and turns for them. When the head priest had rescued them from the prison, Salzea thought things were coming to a head. Yet they'd barely sat down and had the chance to start their story before the alarms started sounding through the earth's shrine and the walls started rising. The head priest had excused himself and rushed out of the room, leaving the slate walkers both confused and worried. Even now, she should see the massive walls towering over the city through the room's balcony door. They'd been waiting for news ever since, though the priests that regularly brought them refreshments admitted even they weren't sure what was going on. The sound of a creaking door broke Salzea out of her ruminations and she put down the empty teacup. Instead of the priest dressed in humble robes as she expected, a young woman stood in the doorway. Despite looking only a few years older than Zalzea, the newcomer scanned the room in a way that spoke highly of her experience and skill. Her leather armor was of a finer craft than anything Zalzea had ever seen and almost glowed with the sheer number of enchantments packed into it. Yet even that didn't compare to the woman herself. She was beautiful, yes, but in a strange, wild way that triggered something deep in the primal part of Zalzea's mind. Her long, black, and white hair was pulled into a warrior's braid, woven using dozens of gold and silver clasps, each embedded with a single, carved beast core. What shook Zalzea the most, however, were the woman's eyes. Her bright amber, almost yellow, eyes bore into Zalzea with an intensity that left the young grass reader apprentice frozen to her seat, like a mouse caught in the gaze of a tiger. The guardians weren't so easy to shake. As soon as the woman had barged in, all three guardians turned, their weapons ready, expecting another attack. However, instead of drawing the blade at her side, the woman did nothing but flare her spirit energy. All three guardians were immediately driven to their knees as the full spiritual pressure of a high mid-rank, shackle-breaking, experts slammed into them. Salzea felt like a mountain was sitting on her chest, pressing her into the couch, and she found breathing hard. She couldn't even turn her head when she heard Ganbader and Yutu collapse to the ground behind her. The newcomer's frown deepened, and her eyes narrowed. When she spoke, her voice, though musical and smooth as silk, sounded more like the growl of a bloodthirsty predator in Zalzea's ears. Where is my baby sister? Newly appointed high priestess Hera, freshly promoted after her sister's, untimely death, stood before the central dais, staring up into the open sky. The once pristine and holy sanctum in which she stood was not covered in the bodies of prima priests and occult cordians alike. The rest of the clergy had been confused when she'd announced a new ceremony during the darkest night instead of the typical retreat. Officially, it was in celebration of her promotion and to bless the heart against the ill omen of the previous high priestess's death. Most of the old fools, so stiff and slow as stone, hadn't even questioned it. A few still loyal to her sister had their suspicions, however. It had already been too late when they finally became apparent what she intended. Like a scythe, her followers had cut down all opposition. It pained her slightly to spill her own people's blood so wastefully, but sometimes it was better to cut the rod out quickly before it could spread. They might lose some this day and in the coming days, but soon she would have the power to rebuild what was lost. Soon she would exceed not only the five great pillars but all world powers. And when she stood at the top of the mountain, she would even pull down the heavens themselves. Slowly, she spread out her arms and basked in the dark glow of the ten-meter-wide stone orb floating in the center of the room. The heart of the radiant sea bobbed slightly in the air as the dark clouds above were funneled down into it. The radiant, twirling rainbow of color that pulsed inside struggled against the dark smoke, but it was slowly losing ground, slowing dimming and being replaced by the dark light. There was still a long way to go, but the process would slowly speed up as the darkest night progressed. Soon the seal would weaken enough that even the power of the sleeping prima couldn't keep it intact. Soon it would be time for the last piece. She turned and stared at the five altars circling the heart. On four of them, a small obelisk sat, and on top of those, a small marble floated, slowly spinning, the mirror image of the larger heart. On the fifth, a young Ocklet pup slept peacefully, pinned down by smoky chains. It had taken centuries to locate all the keystones even longer to steal them in a way that wouldn't alert her sister or any of the other Chosen. Lucky for Hera and her followers, the Chosen had grown complacent after years of peace. They'd grown lazy and dull-eyed, their eternal vigilance slipping with each passing year. 
However, the Chosen's inattention had caused even Hera to lower her guard. Otherwise, how would she have missed her sister's growing suspicion? Hera had underestimated Métis, of that she would freely admit, both her craftiness and her cruelty. The child wouldn't survive the keystone extraction process, but no matter. Her sacrifice would ensure that her family stood at the top of this world and beyond for all eternity. Footsteps from behind drew her attention, and Hera turned to see a young man walking through the doorway, carefully stepping over bodies and quickly drying pools of blood. He stopped at the bottom of the stairs and bowed. Hera stared down and asked, Back so soon, Tugusler? Am I to assume everything went according to plan? Tugusler rose from his bow and grinned, responding, Yes, M.O.T. Hera's icy glare made the young man freeze and correct himself. Yes, High Priestess. It did indeed. Our mysterious spirit beast friend has proven to be far more powerful than we initially assumed, but it seems even he cannot stand against the might of the mistress. At their current pace, we should have no fear of them being able to interfere any time soon. Hera grinned ear to ear and nodded as she spoke. Good, good. The darkest night will reach its peak in only a few hours. She turned back and stared at heart and all. She continued, half speaking to herself. Soon, all the pieces will fall into place, and we will finally achieve our destiny. Tugusler bowed once more and turned. The young man grinned as well as spoke softly, his hidden under the constant thrum of the heart and the clouds above. Yes, yes we will. 12.